Hey now, it's your boy PSA Sitch here with another Sunday, Sunday, Sunday show with everyone's favorite, always early, never late, Adam Friendhead. What's up, Sitch? How are you doing today? Look at this. It's a beautiful <laughs> Sunday. What's That's up? Right. How are you doing? Look at the What What time is it? Oh, my gosh. What is this? What yes. is going on here? Ah, yes. Oh, my gosh. Anyway. Early and uh, heterosexual. That's right. That's right. Uh, so today we were covering the highly requested Jordan Peterson versus Destiny conversation slash debate. Yes. Very fascinating. Yeah, there's some there's a lot of interesting things that happen in this conversation that's worth going over. So uh wanna just jump into it? Sure, I, I guess. Yeah. Do you I mean do you have any broad thoughts before we start? What was your overall take? Um, I thought it was an interesting conversation. Okay. I wish that more of the conversation was focused on philosophical questions and less on specific political issues. Yeah, a lot of COVID, a lot of climate change, yeah. Right, right. Not right. a lot on the philosophy of conservatism or liberalism. <laughs> Yes, or progressivism or leftism or, or all the various isms that are kind of hitting us at the moment. So, Right, right, right. And these are the clips that are constantly getting shared to the COVID and the climate change stuff. So, yeah, yeah. look, I have lots of well, interesting things to say. So, I mean, The other thing I'll say is, you know, a lot of people who just see those clips, you know, they say that they think Jordan did very poorly in the conversation. It comes off as crazy in the conversation. And I didn't see the clips. I just watched the whole thing. And I think it gives you a completely different reading. I thought Jordan did find the conversation. I don't think he came off as crazy or anything like that. So, Yeah, the clips definitely do make him look unhinged. And that's the narrative that everyone is going for. And yeah, the conversation seems very reasonable. So, And mm -hmm. it seemed like they got along. Like they probably will talk again. So, Yeah. So All let's right. jump into it. Hello, everyone. I'm here today talking to Stephen Bonnell, known professionally and online as Destiny. He's an American streamer. Look at that. Jordan Peterson's able to get his name right, unlike uh, Norman. <laughs> right, right off the bat. Okay. Good for you, Jordan. Yeah. Norman's not blinded by pure rage. <laughs> you mean Jordan is? <laughs> yeah. The it's, just, it's funny because Norman Finkelstein basically just hates destiny and norman finkelstein is probably watching this conversation between jordan peterson and destiny and and just seething with anger and jealousy <laughs> because you know obviously this is a big boon to destiny status and norman just wants to belittle destiny status so right, uh, right. good job at making norman finkelstein see the destiny <laughs> debater and political commentator. He really came to my attention, I would say, as a consequence of the discussion he had with Ben Shapiro and Lex Friedman, and I decided to talk to him, not least because it's not that easy to bring people who are identified, at least to some degree, with the political beliefs on the left into a studio where I can actually have a conversation with them. I've tried that more often than you might think, and it happens now and then, but not very often. So today we talk a lot about well, the differences between the left and the right and the dangers of political ideology per se and the use of power as opposed to invitation and all sorts of other heated, often heated and contentious issues. And so you're welcome to join us. And uh, I was happy to have the opportunity to do this. So I guess we might as well start by letting the people who don't know who you are get to know who you are with a little bit more precision. So why have you become known and, and how has that developed? It's a pretty broad question. Um, I think I started streaming around 15 years ago when it wasn't really a thing yet. There were a few people that did it. Uh, I started early on. I was a, well, I guess back then you weren't a professional gamer yet because the game had just started to come out, but there was a game called StarCraft II and I streamed myself playing that game. I was a pretty good player. It was pretty entertaining to watch. And then I kind of grew uh, over, I guess maybe the next seven years, 
uh, just streaming that people would watch. Streaming on YouTube? Um, well, back then, I started on a website called Livestream. Do you want to skip the this part? It's kind of boring. If you, yeah, sure. Whatever okay. You, yeah. Look, if you got timestamps, pull them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is Destiny time, but how he goes from like being a gamer to what well, political stuff. Yeah. Uh huh. What are you doing for subscribers, say on YouTube, and total? Any idea about total reach? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess my subscribers on YouTube, I have around, I think, I think that's around seven hundred seventy thousand on my main channel. I think I. I. I mean, this is interesting, just in the fact that it's, you know, this is the game that we're playing. It's not. Mm -hmm. What do you know? You know. What learned subjects have you studied? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, how much do people like you? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's what you're selling personality. So. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the point, right? Mm -hmm. We're fucked. <laughs> We're <laughs> what fucked. are you talking about? What do you mean? We have great personalities, Adam. We're, no, not look. I think we have great personalities too, but I'm just saying structuring a society around ah, society. Yeah, the li likability of a right. of a personality, ra rather than whether or not what they're saying is actually true. Well, it's just yeah, you fuck. I, I have a, I have a feeling that's the way society has always been structured since the dawn of human civilization. I don't think there's anything new. So okay, there wasn't a little bit of time where we mediated some of that by looking to what people accomplished and well i do think that experts and the idea of experts and the idea of institutions obviously in the last 10 to 15 years have taken a big hit mm -hmm. than what they used to have right um but this i mean the same thing happened in the 60s you know, pre sixties people like there was a lot of blind trust in like quote science and institutions and anything of that nature. And then there's some kind of breakdown, which in sixties you had like the Vietnam war and the loss of faith and, and that, but now we kind of have, you know, that's for like the left kind of losing faith in the right. Now we have kind of the opposite of that where, because it seems like so many of our institutions have become indoctrinated with uh, political ideology, specifically kind of like woke political ideology so many people are losing faith and trusting experts from that perspective. So, yeah, I mean, I agree. There's definitely been a, a larger breakdown now than the past, but I, I don't think it's a permanent breakdown. I think it's something that will be reclaimed once we can purge this socialist thing out of our systems. So we're going to go back to, to judging people's reputability on, on merit and not charisma, charisma. Well, like well, take someone like Stephen Hawking, like he's really right. pulling it down charismatically, right? I mean, <laughs> obviously we should listen to Stephen Hawking because he's so, he's such a talented speaker. Right, right. Um, No, we're not going to, so it's like if you imagine a spectrum, you have on one end like merit and the other end just charisma. No, I mean, obviously people can have both merit and charisma, but just for the sake of the understanding this idea, and society is going to move back and forth between you know the various things, a, a highly charismatic person is always going to be something that people will buy into. Right. Um, but what you want is that you want basically sort of the the various institutions that you know the government institutions, you know expert institutions. You want those to be run by experts and not like charismatic you know weirdos, essentially. Right. And you'd hope generally the way you'd, you'd want is that the politicians will be the highly charismatic people that are able to cultivate the various maybe not so charismatic experts and then use that knowledge for you know pro-social um constructions yeah that's a that is that is the way that's a good way to structure society obviously but the problem that we often run into is the charismatic leaders decide to throw the experts aside and decide look i'm going to be the expert why, why do I need these people? Right. I know what I'm talking about. But I'm not confident that there's ever been a time in human history or especially American history where, where merit beats out charisma. Like there are times where, where merit and expertise are more valued, but even in those time periods, someone who's a highly charismatic individual is always going to just be, beat them out because most people, you know, they're going to they're gonna look an expert and expert's going to say whatever 
their area of expertise is, people aren't going to really understand it. And you have the highly charismatic person who's saying something that you know you find attractive, or they're selling you an idea, and that idea is always going to be more persuasive. Right. You but you have the institutions that are kind of policing that. That's the they're they're gatekeeping against the charismatic used car salesman who's selling a bunch of untruth. One hopes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that that's happening now, but no, it's not. I probably do between all three channels. I think around 15 to 20 million views a month. Um, and then I live stream to anywhere from five to 15,000 concurrent viewers a day for hopefully around eight hours a day. Uh, yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. So you have quite a substantial reach. And so you said that initially you were more conservative leaning, but that changed what? Okay. What did it mean that you were more conservative leaning and how did that, how and why did that change? Uh, when I said I was conservative leaning, I mean, I was writing uh, articles for my school newspaper defending George Bush in the Iraq war. Uh, mm. I was like very much like, um, I don't, I think it's like an insult now when people say like neocon, but I was like very much like a conservative, a Bush era conservative. Uh, so supported big business, supported um, traditional, all of the conservative, I guess, like foreign policy, you know, hawkish foreign policy uh, for whatever that meant as like a 14, 15 year old. Um, right, right, right. There was the whole Elian Gonzalez. And, uh, and you know, it's funny. I saw Glenn Greenwell had a tweet. It was like today or yesterday. And it was kind of insane um, because, you know, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald is basically a leftist. Even Only people, kind of insane? Oh, he's improving. Yeah. Well, I mean, Glenn Greenwald is a socialist and people just don't realize it because he doesn't talk that much about economic issues. You know, he just tries to talk about like the American bad issues that the populist left and right agree with. Right. Um, and he had like this really weird tweet where he was basically like, you know, because there's a whole drama that Candace Owens has been fired from the Daily Wire. Right. And so a lot of people are attacking Daily Wire for this. And Glenn is like defending Candace because he's very anti-Israel. And he's very, you know, isolationist or very anti-America. Since he's in the America bad ideology, he's very on the the team of like America shouldn't do anything anywhere, right? So like the isolationists on the right, they have more of an idea that they don't want their money or resources to be given to a foreign country. And the America bad isolationists on the left have a, a different idea. It's more like, I think my country is evil and is implementing evil imperial imperialism across the country and that's why i want to be an isolationist and right yeah glenn kind of structured this tweet like he was making it like oh you know it's so you know candace owens is like more i don't remember the exact phrasing he used but he, he basically framed it like candace owens is more a true right winger because she's isolationist and not like a war hawk like the daily wire crowd and i'm just like reading it's like what the hell is he talking about for the last, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, the Republican Party has been dominated by the ideology of being very hawkish, very pro uh, intervent, you know, intervening across the world in sort of foreign engagement. And it's really only in the last 10 years or less that this sort of isolationism has, has cropped up. And it's just so annoying to see people pretend like, oh, well, if you're not if you're not an isolationist, you're a rhino, you're a fake Republican all of a sudden. Yeah, it's a, definitely a, a huge switch. Incident that was very big for uh, Cuban Americans, where um, there was a Cuban boy that tried to come to the United States with several other people and his mother, and their raft, I guess, crashed or something happened. I think his mom died and some other people died, and there was a huge debate on whether or not to send him back to Cuba, and Clinton ended up sending him back to Cuba. And I know that my mom was super irritated and all that, um, to say the least. And then once I hit college, I think I supported Ron Paul in 2000, would have been 2008. Uh, so I was a big Ron Paul libertarian uh, guy mm -hmm. in high school when I went from, I went to a Catholic Jesuit high school and I kind of became atheist in that process. I started reading Ayn Rand. Uh, yeah. So I was very, 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 very conservative. Um, <clears throat> but without, on the libertarian end, it's Yeah, I like, would say so, yeah. yeah. Uh, initially on the, like, that makes more sense in relationship to your temperament. Sure, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Initially, it was like Christian conservative, and then it became like libertarian conservative. Um, w without, my life kind of uh, took like a wacky path. And then as I, I started working, I kind of had to drop out of school. I was working, and then I got into streaming. And once I started streaming, I had a son, basically around the first year I started streaming. 
Uh, as I started to go through life and I went from kind of being in this like working poor position to making a lot of money, uh, especially through the lens of my child, I saw how different life was when I had more money versus less. And I guess like the, uh, the differences between what was available to me and then my child as I made more money uh, while well, I was really wealthy versus not as wealthy, it kind of started to change the way that I, I guess. So I you got more attuned to the consequences of inequality? Is I, basically, I would say, yeah, 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 it? yeah. Okay, and so that, okay, how did that lead you to develop more sympathy for left-leaning ideas, particularly? I guess the my, my core beliefs have never really changed, but I think the way that those uh, become applied kind of change. Uh, so much the same way that uh, you might think that everybody deserves a shot to go to school and have an education. That might be like a core belief where as a libertarian or conservative, I might think that as long as a school is available, everybody's got the opportunity to go and study. But maybe now as like a liberal or progressive or whatever you'd call me, I might say, okay, well, we need to make sure that there is enough, you know, maybe like food in the household or household or some kind of funding program to make sure the kid can actually go to school and study, basically. So like the, the, the core drive is the same, but I think the applied the, the applied principle ends up changing a bit based on what you're Right, so is your are. concern essentially something like... Isn't it almost everyone, though? Everyone, I mean, most people on the left or right, they have a core principle, in America at least, of like, yeah, I think everyone should have the ability and opportunity to go to school and succeed and be able to provide for their family. There's not that many people... like can think of in, in in normative mainstream politics that are like oh no only like specific people should be able to succeed right yeah yeah that's it's interesting that they frame it in terms of principles because there's well, cause, principles obviously on both sides of the political spectrum there's just different principles well it seems like most people left or right there is sort of in terms of like in their different beliefs in how society should look in the end result the society would look but there's generally the same belief in terms of how an individual should have access to opportunities and the disagreement on the individual level is really what do you do in order to facilitate i guess people's ability to succeed do you give them government aid do you give them these sort of external assistance or does giving people external assistance only actually, you know, weaken their ability and their resolve to do these things and motivate them to do these things on their own? That to me, on the individual, on the individual level, that seems to be like the core disagreement between the left and the right. Well, there is a disagreement over the facts, which is an interesting part of this conversation because many on the right will say, you know, that people just are not working hard enough that the right. material conditions are their own creation you know they haven't done the due diligence to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make a success of themselves right mm -hmm. so but a lot of people on the left are saying look the economic environment has changed and what was easy for you to do back when you were in your 20s is not easy for anyone to do now and we have to look at the material conditions and make some adjustments, right? That's a difference in what the facts on the ground are. Yeah, I don't, yes, yeah. that, that is the difference. And then also the left would add elements of systemic inequality, whether it's racial, gender, or class-oriented that have been basically keeping people down. Sure, sure. And the, there is, I mean, that's part of the problem because I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that do have opportunity that they let go to waste. So they're guilty of what the conservatives accuse them of, right? Not mm -hmm. taking advantage of the opportunity that's in front of them. And I'm sure there are plenty of people who just don't get any opportunity at all. They're working their ass off and not succeeding. So, you know, they're trying uh, and, and failing because of the economic conditions. So they're evidence of what the people on the left are claiming. So I just, as a, I don't know how we discern which is the bigger group. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I, I'm in favor of democracy, because I always, I, I believe that if more than 51% of the population slips into a situation where they're working hard and not able to get ahead, then obviously they're going to vote for change. They're going to vote against the status quo, right? Right. As long as 51% of the population is voting in favor of the status quo, I think, well, that 
we must be doing fine. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the measure, the feedback of society. So when, right. we, uh, when we argue with the anti-democracy crowd, I often ask them, you know, what is, what is going to be the feedback mechanism if we move on from democracy, right? How do we tell when society's just tipped into ultra rich and everyone else just languishing in poverty? If no one can vote, then no one can vote against the status quo. Well, obviously we have a panel of experts who will <laughs> yeah. completely be objective and accurate and they'll gather all the correct information so they can tell the king and or CEO of the country all the important information that they need in order yeah. to uh, have a controlled economy. And we all know that the anti-democracy crowd has a huge faith in experts right now, obviously, <laughs> right? They're right. the ones that are saying, we need more experts on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, I completely agree with you, Sitch. Wink, <laughs> wink. Um, the observation that if people are bereft enough of substance, let's say, that it's difficult for them to take advantage of equal opportunities, even if they are presented to them, let's say. Yeah, essentially, yeah. And and you're, you, you have some belief, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have some belief that there is room for state intervention at the level of basic provision to make those opportunities more manifest. Yeah, to varying degrees, yeah. Okay, okay. How okay, so let let let's let's start talking more broadly then on the political Do you, I mean I agree it's that I agree with destiny here that the state should be able to intervene if if society is going to just completely eviscerate the middle class. You know, the the Matthew effect that Jordan Peterson talks about all the time, right? The rich mm -hmm. tend to get richer and the poor tend to get poor. This is why we have a welfare state is to push against that inevitable Pareto distribution that's constantly churning through the, the economy. Now, if you want to say, okay, I believe the government should never intervene. It's inevitable that there's just going to be rich and poor. Like, are we, is that a, is that a sustainable model? Is that the direction that we should go? I mean, I would argue, no, for a, a whole host of reasons. I don't know that they actually bring up here, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think most people that I've talked to and even seen, you know, even famous libertarian senators and Congress people, and and politicians, I mean, they're in favor of some level of redistribution, some way, some level of social safety net. The question is, what is that level, and what does it look like, right? And right. that's sort of where the disagreement always kind of falls into that category. Right. Yeah. I'm a, I'm against the, the anarcho capitalist types who are like zero government regulation. I'm all, uh, I'm also against the, the leftist socialist types who are like, look, we can't have any billionaires, no more. Billionaires, right. 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 Yeah. So there is a happy medium in there. Somewhere. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's most people are somewhere, you know, in the middle some more, somewhere in the the middle of liberalism and Western capitalism, and we're just trying to figure out what the boundaries are exactly. And the, the problem is that, like, ideally, we should be trying to figure out what is actually effective at bringing about social change or positive social change. But obviously, that's very difficult to determine. And so, very often, people are kind of relying on their pre-existing intuitions. So you say, oh, well, you know, if your intuitions tell you that everything's the fault of systemic existing structures and it's like oh well we're not giving people enough aid essentially or there's too much bigotry in the system and if your pre-existing idea is that you know people need to basically learn to pull themselves up by their bootstraps then your pre-existing idea is going to be well we're giving people too much aid or too much assistance we're kind of incentivizing them in the wrong direction so we're causing people to you know become lazy and rely on the government dole and all these other things right and yeah. so it's too di it's like it's just because of the complexity of the system, it's made it like murky enough that it's easy for whoever's right or wrong to like not ever really find that answer. Right. Yeah. And it's so politically effective to blame the answer on racism, even though I think it's much more likely economic factors, which is kind of sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Side. So, how would you characterize the difference, in your opinion, between the left and 
the conservative political viewpoints? Um, oof. Uh, on a on a very 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 broad level, um, if there's some, I would say if there's some like good good world that we're all aiming for, I think people on the left uh, seem to think that a uh, a collection of taxes from a large population that goes into a government that's able to precisely kind of dole out uh, where that tax money goes. Uh, you're basically able to take the problems of society. You're able to scrape off, hopefully, uh, uh, not super significant amount of money from people that are that can afford to give a lot of money. And then through government programs and redistribution, you target that uh, that those taxes essentially to people that kind of need. Uh, whatever bare minimum to take advantage okay. of opportunity okay. in society, yeah. Okay, okay. And then for on the conservative yeah. end, um, I guess a conservative would generally think that why would the government take my money? I think from a community point of view, through churches, through community action, through families, we can better allocate our own dollars to our own friends and family to help them and give them the things that they need so that they can better participate in and thrive in society, basically. Okay, so one of the things that I've always found a mystery I mean, I think there's an equal mystery on the left and on the right in this regard, is that the more conservative types tend to be very skeptical of big government, and the leftist types tend to be more skeptical of big corporations. Right? Well, you... Okay, so mm -hmm. following through the logic that you just laid out, you mm -hmm. made the suggestion that one of the things that characterizes people on the left is the belief that government can act as an agent of distribution can and should act as an agent of distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, a potential problem for that is the gigantism of the government that does that. Now, the conservatives are skeptical of that gigantism. And likewise, the liberals, the progressives in particular, we'll call them progressives, um, are skeptical of the reach of gigantic corporations. And I've always seen a commonality in those two in that both of them are skeptical of gigantism. And so one of the things that I concerned about, generally speaking, with regard to the potential for the rise of tyranny is the emergence of, of giants. And one potential problem with the view that the government sh can and should act as an agent of redistribution is that there is an incentive put in place, two kinds of incentives. Number one, a major league incentive towards gigantism and tyranny. And number two, an incentive for psychopaths who use compassion to justify their grip on power to take money and to claim that they're doing good. And I see that happening everywhere now in the name of, particularly in the name of compassion. And it's one of the things that's made me very skeptical in particular about the left and at least about the progressive edge of the left. So I'm curious about what you think about those two. First of all, it's, it's a paradox to me that the conservatives and the leftists face off each other with regard to their concern about different forms of gigantism and don't seem to notice that the thing that unites them is some antipathy. This is especially true for the libertarians, some antipathy towards gigantic structures per se. And so then I would say with regards to your antithesis between liberalism and conservatives, the conservatives are pointing to the fact that there are intermediary forms of distribution that can be utilized to solve the social problems that you're describing that don't bring with them the associated problem of gigantism. And like this is a, it's been shocking to me to watch the left, especially in the last six years, ally itself, for example, with pharmaceutical companies, which was something I'd never saw, never thought I would see in my lifetime. I mean, so this yeah. concept of like, <laughs> The giants and, and the paradox there is it's an interesting idea, but I don't think it is a paradox. I think the issue here that Jordan's having is that maybe there's sort of he's like ascribing the fact that the left is anti business historically and the right is kind of anti big government historically is some kind of intrinsic part of the left right dichotomy when I don't think they are intrinsically linked whatsoever to the left right dichotomy at all i totally agree i was going to make that same point because you know as a, you know my view is always that the left generally is is the way you define left is that they're they're pro change they're pro open they believe that all the problems come from within the system so you need to find new ideas outside the system and then the right's the opposite they're more pro tradition 
They want to protect the existing system from degeneration and from external forces basically infiltrating it. And answers have to be from within and, and tradition and past, you know, oriented to find like correct uh, pro social solutions going forward. And so neither of those, like, necessarily, like, none of those necessarily would make someone pro big business or pro government. I, I think basically what the reason that 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 has been structured. Well, I think there's two things going on for why the American politics is kind of that way. The first is that America from its foundation has always had a very strong culture of libertarianism, probably more so than most other countries that exist. And so the fear of like a giant overarching force, whether it be the government or whether it be a business is like, embedded in our libertarian culture from the beginning in our liberal culture from the beginning and then the reason the way it's focused business versus government i think that's just because of the way government and business has shaken out over the years so for many years in america business essentially was seen to be more on the side of the right because they wanted less regulations on uh you know, business practices, you know, they wanted to be able to kind of keep their money. They want less, less taxation. And so there's just kind of like an alignment in those regards where the left was like, oh, well, we need more government because of the history of slavery and segregation. So we basically need government to come in and enforce a level of equality that society what like didn't have on its own, essentially. And so like that's the only reason I think that the left kind of became sort of the quote more trusting of the government and the right became more trusting of business. But then you see that that can shift super easily because as soon as we have this idea that like businesses start to become woke, as soon as the idea is that businesses seem to adopt the left wing ideology, you know, you see the right basically turn on businesses, you know, over the course of four or five years. Right. Here, here's the way that I see it. And this part of the problem I think comes from the libertarians are a very small minority in any political system. Now, I, I don't know why this is, I don't know why nature doles out libertarians in like 10 to 15% of the population. They tend to be male, right? But they mm -hmm. also tend to be like the swing vote, the kingmakers. They're, they're one focus is they're against central, uh, centralized power they're hyper vigilant against centralized power and when the conservatives take over the government then they are the centralized power and they swing over to the progressive side and when the progressives take over they are against centralized power so they swing over to the conservative side right now they tend to vote with the conservatives so people think of them as conservatives but i don't see them as conservatives i see libertarians and progressives on the left. And I know a lot of people are re, re every time I say this, but let me, <laughs> let me make my argument here. Okay. Libertarians <laughs> are against centralized power, right? They like decentralized power. They view the government as centralized power and they are for corporations because they view free markets as decentralized power. Right? So that makes sense. That makes logical sense. Right? <laughs> Progressives are the inverse of that. Okay. They also are against centralized power, but they view corporations as centralized power in sort of an economic sense, right? And they view the government as democracy, we the people, decentralized power, okay? So they're basically just the flip side of that. Just they see the, the, they see the democratic government as decentralized power and the libertarians see the free market as decentralized power. So they do have two opposite enemies, right? The libertarians hate the government because they perceive it as centralized power that could, you know, wipe out the free market and progressives see corporations as centralized power that can wipe out democracy. So mm -hmm. they're both kind of opposite sides of the same coin. Now, conservatives, they're for hierarchy. They're for fucking monarchy and shit. Like they're not afraid of absolute power at all. How can you say, look, we should give all our power to one dude. And think, oh, they're when we say conservative, you don't do you mean like Republicans or do you mean conservatives outside the bounds of political liberalism? I mean I mean generally conservatisms are for hierarchy and absolute power. They're not afraid of centralized power. 
I mean, sure, there are maybe lots of people who are calling themselves conservatives that are really just libertarians because of the particular place that we're at. But when when you when we're talking about the these uh, you know monarchist types, they're conservative, right? Yes. Are they afraid of absolute power? Are they afraid of hierarchy? Are no, they of course of not. Right. Centralized the, power. Right, but that but there's very very small amount of like monarchist in American political conversation, right? Right, but I I I do not see conservatives as being afraid of hierarchy. I think that's the biggest split. No, no, I no, think, no, they're not. Yeah, I think the progressives and the libertarians are hyper vigilant about individualism, and conservatives are not as much afraid of centralized power. Well, I think. Unless you're unless you're making the argument that conservatives are against hierarchy. No, 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 no. I agree with what you're saying. But well, first of all, I just want to be clear. When I in this context, in this conversation, when I say conservative, I'm gonna be re referring to like the average Republican voter in America. I'm not really gonna talk about like monarchists because I don't think they're important to like the overall conversation. Um, okay. and I don't think the average Republican wants like a king or anything of that nature, but I agree with you, they are generally pro hierarchy. But I, I think that the reason that the Republican Party for so many years and sort of what we would consider like right wing in America has been kind of skeptical of the government or anti-government. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's based on a principle. I think it's just based on the idea that the government is generally viewed as enacting left wing policies. Well, and yeah. If that, but... Right. And if that wasn't the case. If the view was that the government was enacting right wing policies, I don't think that there would be that kind of cultural norm of Republicans in America being anti government. Yes, of course. If the government was enacting conservative policies like banning abortion, they would be totally for it. Yes. Yeah, or, or enacting, you know, uh, conservative moral norms and things of that nature, then yes. Yeah, so centralized power would be on their side. They'd be all in favor of it. They wouldn't be right. skeptical of centralized power. Also, the conservative party, the Republican Party in America, has sort of evolved as the party of big business. So, I mean, yeah. they're protecting business interests against government interference, which mm -hmm. adds a whole other kind of complexity to it. Because, I, you know, I don't necessarily think conservatives are, are against... You know, corporations amassing as much power as humanly possible. I don't, they don't want, they don't think the government should be any, many of them don't think the government should be any check on corporations. So, yeah, but I don't think that that's intrinsic to right wing conservative ideology whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, well, I mean, I think it is so, slight, I think it's slightly in terms of that it's more aligned with like pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps and things of that nature. But if, like, if in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, business was viewed broadly by the public as basically enacting like socialism or left wing, you know, progressive ideology, you know, the Republicans in the right wing of that time period would have been very anti business. Like, that's all I'm saying is that it's, it's not, I don't think there's a principle there at, at place. Okay. Um, Spencer Harmon for $20 says it was so nice to have destiny's teeth kicked in a bit quote who the hell are you loved it all of it there you go Phil that remains for $20 hey Phil says great show today the cringiest people on the internet being cringy as they can be <laughs> love you guys <laughs> there you go is that us are we the cringiest people on the internet no he's not, I think he's talking about uh, destiny but... there's this book by Arnold Clink that's a very popular book uh, talking across the political divide, where divide, it's called the three languages of politics, where he separates out libertarians, progressives, and conservatives. And in this book, I always think it's 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 very easy to substitute libertarians and progressives by being against centralized power, just against a different form of centralized power. And this even goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, so much of this is perception. Like if you perceive uh, the corporations as a form of centralized power, but you don't 
perceive the central government as a as a form of centralized power like your outlook on life is going to be completely different so that fact pattern basically establishes how you look at the world mm -hmm. right but that's only like if we lived in a world where the government was enacting right-wing policies generally historically and the businesses were generally enacting left-wing policies progressives i think progressives would be completely flipped on the issue they'd be like on the side of like libertarians and progressives would be on the same side mm. Mm. because I, I mean i agree with you that like the so, like the way that they're looking at it about who is actually the domineering power is what's kind of determining where libertarians are and where progressives are right and then they're post-talk rationalizing you know that the government is decentralized they make yeah. the argument that the government is decentralized after the fact because they right. like the policies is what you're saying exactly yeah, yeah. exactly maybe yeah. that could be happening i don't know libertarians are pretty married to the free market it would be no i'm saying libertarians would be on the same side but progressives would be on the libertarian more on the libertarian side if the government they view the government as being right. like super right-wing socially conservative this, we've seen some of this with the with the social media deplatforming, right? All of a sudden it's like, oh, that's an independent business. They can do whatever yeah. they want, right? Right, right. Like as soon yeah. as they're deplatforming their political enemies, they're like, yeah, of course. Free markets, woo woo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, and now it's hard to tell how much of that is them just trying to rub it in conservative faces and how much of that's just them switching sides, but. Right. Uh, Dr. Fire for 20 Canadians says, I suppose ideally that the government is supposed to play referee gets involved as little as possible and only intervenes to keep things fair. You don't want to get rid of the ref, but you also don't want the ref to take bribes or place bets. Yeah. I mean, generally, I think that's what most people think. Government should be referee. And then maybe if you get a little bit more on the left side of things, you think government should not only be referee, but also exist as stop gaps and for, you know, where things fall through the cracks. I mean, I didn't like the way destiny framed that as taking it's just so easy to fall into the right wing framing right you're taking money from successful people to give handouts to people it's like should i think we should structure society so we don't need to give handouts to people so mm -hmm. people can can get ahead can succeed under their own merit right right i guess there's a certain number of people that do need handouts just because they're ultimately going to lose well, right. there's a problem of like, there's a twofold problem of there's going to be people who can succeed and can succeed in society if given the opportunity and they need assistance to basically get that opportunity. Yes. And that's like group one. But then there's also another group that people don't want to talk about, which is people who will not, will basically only exist in like a lower tier or bare minimum level of economic uh, success, regardless of what you do. And the question is like, most people are not in the category of like, let people die, <laughs> like, right? Like, most people are like, well, you know, even people in that category should be given some level of assistance because, you know, you kind of view life, you know, individual life is mattering, right? Even if, you know, it's not going to be super successful. Yeah, that is tough obviously you don't want i mean you kind of want the lazy to suffer from their own laziness yeah yeah you but, don't yeah you don't want them to be living ladder slice cells but you don't you want them to suffer maybe not suffers maybe not maybe not the word i would use but you don't want them to no, basically a good word <laughs> okay i guess somebody how you look at it maybe you want them to suffer maybe you don't want them to be living in the lap of luxury but most people maybe i'm wrong i don't think most people want them to like die on the street you know destitute right yeah remember the ron paul debate where somebody where he basically said you know if people don't get health care they should die and everyone was like yeah <laughs> no, i don't remember that you but, don't no oh i i it might have been when obama was running i mean it's been mm -hmm. quite some time but yeah people were gung-ho and like the media was very you know they jumped in ron paul's face over this because obviously it's kind of a you know the progressive media is big in care harm so they don't want to see people actually die from their actions but i mean i think there is a contingency out there that is like let them die so mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, I just I, there is a contingency. I, I don't think that's the normal, not normal. Right. I don't think no. that's the average yeah. normative view that people have. 15, 20%. Yeah. R- sure. <laughs> sure. Um, Especially when you're it. talking about giving them your tax dollars, everyone's like, what? Mm-hmm. Which is, that's an interesting part of this conversation. Should we move on or? What's going on? You gonna read some super chats? Uh, no, I was, I was trying to find that that quote you were talking about the Ram, the Ron Paul quote. Oh, okay. Um, but so let me read the super chat. Knight of the Diamond Spoon for fifty dollars. Thank you so much. It says uh, Sitch, you essentially said that people should follow the lawful commands of the government. If you find it unconstitutional, unjust, etc., then take it to court afterwards. If the government gave you a lawful order to get on a cattle car, would you? Sometimes when tyranny becomes law, rebellion becomes a duty. That is why a team reigns supreme. So well, I'm assuming you're not talking about anything that we've supreme, talked but... about today because I haven't said anything about that. I'm assuming you're talking about um, the 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 stream we talked about the other day where we were talking about the I forget the guy's name who was basically going to jail for not uh, following the subpoena for the January 6th thing. Oh yeah, and that I, guy. Right. And I was Which... talking about how well you have to follow the law and then you fight it in the courts you don't fight the police on the streets you got to fight them in the courtroom if you fight them in the streets you know you're gonna end up getting shot and i feel like i don't i know what the word for it for this is but i'm sure there's some word there's some fallacy here obviously there's like a difference between the government coming to you and saying get into a cattle car that's going to take you to like a death camp right it's very different than saying hey you need to come to Washington, D.C. and answer questions for a couple hours, right? These are two very <laughs> different are scenarios. They? Are they really? Right? Yeah, and I don't think it makes sense to, to just be like, oh, well, we need some sort of like universal standard. If there's any, like, you can't construct a simplistic metric where you say, if there's any law that ever exists, I should be able to fight, to, to just ignore it. If, if that's the way that we all operate, if every individual person operated under that law, we couldn't have a society at all. There's people that believe that about everything. There's people that think that they should be able to litter. There's people that think that they should be able to basically be, you know, buy sex and be prostitutes. There's people that think they should be able to speed. There's people that think that they should be able to ignore safety and health uh, regulations when they're making food or practicing medicine. There's also there's people think that they should be able to sell meth to whoever they want. There's like a million, like, People disagree on all sorts of things, obviously, but we live in this thing called the democracy or a constitutional republic or whatever the fuck you want to call it. And we all kind of say, okay, well, we agree that we're going to have a system of laws that we all have to follow. And we all basically get to vote on how the laws will be structured in our society. Now, obviously, there can be a breaking point to that. If we lived in a hypothetical scenario where the majority of people voted to put you know, all the Jews or all the white people or whatever in concentration camps, you'd say, okay, maybe we should be fighting back with violence, right? And I would agree with that. But we're not there. We're not even close to that point yet. And so I don't think it's it makes sense um, logically to construct a hypothetical to say, oh, well, if you think you should have to reply to a summons and go to Congress and answer their questions, and if you don't do that, you get in trouble for that, To compare that to going to a death camp, it just, there's not, you're not in the realms of making sort of a a realistic, logical situation, right? Yeah, we're still a couple years away from the cattle car, so. At least, at least a couple years away from the (laughs) cattle car, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you have to take, you have to take these things sort of on an individual level. And so, yeah, I do think if, you know, you get a subpoena, you, you know, you have to respond to it. For, for decades, the only gigantic corporations the left was more skeptical of than the fossil fuel companies were the pharmaceutical companies. And that all seemed to vanish overnight around the COVID time. So I know the story. That- that's, uh, that's evidence of what you're saying, Sitch, right there. Uh, yeah. Like switched on a dime as soon as it was a policy that they believed in. Yeah. Well, and also with, with COVID, so much of it was purely based, I think, doesn't kind of gets gets into this though he uses kind of a different phrase for it that's kind of just the, the tribalism at play here because you know it was actually going back and watching the evolution of 
the political landscape over COVID is actually very hilarious and interesting. Because when COVID first started to percolate, it was kind of the more far right people that were raising the alarm at first. Right. That were saying, oh my God, you got to get your guns. You got to get your your canned food. You got to get your gold. You know, you, like this is going to be the big one. Society is going to break down. Like they were the ones that were raising the alarm, like right in the beginning. Like, like you need to be super prepared. This is going to be like, you know, wipe everyone out. You need to get face masks. You need all this stuff. And then once the public and the government got on board with like, oh, COVID is a big deal. And we start doing lockdowns. Then all of a sudden the right is like, oh, now you're infringing on my liberty. I don't like this. Right. Right. And once you don't like that, you're infringing on your liberty, kind of the post hoc sort of jumps in. It's like, oh, then people start arguing whether it's really a big deal or not. And then it's like both sides kind of switched like in re- like in reverse to the to the other side. And then we yeah. saw that happen again a few months later because then it was like, so then once it switches and the right kind of becomes the right, which was like pro like COVID fear now becomes kind of anti COVID fear and anti lockdown. And the left is like pro lockdown, pro COVID fear. And then you had the right basically doing all these protests for COVID and all this stuff. And, and if you remember, this was like the most insane thing ever. All these people on the left, all the mainstream media outlets were talking about how disgusting and despicable and immoral these people were for doing the protesting, the lockdowns, not just because they agree with the lockdowns, but also because you have a bunch of people in mass basically get it gathering and spreading the virus. And this is a big, scary, dangerous thing. And then that again, shifted on a dime just a few months later, because then George Floyd happened and the BLM stuff happened. And suddenly all the people on the left started flip flopped on the, the, the protest issue saying, Oh, well actually everyone could totally protest outside because it's outside. They're all wearing masks and blah, blah, like making up all the excuses. And it just, it really shows to me like COVID was the perfect example of how, so much of what people's behavior is is just completely rooted in whatever their tribal identity is pushing at the moment. And then they'll just absorb that direction, regardless of whether they agreed with it, you know, five minutes earlier or not. Yeah. You got to do what everyone else is doing. The real pandemic hit Sitch racism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. That's a lot of things to throw at you, Uh but it sort of outlines the territory that we could probably investigate productively. Yeah. So a couple of things I would say that the current political landscape we have, I think is less, uh, I understand the the concept of conservative supporting corporations and liberal support, uh, supporting like large government. I think today the divide we're starting to see more and more is more of like a populist, uh, anti-populist rise or even like an institutional or anti-institutional rise. So for instance, I think conservatives today in the United States are largely characterized with, uh, I would say with populism. Uh, and that they're supporting like certain figures, namely right now Donald Trump, who they think alone can kind of like lead them against the corrupt institutions, uh, be them corporate or government. I feel like I feel like most conservatives today are not as trustful of, of big corporations as they were back in like the Bush era, where we would you know conservatives would champion you know big corporations. Yeah, I think that's right. They've totally redefined populism now. Like the left defines populism as you know being enthralled with some strong man leader who wants to crush the system, right? I just looked up populism, Mm -hmm. populism, a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. How does that, how does that not sound extremely progressive? Populism, I think has a bad rap for two reasons. The first is that since it's very anti elite, and who is it the people that write history and who is it that writes political philosophy textbooks? The elites. It's the elites, right? Right. Um, so so that's the case. But then so you're, I do, you're saying they're the ones that have changed the definition. Well, no, 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 no. So that's like that's there's two things going on. The first is what I just said, okay. which is more in the uh, giving the populist point of view. But then I do think there's some merit because if you look at the way that fascism and socialism grab a hold of a country, it's almost always through a populist movement where basically there's an idea that the elites are out to get you, they can't be trusted, and we need to destroy them and remove them. And the problem is, and we're seeing this kind of now, is that if you have a belief or a political philosophy where you say the elites and the experts can't be trusted, then who do you trust, right? How do you, how does the average person 
gain information or knowledge about the world if you can't trust institutions and experts? Well, there's, there's two different types of elite. So that I think could be mm -hmm. being conflated in your example, right? There's elites that are knowledgeable in certain fields. And then there are the aristocracy who are the elites that are just the elites by birth right? They've just mm -hmm. inherited their place in society and did nothing to earn it. So I do think populism is turning against the latter, not the former. I mean, that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing, we're seeing, but I think a lot well, of populist people, movements look, conflate them the same way though. The and that's what we're seeing the, right now. The populist, the people who are against the experts right now are not against experts, are, are against experts mostly because they've they've destroyed their credibility as experts. So they are functioning as some sort of aristocracy. Like I'm an expert because I went to this school, but they don't really have yes. any of the knowledge needed to be an expert in that. No, field. no, you, you are completely correct. But the yeah. way that it kind of, the way that that evolves is that someone says, okay, we can't trust, like, let's just use COVID as an example. Say, so, okay, someone says, I can't trust medical experts because they were wrong with COVID, right? And about lockdowns or masks or whatever. Like they lied about the masks or something. Right. Um, they lied about, you know, social distancing with the BLM stuff. And so I don't trust them. But the thing is, under what you're saying is like, okay, a person has to be able to make a determination between, well, this medical expert who was wrong about COVID, I'm going to view them through the lens of that they're an aristocracy. They were, you know, this kind of uh, corrupted elite. But then I can turn around and see another doctor, another organization come in and I'm going to view them as like being a meritocratic expert group. And it's like, okay, that's not really the way in which I think people view things, or it's too difficult to view things in that that notion that way because you'd have to like do all this research and have all, all this understanding to be able to make all these um, differences of how to interact with and absorb information from various expert groups. I think what's more likely to happen, what we're seeing, is you say, oh, the quote experts, the medical experts were wrong about COVID in this, this, and this way. So therefore, I'm just not going to trust medical expertise like generally. And then you say, oh, okay, like the newspapers and institutions were wrong about Trump, this, this, and this way. So I'm not going to trust newspapers and institutions generally. And that's kind of what we're seeing with the, the MAG movement is just a broad, wide-scale distrust of basically any sort of expertise or institution whatsoever. Right. But for good reason, right? Because they threw away their credibility. Well, yeah. I, I mean, especially I in journalism. Good, okay. I wouldn't use the phrase for good reason. I would say for un completely understandable reasons, right? My, okay. my attitude is that, yes, the medical community and journalists and all these other institutions have basically screwed up in very, in very, 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 very bad ways because of COVID, because of wokeness, because of all these things. But the danger lies in therefore just saying, well, I'm going to take the opposite position of anything that they say because I just don't trust them anymore. Because the problem, what I was alluding to, and this is where how populism can go down this road of socialism or fascism is because if you as a group of people or you as an individual don't trust institutions and you don't trust experts, who do you rely on for truth and information? You rely on it from your political movement. You rely on it from your charismatic leader. And that's, I think, why generally populism doesn't necessarily mean it's going to become socialist or fascist. But I think that's, I think a populist movement is basically the precursor for a socialist or fascist movement, if that makes sense. I think populism can lead to fascism or socialism. Yes. Yeah, I, I obviously do, but I, still think you know the the dose makes the medicine <laughs> like if you 100 percent, if yeah, you 100%. don't democracy is about challenging elite authority it's basically saying look everyone should have a say in how society is structured i mean that's why we we've franchised so many people we've spread the vote so far and wide so i just look po i think populism is being turned into this boogeyman that it's, it's just, it's not like it, it can be obviously just like firearms mm -hmm. can be used to commit crimes or they can be used in law enforcement. Right. I mean, populism can be good and keep elites in check, or it can be bad and turn into fascism and 
and socialism. I just I I don't think a monomaniacal look at populism, which I see and and what brought it up was just destinies basically categorizing it as bad. Mm -hmm. And I mean that just seems wrong to me. And also it seems against what destiny I mean destiny claims to be a progressive, right? I read you the definition of populism. How is that not progressive? Right. No, no, I agree. I'm glad you said it. I think the way to think about it is the dose makes the medicine or the poison. Yep. A hundred percent. And that's that's true with most things. That's definitely true with populism. Um and that yeah, and we do need in our society a very healthy dose of skepticism towards elites, institutions, and a very healthy dose of populism to basically prevent whoever the elites are in whatever given time period from basically running roughshod over the population. Right. And the actually thing, caring about the population. Yeah. The thing that makes it ironic for me is just you have a progressive who says look i'm looking out for the little guy here the reason i became a progressive because what i saw how society was just crushing the little guy and then he just categorically says oh yeah populism is evil it's well, just it's hugely ironic it's it's a huge mm -hmm. irony yeah no it is um it, it is ironic in like a philosophical perspective i would imagine that the thing that's led destiny to that belief is because of Trump. right now, like the view of populism is the Trump movement and he, which he doesn't like, and he's anti MAGA. And so therefore in his mind, like populism gets categorized as like the, you know, the sort of ignorant conspiracy theorists. Like, I think that's how he conceptualized it in his mind. Right. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't That's think a strange thing because it makes the modern conservatives a lot more like the 60s leftists. Potentially, yeah. Um, I mean, that brings us into the issue, too, of whether the left-right divide is actually a reasonable way of construing the current political landscape at all. And I'm not sure it is. But Right now, it kind of is, but only because so many conservatives are following Trump. So, like, your populist, anti-populist thing kind of maps on kind of cleanly to the left and right. It doesn't work with progressives, though, or the far left, because they're also anti-large everything. So, in a surprising way, on very, very far left people, you might find them having a bit more in common with kind of like a MAGA Trump supporter uh, than like a center-left liberal. So, for instance, like, both of these groups of people on the very far left will be very dovish on foreign policy, probably a little bit more isolated. They're not a big fan of like a ton of immigration or a ton of trade with other countries. Uh, they might think that there's a lot of institutional capture of both government and corporations. So both all of the mega supporters and the far, far left might think that corporations don't have our best interest at heart and the government is corrupt and captured by mm -hmm. lobbyists. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you'll see a lot yeah. of overlap there. Right. Um, I think that sometimes uh, there's a couple things. One, uh, this is something I feel like I've discovered. People have no principles. Uh, I think that people are largely guided by whatever is kind of satisfying them or making them feel good at the time. I think that's a really important thing to understand because people's beliefs will seem to change at random. If you're trying to uh, imagine that a belief is coming from some underlying principle or is governed by some internal, uh, you know, like moral or reasonable code or whatever. I think generally there are large social groups and people kind of follow them along from thing to thing, which is why you end up in strange worlds sometimes where, uh, you know, like the, the position on vaccines and being an anti-vaxxer might have been seen as something, you know, 10 years ago as kind of like a hippie leftist. And now maybe it's more like a conservative or uh, it's associated more with like MAGA Trump supporters or whatever, I think as a result of how the social groups move around. Um, when it comes to the, you, you mentioned this like gigantism thing. That's another thing where I'm not sure if people actually care about gigantism or if they're using it as a proxy for other things that they don't like. Like I could totally imagine. A well, person, I care about it. Sure. So, yeah, you might. Yeah. Sorry. I, it just that's okay. in general. That's yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, well, I just want to say kind of regarding the whole people don't have principles thing. I do agree with that. I don't think people, most people. Obviously, everyone listening to us is right now. <laughs> of course, all our principles. fans have principles. Right. The most course. principled individuals alive. But I, I think the average person, I agree, doesn't have principles. But what I do think they have, which I think Destiny is missing here, is I think they do have moral political intuitions about, you know, kind of map, mapping onto the height, you know, care, harm, you know, liberty, oppression, you know, uh, degradation sanctity sort of principles and yeah. the reason that it looks like now i agree that tribalism and i've said this a lot of times tribalism the group identity 
allows people to flip flop. But if you don't understand the sort of the moral intuition mm -hmm. thing, it looks like people are just changing and it looks to be completely for no reason, or it looks to be completely cynical or found based in nothing. But once you kind of understand the moral intuitions, you see that even when there's a flip flop, it's still following the moral intuitions. And what's going on is that the human brain has enough plastic plasticity and moral philosophies and political philosophies have enough malleability to them that very often you can argue the same thing with different principles. And I kind of said this earlier. So like the left and the right have different ideas about why they're isolationists. The right is anti-isolationist because they don't want to give their money to other countries and they don't want to give the resources to other countries. And the left is isolationist because they think America is the evil imperial empire, essentially. Right. And so there's yeah. like, so they're both supporting the same thing, but for very different reasons. Different and there's the same thing with the lockdown. Right. The justification. Yeah. The same thing with the lockdown. So the right was kind of anti lockdown because they were more, they felt more threatened. You know, they have a history of being more threatened and more, feeling more threatened, I should say, from government overreach and being more fearful of government overreach. And therefore, when the government is imposing lockdowns, it's like triggering sort of that cultural institution, the right of being afraid of the government overreach in that regard. And so they're like, oh, lockdown's bad, lockdown's bad. You know, we need to protest this. And then as soon as it's like, well, the lockdowns and the protests suddenly get sucked into the realm of something to do with racial equality, suddenly the left seemingly flip flops on the issue. Right. And it's because it's not based on the principle of the lockdown, it's based on like the care harm foundation of, well, racism and equality is more important than anything else or the whatever the other principle is that that's, you know, it's conflicting with at the moment. Right. Yeah. You can also use different moral intuitions as justification in a lot of different ways, obviously. Yes. Like right. abortion is a, a great example. Like obviously you're worried about the liberty, right? The freedom of the woman or the freedom of the baby. It's right. Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you're using the same exact moral intuition. You're just justifying it differently and coming to completely different conclusions. Yeah. Like if we had a weird history where I don't know, children and babies were oppressed and used as like slave labor, you know, as some kind of like, I guess if we live in a society where like ageism was like a really like big thing, then I, I could very well see that progressives would be hyper anti-abortion because it'd be like, oh, well, this is just another form of ageism, right? You know, you're right. infringing on the liberty and you're oppressing the underaged people. Right. Sure. Yeah. Same justification. Because, like, I could imagine somebody saying that, like, they don't trust, like, a large government, they think there's too much, uh, you know, prone to tyranny or something like that, but also be supportive of an institution like the Catholic Church, which is literally, you know, one guy who has a direct right, line to God. but they can't tax. Um, well, I mean, there's... And they don't have a military. That and is... And they can't conscript you. True, right? yeah. And they can't throw you in jail. That is true, yeah. I mean... Right. I would... Well, those are major, those are major and significant. I mean, I get the, mm -hmm. I get the overlap. Keep all those in mind when Jordan Peterson later argues that society is all voluntary and there's absolutely no force involved. Yeah, that was a bad it, it, point that he makes. Um, but I don't. So I've heard this argument, and I think you know the you know oh you know the church can't do all these things, and the government can't, and that's true. And I think mm -hmm. that those principles are true for libertarians. I don't think it's true for non-libertarian conservatives. I don't think they care about that. I think non-libertarian conservatives would be more okay with the government sort of being more aligned with church morality, if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. And I think okay. that's like that's kind of the danger of these overreaches like right now we have like the leftist overreach with um, a lot of the LGBT stuff, a lot of the transitioning of children stuff is because it basically allows people to say, okay, well, maybe we do need like to move away from, and we've, you've already, I mean, we've already seen this. You've already seen lots of people on the right who are conservative, very openly and explicitly attack libertarianism and libertarian ideas as the problem saying these libertarians are the ones that just allow the socialists to keep pushing our society further and further to the left. We need to take a strong arm here. We need to take a strong stance here and sort of start to have like the government enact policies against, you know, these sorts of leftist uh, degenerative movements.
Yeah, we got to crack some heads. <laughs> right? right. Need the yeah. We you know exactly. Well, that's why it's just it's odd to me that Jordan Peterson is is representing the conservative point of view here when it just. I mean, it doesn't really, it seems like a libertarian point of view. It doesn't seem like a conservative point of view to me. And look, later on, they get, him and Destiny get into a huge back and forth about how Jordan Peterson is basically advocating that we have to structure society without using any force. And it's almost as if he's arguing that society is structured that way in the West. And I'm like, dude, you just admitted that you pay 60% taxes. How can, <laughs> look, what happens if you stop paying those taxes, dude? Right. How is yeah. that not forced? Are you, so are you telling me that you're voluntarily giving 60% of your income to the government, Jordan? Is that what you're telling me? Like, it's just, la it's insanely laughable. I'm surprised that, I mean, that was such an easy kill for destiny. I'm surprised you didn't mention that, but mm -hmm. I mean, look, we'll get into it later and it's, right. it's kind of funny, but look, he points out here, look, all of those things are force. Yes, yeah. that's how yeah. my, that's how the West runs, Jordan. Well, like, when did you become an anarcho-capitalist? I think the important thing to remember here is what you said um, at the beginning of your statement with Jordan Peterson. Kind of Jordan Peterson isn't a conservative. No. And I mean, he even said that in the beginning of this video. He doesn't have the moral intuitions to be a conservative. And so, correct. Yeah, I do think Jordan has probably been a center left leaning libertarian for from the beginning because if you look at the things that interested him even before any of the woke stuff came into being what was it it was looking at the oppressive tyrannical overreach of the communist and fascist governments right. so he's always been very interested and alert to the idea of like the oppressive government so i think that's why the way his framing of things is more from a libertarian perspective that'd be my guess all right, let's get back into this comedy goal. Don't get me wrong. Sure. But, but I'm saying like, even if you had a local government, like a local, like if you had a state government or a tribe, usually they've got some form of enacting punishment. It'll be sometimes more brutal, but they can throw you in jail. Uh, conscription hasn't existed in the U.S. since the Vietnam War. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah. Yeah, true. Um, so, yeah, I think that... Um, I guess when I look at so this is so let's go back. Well, let's go back to yeah, the, sure. to the redistribution issue. Uh -huh. I mean, we pay sixty five percent of our income at say upper middle class, middle class to upper middle class level in Canada. It isn't obvious to me at all that that money is well used. In fact, quite the contrary. In my country now, um, our citizens make. 60% of, they produce 60% of what you produce in the U.S. That's plummeted over the last 20 years as state intervention has increased. I'm not convinced that the claim that the interests of people who lack opportunity are best served by state intervention. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, I'm aware of the relationship between inequality and social problems. Uh -huh. so there's a very well-developed literature on that, and it, it essentially shows that the more arbitrary, the, the, the broader the reach of inequality in, in a political institution of any given size, the more social unrest. So where, peop where all people are poor, there isn't much social unrest, and where all people are rich, there isn't much social unrest. But when there's a big gap between the two, there's plenty, and that's mostly driven by disaffected young men who aren't very happy that they can't climb the hierarchy, there are barriers in their way. And so there is reason to ameliorate relative poverty. The problem with that to some degree is that most attempts to ameliorate relative poverty tend to increase absolute poverty, and they do it dramatically. And the only solution that we've ever been able to develop to that is something approximating a free market system. I wouldn't call it a capitalist system because I think that's capture of the terminology by the radical leftists. It's a free exchange system. And price you pay for a free exchange system is you still have inequality, but the advantage you gain is that the absolute levels of privation plummet. And I think the data on that are, I think they're absolutely conclusive, especially, and that's been especially demonstrated in the radical decrease in rates of poverty since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, because we've lifted more people out of poverty in the last four decades than we had in the entire course of human history up to that date. And that's not least because the statist interventionist types 
who argued for a radical state-sponsored redistribution, lost the Cold War, right? And that freed up Africa to some degree, and certainly the Southeast Asian countries, to pursue something like a free trade economy. And that instantly even, that instantly made them rich, even China. So, well, so that's an argument, let's say, on the side of free exchange, but it's also an argument, a twofold argument, pointing out how we ameliorate absolute poverty, which it should be a concern for leftists, but doesn't seem to be anymore, by the way. And also an argument for the maintenance of a necessary inequality. Like, I'm not sure that inequality can be decreased beyond a certain degree without it, that decrease causing other serious problems. And we can talk about that, but mm -hmm. but it's a complicated um, problem. Yeah, but for one point of clarification, when you say leftist, what do you mean by that? Well, we I was going with your definition, like mm -hmm. essentially the, the 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 core idea being something like the the central problem being one of relative inequality and in distribution of resources, and mm -hmm. the central solution to that being something like state sponsored economic intervention. I mean, there's other ways we could define left sure. and right, and we could do be, that, but, yeah, I, I but I'll be, stick with the one that you brought forward to begin with. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I, I only want to be clear on that because um, uh, people get mad if I call myself a leftist. Um, uh, oftentimes online or in, especially in Europe or worldwide, leftists will ex uh, refer exclusively to like socialists or communists. And anybody to the right of that would be considered like a liberal. If you No, believe, usually like, a, a fascist. Well, <laughs> it depends. Isn't that funny? People give Destiny a hard time because he calls himself a leftist, but he's not a socialist. <laughs> so they're like, dude, <laughs> knock it off, okay? You're right. taking our label. Right. I know Very rapidly. That. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to be clear on that. Uh, so I'm absolutely a pro-capitalist, pro-free-market guy. Um, I'm not. I'm never going to... Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's good. It's good to get that clear. Why? Yeah. Um, because, uh, I would argue that when you look at like the fall of the Soviet Union or you look at the fail failure of like socialist or communist regimes, uh, I don't know if the issue there was so much redistribution. I think the problem- That was one of many issues. I don't think it was an issue at all, actually, I would say. I think the issue was, uh, command and Wait a minute, wait, yeah, a, go ahead. wait yeah. a minute. What, mm -hmm. what do you mean redistribution wasn't an issue? What the hell do you think they did to the kulaks? <clears throat> that was forced redistribution. It resulted in the, in the death of six million people. So maybe mm -hmm. I'm not understanding what you mean, but that was redistribution at its, at its, like, pinnacle. Sure. And forced redistribution. And when it I, was brutal. When I, when I think of the, um, when I think of the strengths of capitalism, um, the ability for markets to dynamically respond to shifting consumer demand is like the reason why capitalism and free market economies dominate the world. When you've got socialist or communist systems, uh, command economies where a government is trying to say, this is how much this is going to cost, this yeah. is how much you're going to produce and make. The, this is a failed way of managing a, a state economy. Even in places where they still do it, there are always shadow economies and stuff. There were in the Soviet Union that prop up where people try to uh, basically ameliorate the conditions that are resulting from said horrible command economy practices. Uh, so I guess in a way you could argue a command economy is kind of like redistribution. It's a form of it, but... No, it's a worse problem. I, if, yeah, you're, yeah. if you're pointing yeah. to the fact that that's a worse problem, I'm... I'm yeah, I would 100%. say that's definitely the reason why these places uh, failed, because they just weren't able to respond to changing okay, conditions. Okay, so what's the difference between us? Going on... This is my favorite part right here. The ExpressVPN. Give me the number. I gotta call. I gotta get my ExpressVPN. <laughs> well... So, but there's kind of an interesting dynamic or like an interesting thing that just happened, which is basically, so Destiny, when he's talking about like why capitalism and so why capitalism is better than socialism, he's talking about it from kind of a more strictly uh, mechanical economic perspective. That's what he laid out. Like why the economy will always work better under a free market system, which most people who are not copy, who are not socialists agree that you need to have the you know, a government or a centralized institution can't have the infinite knowledge to make command economy decisions. It's better to have like all these little independent actors receiving information and then reacting accordingly. And then you kind of create a bottom up system that that moves and reacts far quicker than sort of this like Xi Jinping sort of having to rely on his advisors telling what he wants. And they're all governed by their own political motivations. Right. That's not going to work. Yeah, democracy um, works the same way. Right. Um, but Jordan was talking about like a completely different thing. He was talking about more the philosophical perspective of, because what Jordan said, the thing that was kind of interesting that I wish 
he would that him and Tessany would talk about is that Jordan said, I don't know if it's possible or even what you would want to do to remove all inequality. Jordan was saying that he thinks that there needs to be some level of inequality that exists in a system for a system to function and even be fair. And that like if you'd remove all inequality, that's how you get the sort of forced redistribution of the horrors of socialism. And also I'm assuming if you get into it, that's how you sort of like kill people's you know, intrinsic motivation and desire to do things and business desire to do things and all this other stuff. And that's more of like a philosophical mm-hmm. concern about kind of what you were talking about earlier, Adam, with, you know, the amount of hierarchy that you need. And that kind of ties into how much inequality do you need? And that there is, I think, a problem with not really liberals, but more progressives and leftist types where they do want a society where you have zero inequality which I guess would be good in like a hypothetical um, perfect world. But I, in, until we all reach spiritual enlightenment, because we all take the mushrooms and we all enter the fourth and fifth dimension, you know, as long as we're kind of like acting the way that we're acting, I don't think we'll ever get rid of all inequality. And I don't think you'd ever want to get rid of all inequality. Yeah, you can't. It's ridiculous. Like people want to strive to be better than other people in certain vocations and that's good. So I just, right. th- this idea that we can get rid of that is like laughable. I j- I don't like the, this using forced redistribution, the boogeyman of forced redistribution. Cause look, all taxation is forced re- redistribution. It's another of those, the dose makes the medicine or the right. poison type thing. Like if you're some leftist, that wants forced redistribution to the point where everyone has exactly the same dollar amount in their bank account. Look, you, I'd say you've destroyed society, right? Mm-hmm. But we can't have society separating into the ultra wealthy and the the poor with no middle class. Like there's so many reasons why the middle class is sustains technology and innovation. Like the Grow, the industrial revolution made a growing middle class possible and that's a good thing. So yeah. I just, yeah, but, you got, you got to look the, the whole just categorically force redistribution is evil. I mean, what is taxation if it's not force redistribution? Yeah, no, 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 definitely. But th- this is sort of, and it, this is, I think why there's difficulty with these concepts is humans, myself included, we have this. Uh, predisposition to want to think of things in easy, simple, of course, extreme, black and white. <laughs> yeah, black and white, like extreme ways. Um, and we want to take things to the extremes in order to create like very neat rules and boxes. When in reality, and I'm glad you keep saying it because I think it's very true the dose makes the medicine. Like, yeah. you need, you know, if you have too much inequality, that's going to lead to a toxic system in a toxic environment. And you're going to have, you know, the elites basically suck up all the resources because we all know, and Jordan brings up all the time, you know, the the more money, the more resources, the more energy you have, the easier it becomes for you to acquire more money, more energy, more resources. And so you have to forever be vigilant to that problem. And all systems will lean in that direction unless you force them back in line. And then the opposite, if you go too far and you become the socialist, that again is that's also going to lead to ruin and and you know toxic environments as well yeah, if you try to if, redistribute everything. Yeah, because if you have absolutely no no wealthy people, you you eviscerate everybody's incentive to do anything because people right. strive to be better than other people, and that's a good thing because they develop new innovative products and services and technology that keep us all moving forward into the future. Right. Right. Someday like we're going to find a, yeah, exactly. You know, someday we're going to find a cure for cancer. Right. And that's going to be because somebody wants to be better than everybody else. <laughs> right. Because somebody wants a fucking Nobel Prize. Right. Look, right. that's good. Well, actually, it's probably going to be like some sort of AI that actually finds <laughs> a cure for cancer. But the guy right. who made the AI will win. Right. The, exactly. The, the Nobel Prize. My AI developed a cure for cancer. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, yeah. So, look. Very, very, very important to keep perspective on this kind of thing. It's not always not as sexy as just being like a rule dropper, right? I have principles, no force redistribution. Force redistribution right. is always evil. 
I mean, the trick would be to come up with different terms. Like I, I often say, you know, at some point taxation is theft, right? Yes. And not, like if a taxes are 90% of your income, like it's hard for me to argue that that's not theft. Right. 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 But I mean, if your pe- if your taxes are, oh, let's just say your taxes are 1% of your income. Like, oh my God, I think taxes are way too high now. I think we're definitely in the theft realm. Mm-hmm. But look, if you get my taxes down to 2%, I'm not calling, I'm not saying that's theft. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> right. Okay, okay, so what's the difference between a state that attempts to redistribute to foster equality of opportunity and, and a command economy? Is it, is, it, is it a difference of degree? Like, are you looking at models let's say like the Scandinavian countries, or I wouldn't use Canada, by the way, because Canada is now, uh, what would you call, predicted predicted wow. by economic analysis analysts to have the worst performing economy for the next four decades of all the developed world. So maybe we'll just leave the example of Canada off the table. Sure. Scandinavian countries are often the polities that are pointed to by, I would say, by people who, at least in part, are putting forward a view of redistribution for purposes of equality of opportunity like you are, but they're a strange analogy because they're very small countries and up till now they were very ethnically homogenous. Exactly, and that makes a big difference when you're trying to flatten out the redistribution. Plus, they are also incredibly wealthy, which makes, you know, redistribution, let's say, a lot easier. So, Mm -hmm. so, so, so what's, why why doesn't a government that's bent on redistribution fall prey to the pitfalls of command economy and and forced re- re- redistribution for that matter? How do you how do you protect against that? I, I think what you, what you have to do is very 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 difficult. Is people get very ideologically captured by both ends and they feel very uh, I guess like committed or they feel very allegiant to pushing certain forms of economic organization and I think sometimes it blinds them to some of the benefits of what exists when you incorporate kind of multiple models, or I mean, you'd call them mixed economies, which is really what every capitalist economy today is. It's some form of free market capitalism combined with some form of like government intervention to control for negative externalities. These are the ways that all economies, even in Scandinavia and the world work. And I think that recognizing the benefits of both systems are the okay. best way to, yeah, to, okay, to make okay. things work. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And, and the Scandinavian countries seem to have done a pretty good job mm-hmm. of that. But like I said, they have a simpler problem to solve, let's say, than sure. the Americans have. Negative externalities. Uh-huh. That's a, you know, that's an interesting rabbit hole to wander down because the problem I have with negative externalities, you made a case already that, and again, correct me if I've got this wrong, but I, I, I think I think that I understood what you said. Um, a free market, free exchange economy is a gigantic distributed computational device. Basically, yeah. Right, exactly. And Which, so, funnily enough, one of the big problems for command economies is called the computation problem because no central body can actually compute, yes, you know, the ins and outs of... Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right, that, that's not... Yeah, that's, that's a fatal problem, mm-hmm. right? Because it doesn't have the computational power. It certainly doesn't have the... The speed of data recognition. It doesn't have on, the on the ground agents if, if all of the perception and decision making is centralized, right? It's uh-huh. way too low resolution. It's going to crash. Okay. So, and I think that that's comprehensible technically as well as ideologically. All right. So, but having said that, with regards to externalities, all the externalities that a market economy can't compute are so complex that they can't be determined centrally by the same argument. And there so there are ways to account for them though. Really? That work with Tell me. Yeah. How. So because I can't see that because mm-hmm. I can't see how that they they can be accounted for without the same computational problem immediately arising. Yeah, and I understand that. And I think that's a problem sometimes of people very far on the left when they want to deal with certain problems. Uh, I think that they want to bring like heavy handed, you know, like things like price controls in to say, well, we need less of this. So let's just make this cost this particular thing, which ironically enough introduces a whole other set of externalities that will happen when you get a lot of friction between where your price floor or ceiling is set compared to what a market was set it at. But 
Ideally, if you're a reasonable person and you view economies as mixed economies, what you try to do is you try to take these externalities, meaning things that aren't accounted for with your primary system. So in a capitalist system, an externality might be something that caused a negative effect, but it doesn't cost you any money. Pollution would be a good example of that. And rather than saying like, well, no company can pollute this much, or you know, if you're a company, you have to use these things because we, the other things are making too much pollution, all you do is you say, okay, well, if we've determined that, say, carbon is bad for the atmosphere, well, we're just going to attach a little price to that. So okay, the government is going to say that, yeah, if you pollute this much, here's the price, and then if you want to pay for it, you can. But that type of uh, intervention in the economy basically allows the free market to hopefully do its job because the government has tacked on a little bit of a price something that it tries to account for the cost of that externality, yeah. Great. That's a great example. We can go right down that rabbit hole. Uh -huh. Carbon. Okay, so first of all, um, one of the things I've seen, you tell me what you think about this, something that I've seen that actually shocks me that I was interested in watching over the last five or six years. I wondered what would happen when the left, the progressives, ran into a conundrum. And the conundrum is quite straightforward. If you pursue carbon pricing and you make energy more expensive, then you hurt the poor. And I don't think you just hurt them. In fact, I know you don't, you just don't hurt them. I heard a man two days ago who's fed 350 million people in the course of his life, um, heading the UN's largest relief agency, make the claim quite straightforwardly that, that misappropriation on the part of interventionist governments increased the rate of absolute privation dramatically in, in the world over the last four or five years. And, not, and that has happened not least because of carbon pricing, not just carbon pricing, but the insistence that carbon per se is an externality that we should control. Now, Germany's paid a radical price for that, for example, so their power is now about five times as expensive as it could be. And they pollute more per unit of power than they did 10 years ago before they introduced these policies that were hypothetically there to account for externality. And the externality was carbon dioxide. I don't think that's a computable externality. And I don't think, think there's any evidence whatsoever that it's actually an externality that we should be warping the economic system to ameliorate if the cost of that, and it will be, will be an increase in absolute privation among the world's poor. So, and here's a here's an additional argument on that front with- Should we start a ameliorate counter? I feel like we're getting close to ameliorate off here. <laughs> <laughs> Let mm -hmm. me know if I need to bring it out here. Regards to- yeah, I know you love all this climate change stuff. We cover climate change on the channel. Oh, so much. Oh, it's this thing that <laughs> Sitch and I just can't stop talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Jordan's yeah. position. It's Jordan's Jordan's position used to be in line with Warren Lomberg, who acknowledges that climate change is real, man-made, but says we should be focusing on technological ways out of the problem instead of carbon taxes and, and things like that mm -hmm. because it puts a giant strain on poor and developing countries, which progressives should be uh, uh, sympathetic with, right? So mm -hmm. I do understand. But in this conversation, I do, it seems like, you know, Jordan Peterson has been smoking cigars with too many people at the Daily Wire, and now it's almost like he doesn't really even think climate change is real. Yeah, so, I mean, well, yeah. obviously as you, you know, mm -hmm. if you're in a community of people and there's kind of a dominant belief, you know, obviously, it, you know, if, if that dominant belief presses on you and it becomes easier and easier to sort of accept those dominant beliefs, just because, you know, you like these people, you trust these people, and if they're telling you things and you like them and trust them, it makes sense that you start to also assimilate those beliefs into your own beliefs. Right. Um, for me personally, you know, and, and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, where the lack of faith in experts and in, in, in institutions definitely has had a profound impact on me as well, especially in terms of the realm of climate change, which is that I don't just, be, I don't really just believe anything because an expert or institution tells me that I should right. believe it. And I generally try to say, okay, let me see if I can like figure this out myself. Let me see if I can dive into the information myself. And when I've tried to dive into the information myself on climate change, it's like, there's two problems. Number one, it's like way above my my pay grade of understanding. 
there's a lot of information to get through. And then number two, it just seems like there's so much information on both sides that I just don't have the time, energy, or even motivation, or maybe even intellectual capacity to really sort through everything to make a determination about how I feel about it. And I mean, I've heard, to me, I mean, from my lay perspective, I've heard pretty compelling arguments from various sources of, you know, multiple sides of the issue about, you know, it's totally real and it's like super bad. It's real, but not so bad. It's not real. Like I've heard convincing arguments from all these sides of things to the point that I just kind of throw my hands up there and I say, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really have a strong opinion on climate change one way or the other because of it. So that's why, I mean, we kind of barely ever talk about it on, on stream. This is a really good book, Boren Lomberg's False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. Super accessible. He doesn't go too deep into any of the climate science or anything, but he does lay out the numbers in a very behavioral economics and even financial economics set sense mm -hmm. of how um, these, these policies are basically pushing us in the wrong direction. So, right su super accessible book he and even in the end of the book he pitches a lot of climate change policies that he would be in favor of like he goes through all of the technological advances when we thought we were like there was a, some guy wrote a book basically saying that everyone would starve because you know we're, our population was growing so fast that we couldn't produce mm -hmm. enough food but then came along fertilizers <laughs> like sp right these, right these agribusiness fertilizers that totally got us out of the problem through some sort of technological change that nobody ever saw coming. He said that sort of thing is, is inevitable. And where we really should be spending money is, is, you know, we should be financing all these different kinds of technological developments that could get us out of this. You know, he's obviously a big proponent of nuclear. He's like the nuclear technology is developing very rapidly. So I just, the, one of the reasons why I don't, I, I'm not particularly interested in it is because if you read this book, it seems like climate change is not really that big a problem and it's just being used as a political cudgel to, for, for progressives to win elections. So the, even though, and, and I know that conservatives downplay climate change a lot, but which is more dangerous to people downplaying climate change, even though, you know, we're probably going to solve it through technological advances or the people using it to get elected and spending a bunch of money that's actually going to have a tangible effect on poor people and not really solve the problem well that only i mean it, it depends on what the outcome is if it turns out to not be a big deal or we solve it then obviously that's one answer right um if we do solve it or it's not that big a deal it's obviously a different a different answer like one of the things that's annoying me is like so we've been seeing maybe we've been saying this is why i, I can't I can't talk about this issue with any level of certainty and it annoys me. Like, so the last, I don't know, you know, eight years or so, we've been seeing like all these giant hurricanes coming. Right. During hurricane season. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, well, okay, Going is that a right result for of Stitch's home? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, okay, so is that a result of climate change? And you'll see some articles that will say that, but then when you actually read the articles and you look at like the experts, the experts always say, maybe like they don't even know no one even knows right. if if these hurt are maybe the hurricanes aren't even giant. Aren't they? like well are the hurricanes even really giant you know people bring up to say well actually this is actually like a low amount of hurricanes or it's actually the same amount it's just like the way it's been covered is completely different you know and you're just not conceptualizing it this way so it's like it's just so much conflicting information for me to sort of wrap my mind around that i just kind of have tapped out on the whole issue sort of I, I do look i think just just from what i've read and look I, i've maybe it's my happy-go-lucky attitude but i am kind of mm -hmm. prone towards the more optimistic literature on the topic <laughs> but i think the hurricanes i think are gonna they're here to stay sitch so i mean florida might have to make some changes might have well, I don't to, know, it's weird because like if if that's the case, the the markets and the economy is definitely not reflecting that at all. You know, business and real estate and property in Florida is just 
booming like crazy. Didn't so, they pull? Didn't insurance companies pull out of Florida for some reason? Yeah, but that they did, and that was well. It's that's all thanks to you know thirty years ago uh, when Hurricane Andrew basically in like the nineties you know destroyed and hit so many parts of Florida that it, like the a lot of the insurance companies went out of business from that and they just never recovered. Essentially, no one wants to insure a lot of things. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's well, but that's going to continue. I know, but it's weird because it doesn't seem to be reflective at all in real estate. People are still buying up real estate left, to right, and center in terms of Florida and on beachfront property. People don't seem very concerned about it. The market doesn't seem very concerned about it. Now that could all change, I guess, if some big ass hurricane, you know, hits uh, and destroys a lot of the the big cities. Because I mean, even though we've been having these giant hurricanes recently. Even the one that hit Florida a few years back, I don't think it actually like it, it did destroy some of the smaller cities, but I don't think it really destroyed any of the large cities. And maybe that's all it takes psychologically is for like some large cities to get totally wiped out or something. I don't know. Yeah. Are these people paying cash for these homes and they don't have any insurance that, because they can't get insurance? I guess they don't really give you hurricane insurance anyway. So. You can get, well, it's too complicated to get into. You can get insurance, yeah. but it's not great insurance. Um, Michael right. Land for $20, thank you so much, says, how do you guys explain the overlap on the right left on Israel-Palestine? I love what you do, and A-Team reigns supreme. Woo, look at that. There you go. Well, when, when you say Killing the overlap, what I mean, what do you, I guess, who's overlapping what, right? Um, Conservatives being pro-Israel? Well, that was another thing that was like retarded that Glenn Greenwald was saying about Candace Owens, the right historically in America has been very pro-Israel right. from like the beginning. Um, so he was like, it was super weird for him to sort of associate like Candace Owens and sort of the more isolationist right people now kind of being anti-Israel. That's like unique. That's a new thing for some people in the right to do. The right has been very, very, very pro-Israel for almost for my entire lifetime, at least. Um, and so the overlap for supporting Israel, I think, was just because, well, I've, well, I, I guess, are you, I guess the question is, okay, so the, over, the overlap of supporting of Israel was historically, was generally both the right and the left in America were kind of more sus of Muslims <laughs> than they were of Jews. Mm -hmm. And they were, and they would kind of look at Israel as like a liberal democracy. It seemed like a culture and something that was more aligned with our culture, I think. And so people could have been more aligned with that. Um, you know, there also people could have been more aligned with the fact that they still felt uh, empathy and sympathy for the Jews because of the Holocaust and because they could kind of side with, you know, oh, you know, there's all these surrounding Arab countries. They all have these all Arab countries and, and Jews get one country. And then obviously the right, you know, has the feeling that not, the, I shouldn't say the right, but I'd say some religious conservatives in the Republican Party have kind of the feeling or the belief that the Jews have to control Israel in order for Jesus to come back. And all that stuff, and also from their perspective, it's easier for for uh, Americans to sort of interact with and go to Israel and go to Israeli ho go to Christian holy sites because the Israeli government is very pro allowing, you know, uh, tourism and Christian tourism to come to, to Israel. In terms of like now turning away from it, the overlap. I mean, it's an interesting thing about like how you can have two different intuitions that are, or two different two similar positions that are based on different intuitions. Because I think the the isolationist perspective from the right is rooted in a, I don't want to, like it's it's kind of this, I don't want to send my money out of the country. Like why am I supporting any of this stuff, right? Yeah. You know, why loyalty. am I getting taxed more? Right. That's the just, loyalty intuition. Well, it's that it's very difficult. So I would I would wager, my intuition tells me if you could somehow calculate the economic advantage that America gets from giving various countries foreign aid, I would guess, I would speculate that most of the foreign aid we give to countries, we actually end up making more money in for whatever we give out. That'd be my guess. From the but country? It doesn't, yeah. But Probably it's not, so. We're usually right. using it to buy some policy that we want. Like exactly. Cheap labor. Yeah. Or some. Yes, right. Yeah. But it's not like you don't you don't give them money and then you get a check back so they can very easily. It's like as you're saying, there's some policy that happens or there's something 
that's kind of more yeah. difficult to measure that we end up getting back. Um, and that's why it can be difficult to make these calculations. But so that's kind of the intuition is that it's it's kind of like when you people would be more okay with paying taxes if they could understand and see and very clearly feel what their tax money was going towards. Right. Where a lot of people feel like they're just throwing their tax money into a pit and they don't really understand or feel that they're getting anything back. And it's the same thing with a lot of uh, money to foreign countries. That's how it feels, to, whether it's true or not, that's how it feels to people. And so a lot of people feel that way regarding Israel, basically any foreign um, intervention. I think that's part of it for the, for the isolation on the right. I think another part of it, which is a little bit more subversive, so I don't know how many people are operating under this, is, you know, there's this long-standing idea that, you know, Israel and, quote, the Jews are, like, controlling society in some kind of nefarious ways, and a lot of people blame the Jews for being responsible for, like, communist or woke subversion. So I do think that that has some element. I don't know how much of that is there, but I do think that has some element kind of baked deep within some of that um, rhetoric. And then from the left, it's just because you know the the left has turned the the leftists, I should say, the socialists, the very progressive people. I mean, we've talked about this a lot. It, it's just very simply, I think that they look at it like the Israelis are the white European colonizers who have come to colonize, you know, the land away from the brown people, and they look at it from that perspective. And they look at it from the perspective that Israel has all this military power, and the Palestinians don't have any military power, so they just kind of have a very simplistic like oh, they're the dominant oppressive force attacking, you know, the oppressed minority. And that's kind of where they're, and that's where the overlap is. Even so they, so you have two people that have an overlap on a position, but there are very different reasons for why they support the same position. Right. So, um, let's see. Michael for $20 says, to the Nazis, the Jews were the elite responsible for all their ills. To the Bolsheviks, landowners were elite responsible for their ills. Populism casts the elites as the amorphous source of all problems. It's dangerous. That is that is the potential problem. Yeah, with populism. Exactly. Is that who are you casting the the elites as? And what do you do to get rid of them? What do you do to get rid of the elites and their institutions, right? And very often you can turn to a charismatic leader, like the socialist leader or the fascist leader. So that's definitely the issue. It depends upon what the policy is, obviously. You know, if right. you're voting for somewhat redistributive economic policies. I mean, that's better than the pitchforks, right? That's what you don't want. Sure. Uh, J Mac, our sorry, father for $20. Thank you so much. Says if this is Jordan Pearson's video, couldn't you guys watch this on the daily wire app for no ads? I heard y'all had the hook. <laughs> well, I thank you. J -Mac. Watch, yes. We I want to watch the bonus one, but I think we might get in trouble. Yeah. Thank you, J Mac. We do. We do. Yes. Wink wink. But um it's so the watch the way the watch together room works is it's very finicky for a lot of sites and the easiest site that it has the least problems using is YouTube. So that's why we generally right. try to use a YouTube video. But thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think we will talk about the bonus because we I watched the bonus. Will. I watched it, yeah. yeah. I watched it. Yeah. yeah. There's an interesting twenty minute conversation that happens, I think, after this conversation that's not on YouTube. Right, it's just for Daily Wire. Right. Da Daily Wire viewers. Yes, subscribers. That's what they call them. Yes. Uh, Dr. Fire for 20 Canadian says, I think it's probably important to remember Jordan Pearson was a university professor and a psychologist, not exactly professions known for conservatism, I believe. I could be wrong. He was voting for the NDP before he was pushed in public life. Yeah, I, that, is an, that is a good point. And I mean, he said this himself. He's never thought of himself as a conservative, you know, uh, through most of his life, and he definitely doesn't hit the conservative intuitions when he takes, uh, you know, moral foundations tests and big five personality trait tests and things of that nature. So, uh, Freedom Made Free for $2 says, are you misrepresenting the anti-vax position on purpose? Did we talk about, did we even talk about? I don't think so. Vaccine? I don't even know what you're referring yeah. to. I, I mean, I mean we, we talked about like people being against the lockdowns because it's infringement on their liberty. I don't, I don't know what the anti-vax position is that you're talking about, but yeah, we, we didn't cover COVID a lot either. So I guess when COVID comes up, we'll talk we'll about talk it there. I, I feel it, yeah. similar to COVID as I do about climate change. Yeah. Uh, Val Van Gogh for $20 says climate science scientists are like fashion photographers. They both tend to fall in love with their models. 
Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard lots <laughs> of. I mean, it's very funny. That's a good joke. That's good. But I've one. heard lots of. Um, I've heard lots of compelling arguments about why a lot of the models used by climate scientists are faulty and how that kind of leads people down um, these improper predictions, which seem to be proven wrong time and time again and sort of these ideas. So, If we found a method of, of carbon capture, I think putting that into effect would be a good thing to do. So, Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the new technologies are some sort of carbon capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what we need to do. We just need to solve the problem. We need to be able to burn as much fossil fuel as we need to. Well, until we can get more clean energy sources. The, right. He, in the book, he it's super interesting because he goes into the storage of energy is something that we haven't had some new technological breakthrough in like centuries <laughs> like we're still right. storing energy by putting it in a lake somewhere and like running a you know running it through some hydro converter which is just come on let's just why can't we just figure out some better technology right yeah was it kind of like there's that meme that's like all engines are steam engines still yeah yeah or something yeah it's like all yeah so we and we haven't really you know improved upon you know that design right so um get some of those of the, people that want to be famous and want to you know up their status move up the status hierarchy become rich and famous right, right. get them working on a solution well that's what's weird and that's why i think it's very hard for people to make these technological predictions is that there's been so much technology that we've like light years ahead of where we were like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. And there's a lot of technology that's basically been stagnant. Right. So it is interesting. Why would it be so difficult for the government to just come up with a list of just amazing technology, like the flying car, a time machine, like, and we'll <laughs> pay a certain amount of money for this, right? Yeah. Okay. Like 10 billion, what do we care? A time machine? Fuck yeah, 10 billion. Mm -hmm. Give us a time machine. And yeah. so, but how's that going to work? Are you saying that they're going to invest to make that? Or they're going to say, if you invent this, no, we'll just give you. Look, it, it costs nothing to come up with a list, right? Say, look, mm -hmm. this is, and you can even update the list with, with inflation, right? A perpetual motion machine. I don't know. What do you want to put on they're the list? What I'm saying is, are you saying that like, they'll basically put bounties on technology? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I don't even yes. know if that's necessary because presumably if someone created a perpetual motion machine or a time machine, like, I mean, you'd they presumably make a shit zillion dollars you know you would need the a government bounty right to to facilitate that yeah i mean but why not just come up with a list <laughs> okay <laughs> well, i mean what what does it hurt i right? guess it'd be fun look you can monetize a time machine after you get the 10 million from the government right yeah look you've but got advertising money Knight of the Diamond Spoon, thanks so much for another $50. Thank you. Says, God damn it, Adam. I'm right leaning and I'm absolutely against big government. Now I'm unfortunately for S class. Look at that. There you go. Well, I'm since not you talking score about... so low on loyalty, I mean, maybe there we're S class is. all along. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I said, I'm not talking about the summons per se. I'm saying when it's obvious the law is unjust, it's okay to be defiant. Oh, okay. I mean, shh. Or, I mean, I, I guess I'd say yes. Obviously, where we, every individual person, you know, draws the line of, quote, what is obvious that the law is unjust is different. Um, well, actually, I, and it, to me, it's not even a, there's whether a law is unjust or not would only be part of the criteria. There could be unjust laws that have very minor, that could inconvenience your life in a very minor way or that the penalty for going against you know like say like okay say there was a law where they said oh you know if you um i don't know i have to think of an example like if you litter we're going to execute you right like i don't think that that's just and i would fight that i don't know if i'd fight it by littering right? <laughs> because it's like it's a minor thing but then the the penalty for it is so extreme 
like, okay, well, let me fight that in the courts, right? I don't necessarily want to get executed on the spot by the killer drone that's going to fly this guy and blow you up if you litter on the spot. So it's kind of like, yeah, part of the criteria is something that you believe is unjust, but then the other part of the criteria is like, well, how can you change the law? How much does the law inconvenience you in your daily life? Things of that nature. So. Okay. The externalities. You get that wrong, and here's something you could get right instead. If you ameliorate absolute poverty oh, among the world's one billion, billion poorest, they take a longer view of the future, and that means they become environmentally aware. And so the fastest route to a sustainable planet could well be the remediation of absolute poverty, and the best route to that is cheap energy. And we're interfering with the development of cheap energy by meddling with the hypothetically detrimental externality of carbon dioxide and so that's a born lomer position right essentially pretty much yeah yeah well he he kind of goes against i i don't like it when people say oh we're never gonna figure out solar like solar's just mm -hmm. a waste of time well until it isn't I mean, right 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 yeah maybe it's not working out now but i mean plants well, figured it out they they're solar Sure, but obviously plants require much less energy than, you know, generally human consumption does. But, I, yeah, I think people say it just in terms of, they do say it broadly, which they shouldn't. They mean in terms of when someone says, like, we're not going to figure it. Yeah, it's, people should say we're never going to figure out solar because we could, we very well could. Um, but that doesn't mean that solar is the answer to all the problems. And unfortunately, I think people are sort of investing in a lot of, quote, green energies that are a waste of time and money at the moment as opposed to investing in nuclear or some other things. Well, and Jordan Peterson gets a little debate brain here because he, he uses the, you know, when the sun doesn't shine, you know, when it's overcast, well, you know, it's dark at night too. It's the planet turns. That's a huge problem. But this is right, why right. Born, Born Longbird talks about the storage problem, right? Like that's just a storage problem. Like you store up the energy while the sun is shining and you use it later. Yeah, well, I don't. So, at least when I've heard smarter people talk about this issue, whatever the conversion ratio of sunlight into energy, you know, the specific parts of the country that get the requisite prerequisite sunlight, I guess, to maintain various electric grids, and there are a lot of places in the country that don't. And right. So that would be sort yes. of the issue, right? Yeah, but if you could construct a grid where you're shipping electricity and storing it in different ways i mean the problem is being able to ship energy at long distances yeah of course yeah. of course right but that's why we need tech some sort of technology technological breakthrough well we need that's to revive and clone uh nikola tesla who could you know with his wireless electric uh Look, towers nikola tesla clone put it on the list there you 10 go, million dollars yeah <laughs> like well, what the heck there you go he said, Nicola, listen, if you can give Nicola us this, Nicola this, this wireless uh, energy electric charging tower, you know, we'll give you all the all the female pigeons you want. Oh, yeah. Ooh, <laughs> gross. It, it's, I think this is a complete bloody travesty, by sure. the way. We are putting the lives of hundreds of millions of people uh -huh. directly at risk right now to hypothetically save people in the future, depending on the accuracy of our projections. A hundred years out, in these, these interventionists, these people who are remediating externalities, they actually believe that they can calculate an economic projection one century out. That's utterly delusional. So, okay, so just as a, to be clear, the first thing, I was just giving an example of how you can use like a government intervention to make a free market track something, which which is yeah. what cap and trade or like carbon taxes would do. Uh, I wasn't necessarily speaking to the strength of that individual thing, but- Yeah, but that's a good that, thing to focus on. Sure, yeah, we can focus on that as well. That's a externality. Yeah. We can focus on that as well. So um, the first thing, uh, this is gonna sound mean, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm very realistic. Uh, there needs to be a better argument than just it disproportionately impacts the poor. That's, that's not always- Classic leftist argument. Sure, it might be, a, but uh, right, but it's the same argument you made to justify your swing to the left at the beginning of our discussion. You said that you were looking at economic inequalities that disproportionately affected the poor. So uh -huh. I can't see why, and I'm, I'm not trying to be mean about this no, either. I, I can't see why you could base your argument that it was moral 
it was morally appropriate for you to swing to the left from your previous position because you saw disproportionate effects on the poor. And I can't use that argument in the situation that I'm presenting it right now. Well, because it depends on if we think it's a condition that ought to be remedied or not. For instance, if I walk you know, around and I see homeless people and I'm like, man, this is really sad. We ought to spend more hom money on homeless people because it seems like they're disproportionately affected by their living conditions. And then somebody says, oh, well, do you think we should still lock up you know, rapists and murderers? Aren't they disproportionately poor? I'd probably say, well, yeah, we probably should. And I go, well, isn't that hypocritical? Well, no, I think that rapists and murderers should probably be in jail, but we can also help the homeless at the same time. I think that just helping the poor isn't an argument, a, 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 like a blank check to do every possible thing to satisfy poorer people. Right, and I it's agree. It's going to depend on, on, from issue yeah, to issue. Yeah, well, that's fine. So, like, for instance, I think— because the poor, mm -hmm. everyone who's poor is not a victim. Some people who are poor are psychopathic mm. perpetrators, sure. and it's very useful to distinguish them. But I was mm. making a much more specific argument. My argument was that the fastest way out of absolute privation for the world's bottom billion people is through cheap energy. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying there. So I just worked so, my way towards that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say that just because something targets the poor is not necessarily an argument against it. Uh, another it depends on how hard it targets them, and it depends on whether it, mass starvation is the outcome. The outcome is important. That I agree with. So, for instance, like a sin tax. The, the, on the like, outcome will be mass starvation. Yeah, I'm getting to it. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting to it. Okay. Sin taxes on like cigarettes and alcohol are always going to disproportionately impact the, the poor, or even sugar, we might say, right? But just because that disproportionately impacts the poor, is that a good thing or a bad thing? These are probably the people that suffer the most from those particular afflictions. Right, right. right. So, well, a, a, and that is an immediate targets, versus delayed issue is. too, right? Because well, the reason... Well, no, but I, mean, I mean, obesity is an immediate. No, I don't think alcoholism is. I mean, the is. reason for the tax is, is to stop people from sh per per pursuing a certain form of short-term gratification at the for cost sure. of their longer-term well-being. Correct. And, and that, that, that exact same idea... If you believe climate models, or if you believe that we're heading in a certain direction uh, in terms of climate, the overall warming of the planet, would be the same argument you would make for climate change. Only that, if you believe that you could model economic development 100 years into the future. Well, we're not trying to model, we're, we're more concerned with modeling climate development no, than economic development. No, 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 we're yes, equally, con no, well, okay, tell, tell me how I'm wrong. I don't <laughs> believe that, because what I see happening is two things. We have climate models that purport to explain what's going to happen over a century on the climate side, but we have economic models layered right on top of those that claim that there's going to be various forms of disaster for human beings economically as a consequence of that climate change. And so that's like two towers of Babel stacked on top of one another. And so, because if, if people were just saying, oh, the climate's going to change, there'd be no moral impetus in that. It's the climate's going to change and that's going to be disastrous for the biosphere and for humanity. But that's an economic argument as well as a climate-based argument. It's it's both, but the the worst the worst projections of what would happen if the climate took a disastrous turn are worse than the worst projections of what is our planet going to look like economically if we hardcore police, uh, right. you know, fossil. But why rates. would you? Okay, but so I, I, so the, I don't the understand the, the distinction well, the between the models. Well, is that true? I mean, I feel like it's not, but um, I mean, Born Lomberg's argument is that. The we're headed for economic catastrophe long before we head for climate catastrophe. But he's destiny is saying that no, the climate catastrophe is going to be much harsher than the economic catastrophe. But the, I mean, that's the standard progressive New York Times consensus of uh, climate scientists. That's well, the that's the party line. I think what. Destiny's position that he said here, which I don't think is the correct way or necessarily a good way to, to look at it, is that if we were to take like the worst case scenario for both, so the worst case scenario for the economy versus the worst case scenario for the environment, that presumably the worst case scenario for the environment would be significantly worse, right? Because mm -hmm. that could be like the destruction of like humankind where the worst case scenario for the economy would be like humans would survive, but we'd all restructure our governments or whatever, right? Um, and so that's kind of, I think that's the argument he's making, but I don't think that's a good way of looking at it because we shouldn't be, like if you don't know how the model, if you don't know the way the models will actually play out, you could say, well, okay, like the theoretical worst case scenario could be the environment, but if that model is incorrect, why would you march headlong into creating a worst case or a bad economic outcome that will cause lots of destruction and death and and all those bad outcomes based on 
like a fear that may never actually materialize. Right. Wasn't China's one child policy revolved revolving around the idea that they were going to starve because of the the food situation? Like that policy ended up being catastrophic for China and the food thing panned out through agribusiness. Yeah, so, I don't know if the the rationale was because they were afraid of food or just general overcrowding or what. Yeah, I don't know what the exact idea was, but Well, I just I I think I do think that's like a cautionary tale because a lot of the mm -hmm. the climate policy that they're pursuing is kind of like the one child policy. Like right. once you've decided, okay, we're going to forgo go all of this potential economic growth because we have to cut back on our fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. I mean, all that economic growth could have resulted in some new technology that completely solves the problem. So, and mm -hmm. once you've gone down that path, I mean, it's like you're in China's boat. Like you can't go back and make the kids that you never had. Like you can't yeah. go back and make the technological developments that you never pursued. Well, it's kind of like the Thomas Sowell, there's only trade-off scenario. Like, so China, you know, is looking at their population increasing and maybe they're worried about lack of food. Maybe they're worried about just general population density growing out of control and overpopulation growing out of control. Cause you know, we all know the rat utopia and various experiments. We all know the psychology of, you know, these hyper populated areas, you know, cause a host of problems. And so they, that was kind of their, their goal and their focus while they negate, like while they miss the fact that, well, the way that modern economies function is that they basically need a growing economy to continue to function properly. Well, and, and if you don't have a growing population, then your economy is going to be in, in big shit trouble. And that's kind of the, the whole China's in at the, or is going to be in soon. Yeah. Economic growth sustains technological growth. Yeah. Yes. And the whole, the whole climate change, climate crisis people, I mean, they're all degrowthers. They don't want economic growth. Like we're fine right where we're at. It just, it strikes me as just catastrophic thinking. So I, I, I am, I do lean to the side of technology is going to work this out and making a bunch of changes, I think could have the same kind of reap the same kind of uh, catastrophic outcomes as the one child policy did in China, where we think we're doing the right thing, but our perspective is just completely myopic on this. I mean, yeah, it's definitely possible. That's definitely, definitely possible. Well, that's destiny's perspective, I think. Well, destiny's more trusting of sort of the, you know, uh, expert mainstream position on climate change. The people who where, came up with the one child policy. Well, <laughs> I don't think that's fair to say. I mean, I don't want to sort of fall into the trap of like, because different experts were wrong about different policies somewhere else. Therefore, all experts are wrong. I mean, I just, okay. my understanding is that when I've, you know, seen discussion and seen predictions of climate modeling, they have seemed to have been wrong consistently or misaligned consistency con consistently in the prediction models i've seen at least i've seen convincing evidence that the prediction models are just not up to snuff and they haven't ever really been up to snuff for these kind of like long-term temperature predictions the thing that i like about lomborg's book is he goes in and looks at each of the climate policies that people come up with and does the economic spreadsheets on this is how much economic growth you're going to lose and this is how much reduction of temperature you're going to get right and it's just laughable you're like what you're right like, so yeah what? so his perspective is not even so you're saying like he's not even looking at models or anything he's just saying that like it's all the, the economic change is is pretty drastic for basically a very little change in the actual environment that's basically a virtue signal yeah you're actually just hurting your ability to help the environment because by limiting the economic change you're basically limiting technological growth that would actually help us figure out the problem if there is a problem he goes into one metric that's just devastating so 
a lot of, there's a lot of hay made about people who die of heat stroke because it gives into the climate change narrative, but nobody mm -hmm. makes any hay about how many people die of cold. And mm -hmm. it's 10 times the number of people die each year from cold than from heat. Right. So he starts talking about how, look, if you raise the temperature, those numbers are going to go down. You could literally have less people dying. Yeah, but that's, and that's part of why I get so like annoyed and confused about the whole topic is because some of the people that, that push the, the global warming climate change position say, well, actually climate changes, the climate change would affect in such a way that it becomes hotter and colder simultaneously. Like the right, extremes go up. There's winners and losers. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if, I don't know enough about it to know whether that's true or valid, but. Right. Yeah. So. No, there's definitely going to be winners and losers and it's important. Like nobody knows, nobody can map out all the winners and losers because it's a dynamic system. It's huge. It's the same problem as some sort of command economy. So right. everyone's just basically guesstimating. Guessing. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Hence why we don't talk about it so much. Well, the argument would be that whatever pain and suffering poor people might endure right now because of a move towards green energy, that pain and suffering is going to be short term and far less than the long term pain and suffering. Right, but that that's comes dependent on the integrity of the economic models and the and, and, the, the, and the climate models as well, right? right exactly, course, but yeah. that but is in exactly mm -hmm. the stacked manner that I described. And like, there's nobody in 1890 who could have predicted what was going to happen in 1990 economically. Uh -huh. Not not a bit. Not a bit. And and if we think we can predict like 50 years out now with the current rate of technology and calculate the potential impact of climate change on economic flourishing for human beings, we're deluded. No one can do that. And then, mm -hmm. and so, and it, it's worse. So imagine that as you do that and you project outward, your margin of error increases. That's absolutely, definitely the case. And at some point you're, Certainly on the climate side, the margin of error gets rapidly to the point where it subsumes any estimate of the degree to which the climate is going to transform. And that happens even more rapidly on the economic side. Potentially. So, but right now, I think right now, this is a disagreement on the fact of the matter, though, not the philosophy of what we're talking about in terms of controlling externalities. If we think, I'm, so I'm curious, let's say that we think we can accurately predict the climate and the economic impact, and we think that the climate impact would be far worse if we don't account for that, both in terms of yeah, human conditions and- I don't believe and, any of those presumptions. I sure, think but then, but then if you don't, but I mean, like, obviously, if I agreed with that, that factual analysis, I would probably agree with you on the prescription here too, right? And well, while I don't like none of the climate models were accurate or couldn't accurately predict anything, they're not also say why they Well, they're not sufficiently accurate. That's the first thing. And sure. sec, because they have a margin of error and it's a large margin of error, they don't even model cloud coverage well. That's a big problem. They don't have the resolution. They don't have nearly the resolution to produce the accuracy that's claimed by the climate apocalypse mongers. People Not keep even saying close. that, but we just got another one of the hottest years on record. How many times are we going to have another hottest year on record? How many times are we going to have an increase of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere before we're finally like, okay. I don't hmm. know. And the, the reason I... So it's kind of an interesting thing to have in the conversation just here, which is that, you know, so Jordan's kind of making his point that we were, that you were talking about, about how all this... Uh, climate change initiative is actually going to end up causing harm in, in various ways. And Destiny's response to that was basically, well, it's all dependent on what models you're looking at, whether you trust the weather models or not. And he tried to kind of broach a hypothetical where he said, well, like if I agree with, you know, the climate models are off and the economic models are correct, then I'll, I'll take your position. Um, but if, you know, the climate models were correct, you know, wouldn't that change your position? And Jordan didn't really engage the hypothetical. He just kept attacking the climate models. And now that sort of made Destiny change his position from just kind of being more neutral of like, well, it depends on your models to now actually defending the models. Right. Right. So wow. he's doing right here. And like, I don't know if that was an intentional thing that Jordan was doing, like in order to create this part of the circ the situation or this part of the conversation, or if it's just something that happened because Jordan didn't really want to engage in the hypothetical, or maybe just because he's very passionate about the subject or whatever. But it's kind of an interesting shift that he that that Jordan really wanted to bring this to this like the making the fact claim about the climate models, which you know I don't know I I don't think most people are really equipped to have that conversation, but yeah, of course, because who knows these. Who knows what these models are saying right. or doing? Yeah. And actually, I mean, you know, the, the Born Lumberg position, at least the way that you're describing, because I remember his book, 
is kind of like the perfect position slash dodge <laughs> to like get around the fact that the facts of the climate could be too complicated because you're like, well, none of that actually matters. What actually matters is if he, you know, if he's just saying, if you look at the results of the policies, they're not really going to affect the climate, what, you know, in any positive way. So it's better to just kind of keep boosting the economy and, you know, and, and putting our eggs in the basket of technology. Right. Yeah. He advocates for spending, I think, 10 times what we're spending now on potential technological breakthroughs. He's like, we need right. a NASA style program for green technology. Right. But it's just our political environment sucks for that because the conservative Republican narrative is, you know, government can do nothing right. And just look in the, in the business community. I, I understand the difference too, obviously in the, in the private sector, you're using, you know, they're using their own money. They're not using the taxpayer's money. So it hurts worse in the public sector when you see waste of any kind, but just waste in business is considered, you know, normal, right? The so Hollywood makes 20 movies and 19 of them tank. And one of them makes enough movies to make the whole operation profitable, like mm -hmm. uh, venture capitalists. They do this all the time, right? They, they, they go invest in a hundred businesses and two of those businesses make enough money. You know, they're the next Apple or Amazon. So that's the kind of thinking that we need to have in the, in the private sec, in the public sector. It's just, it's not, it's just not feasible because it, then some politician can come along and point to the 98 failures and say government sucks and no one should pay any taxes. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Cause like the way, the closest that we've got to now is, you know, the government has, you know, under Obama and other Democrat presidents has they didn't create like a NASA type program to sort of, you know, create green technologies. They would end up investing in a private company, right? Like Solyndra or some yeah, other private company. Just and like, like venture capitalists do. Right. Exactly. Which is kind of a stupid approach as opposed to trying to do a NASA style thing where it's like, no, 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 like the government is going to kind of create this technology um, for, you know, from like a NASA perspective for a not for profit perspective. Now, I don't know enough about. Oh, I the, see what well, you're saying. So like, it's like all in house. So all the failure, the 98 failures are in the same company. Yeah. It's all so it, just within, perceptively. It looks better. Right now. I don't know. Cause like, and it is interesting because with NASA, I mean, there's, they had so much failure with the rockets before they had success. Of course. And if yeah. it was, and if it was a different political climate, you definitely could have had people saying, Oh my God, this is a huge waste of money. You know, They've had, you know, all these various rockets explode, people die, we wasted all this money and resource and all these rockets, blah, 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 the government can't do anything right. And then eventually, until the government does do something right, we, you know, have the technology that NASA ends up creating that works. And so maybe that would be the way to, to do it, is to do it more, you know, entirely in-house as opposed to just trying to do this sort of like government subsidizing private companies situation because they because then they have completely different um goals and mo like a private company obviously has very different goals and motivations than a, a government institution does right so yeah. if you wanted to spend that money right i just want the technology i don't want to i want it to be free i don't want to well, spend yeah, any sure. money on anything sure but then obviously yeah. the part of the problem is like you know the, getting the government would have to attract the people to make the technology in the first place you know i, I understand why there's side of a kind of an ease of use of having the government invest in private companies versus just trying to do things in house. But yeah, I'm just joking anyway. So I don't know. Is it because it depends? The scientific answer to that question depends precisely on the time frame over which you evaluate the climate fluctuation. And that's actually an intractable scientific problem. So you might say, well, if you take the last hundred years, this variation looks pretty dismal. And I'd say, well, what if, what if you took the last 150,000 years or yeah, the last 10,000 or the last 10 million? You can't specify the no, damn no, time no, no, frame no. of That's analysis. The, the time frame is incredibly important. That would be like saying, look at your, you know, uh, let's say somebody developed cancer and they didn't realize it. And the person has lost, you know, 40 or 50 pounds in, in the past six months. And I'm just like, you, you look very sickly. And you're like, okay, well, look at my weight fluctuation over the past 10 years. You say, like, well, it doesn't really matter. What matters I'm not is the fact saying that the, the time frame months. isn't important. Well, but I'm, I'm saying, saying that, like, that the, it is important. Yeah, I'm but just no, no. saying I don't know how to specify it. Well, you would probably specify it with the beginning of the industrial age, right? Why? Like, because when that's when carbon dioxide, which is a gas 
justice and is trapping uh, more heat on the Why planet. Why is that begins relevant to, uh, to the time over which you compute the variability? Because it seems like as carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere, the surface temperatures have risen at a rate that is a departure from what we'd expect over 150,000 year cycles of temperature variations on no, the planet. No, not with that time frame. That's absolutely. just not the case. It's absolutely the case. No, what do you mean? You just flip to a 150,000 year time span. What I'm so, saying is that if, if we expect to see a temperature do this in a 150,000 year time span, in a 100 year time span, seeing it do this, that's very worrying. Now, you mean it could like be the Michael case. Mann's hockey stick, the one that's under attack right now in court by a major statistician who claimed that he falsified his data. I mean, that spike? The, I'm talking about the record temperatures that are declared, that have been declared for like the past five years that have also increased with the, uh, with the concentration of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every model is perfect. They're but not right perfect. now, sure. But right now we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed saying the car hasn't hit me yet. So I don't think there's any coming. I think it's pretty undeniable. This is so two different realities, isn't it? Don't they talk about that later? The two different reality situation? Yes. Yeah. He's going, look, I'm just because I don't see the car doesn't mean it's there. And Jordan's like, what car? There's no <laughs> car. I at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, just I don't think know that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the ocean. See, this is where Jordan, I knew this was going to get clipped because this is where Jordan loses it. And this is not born like he's no longer in the born lombard camp because born lombard is like this is where the carbon's coming from yes it's man-made this is where it's coming from industry obviously mm -hmm. didn't he just say we don't know where it's coming from that's what he said yeah jordan <laughs> what happened here oceans we have terrible temperature records going back 100 years almost all the terrestrial temperature uh uh, uh, detection sites were first put outside urban areas, and then as and then the, right, and then you have to warm. correct. Then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas, and then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. So how come Aztecs weren't measuring the carbon footprint? Well, okay, I mean that's not what he's. I don't think that's what he's saying. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Look, I'm just having, trying to have some fun I know, here. Yeah, Sitch, I know, yeah, jeez. I Listen, I'm trying, trying to. to <laughs> I'm buzz killing. Okay. Good faith. Yeah, totally. Over here. You are. What's going on here? Uh, terrible. Sitch. We're trying to have fun. This is. I know. This climate stuff is boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I, look, I know it's especially boring for conservatives because they don't they don't encounter these climate. They don't talk about this. I never see articles about climate change in conservative media unless it's just to say, oh, it's all fake and all totally not real, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But in progressive media, all you see is climate change stuff about how it's just insanely going to destroy the planet. Look, AOC, man, climate change is real. We got 10 years, buddy. Mm -hmm. This isn't data. This is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It's weird, Sitch. <laughs> I can't look, Sitch. Then he goes into like the, it's like the metaphysical demons and shit. Uh, Sitch, okay, I look. Good faith, Gary, this for me, Sitch. Well, What's he talking part, about here? The part where Jordan loses me, uh, which is where he kind of goes into here, is that, you know, I don't think there's a conspiracy regarding climate change. Like, even if it turns out that all the climate change people are wrong and all the models are wrong, I, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's just people making mistakes. Oh, of course. And, you know, operating based on what they think to be is true. I don't think there's some sort of widespread global conspiracy to kind of trick everyone to, to believe in climate change. Well, I, I think obviously the Democratic Party wants to drive people to the polls to vote because the apocalypse is going to come if the Republicans get in charge and ignore climate change. That's like right, the but argument. It's not, it's not a conspiracy. Like, okay, so the way that a lot of, so the way that unfortunately the, the human mind works is that you generally, most people are not sitting there just lying to their audience, lying to constituents in such a way that like they know what is true and they're just like saying things to get votes 
in like a kind of very cold, cynical perspective, even though I think a lot of politicians are cynical, but in terms of these like philosophical questions or these sort of like, like climate change specifically, people lie to themselves first before they lie to anyone else. And so since it is a very complicated issue, since it is an issue based in science and the average person, the average politician can't really understand what is true about climate change and they have to rely on experts, quote, experts, or they have to rely on institutions, or they have to rely on like their institution, their intuitions, and what direction they're going to put it in. It makes sense that people on the left who are pushing these sorts of um, initiatives, they honestly believe climate change is real because it matches perfectly with their intuitions. It matches perfectly with their team's tribal identity and their tribal argument. Like There wouldn't really be a reason or a belief to think that the left and the Democrat politicians like secretly all know that climate change is bullshit, but they're just trying to use this as like a an issue to win elections. When, I mean, it's not even people aren't really voting on the environment anyway. It's not even like a big get, right? No, it is. I looked it up, and the, one of the number one policies for progressives is climate change. Yeah, but when you look at so when you ask people like what's important, you know, they say the environment, right? But when you ask people who they're voting for, when you look at where people are voting, especially the swing voters or the people that you need to get to vote, to come out, to vote for you. It's not people voting for climate change. That's never one of the big issues. It, it is. I actually looked it up recently. I looked it up in polling because I, I was like, I, you know, I've been listening to Young Turks lately and Young Turks mm -hmm. does a lot of climate change stories. And I was thinking, I never see climate change stories in anywhere else <laughs> on the Young Turks. And I was like, why? Why are they doing all these climate change stories? And I looked at the polling data on issues, and sure enough, climate change is like number one or number two for progressives. So, like, it might be different now because Israel Palestine became a thing, right? So they're like on to something new, but it was climate change. And I was like, wow, they're really motivated by this climate change stuff. They should read Born Longberg so they can get a good night's sleep, right? Well, okay, but we're, we're talking about, okay, we're, well, first of all, we're talking about two different things. Because I was talking about the people, the swing voters, people you need to get out to vote who are not going to basically vote blue no matter who anyway, number one. Mm -hmm. Those people aren't motivated by climate change, you know, number one. Number two, the progressives, yeah, the progressives are motivated by climate change, obviously. They're motivated, you know, that's, I'm sure that's one of the big issues. But the reason that, they, that, that climate change became an issue in the first place, it's not like, it's not like there was a conspiracy where some left people sat around in a meeting and said, okay, how are we going to get people on the left to vote for us? I know. Let's concoct the conspiracy theory that the climate is doomed. Of course like, not. Why would you of even think not. that that would be like an issue that would get voters to come out? Of course first not. Place, but right? but as, as, as you get more and more data that maybe the climate is not so doomed, that it becomes there becomes diminishing returns on sharing that data, right? So you kind of get right, but, into but, this cultural loop where, you know, bad things are, are examined and signal boosted and good things are just ignored. Right. But if you look at where that starts, a lot of it starts from the experts and scientists themselves. And I've seen lots of people, a lot of reports claim that like if you go into any of these journals and you try to write a lot of scientific articles that are sort of skeptical of climate change you get all this pushback yeah from these various example from yeah from these various communities and so my point is that like if all these institutions okay let's just say hypothetically let's assume that the climate uh stuff is overblown it's either not true or it's true but it's true in a more mild way but everyone thinks it's true and so the institutions have basically been captured into thinking it's true. And so people feel both a moral duty to push back against climate skepticism, but also just like whenever there's a quote scientific consensus, there's always going to be a level of pushback, you know, in, in that regard. And so, so if, if all these institutions, scientific institutions are basically beholden to this idea, like what are the chances that the politicians are going to somehow have access to like this higher level understanding and knowledge to know that the climate change stuff is not true and that the government is going to somehow have access and knowledge to know that the climate change stuff isn't true either.
But that's I don't, my only point. I don't even think they care if it is true or isn't care isn't true. I don't think they care. I th I think they it's they convince themselves that it's true because it makes them feel just and moral. And I think that's kind of the way that ninety nine percent of these people are operating, regardless of whether it is true or not. Right. Yes. So okay, I don't know. So you, you think that? Well, I wish I could find the date on it because it's it was it was the most stark thing. It was like the Republicans, like climate change for them is like non-existent. It's not even on their radar as an issue. Obviously, it's like inflation, the economy, <laughs> and progressives were like climate change. No, I racism. know. I, I know that they I've seen those polls I know right. that that score's high but then when you see like the actual things that people come out and vote for and how it affects the polls you just don't see people vote you know people are not voting based on climate change I just don't believe that that's okay. ever true if, if that was true then Biden would be you know be an issue in to be president right right <laughs> if, if people were really concerned I mean, he, about climate Biden change Biden talks about climate change yeah but does it seem it's not really going to help him I don't think it doesn't seem like it's helping him I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I said, look, I was going more on what the voters are, are responding to, but look, we right. can move on. It's, I got your point. You got my point. It has this yeah. guise of compassion. Oh, we're going to save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. You know, I watched over the course of the last five years the estimates of the number of people who were in serious danger. I, I don't think this is a good way to conceptualize it because I think it, at the end of the day, it does. It, what matters is if it's true or not. I know. If it's I know. if it's true, then you do need to have your government and you know, I'll be making plans in order to get around it if if the private industry doesn't want to deal with it. If it's not true, then yeah, obviously having a top down approach is going to create more harm than good. I mean, that's I, I think that's really the where the rubber meets the road is well, is it true or is it not true? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think you can make a blanket statement that like governments can't make long-term plans about potential uh perceived harms that are coming in the future i mean i think that's part of the role of what the government is supposed to do yeah the truth factor is so important i mean if you look at it in terms of the immigration crisis that's going on right now you've got a lot of the left-leaning democrats trying to basically say oh yeah it's just none of this is really happening the republicans are just using it to scare people right well the republicans are using it to scare people but it's true it's happening right well it's kind of it's kind of interesting i never thought about it till you said just now but it's like you can kind of say that like you know the immigration issue is like right-wing climate change in terms of it's like there's things that are happening now and there's this fear of like harm in the future and how that's going to materialize and the left is ignoring it or thinks it's not a big deal. And that's the same thing with light, with climate change. You know, there's things that are happening right now with, you know, the hottest records, you know, coming for the past couple of years, giant hurricanes. And, but the pr prediction of further harm or greater harm in the future. And then the right's kind of ignoring it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way this also goes to the kind of the death of experts is because everyone worships their experts and the other people their other side's experts are just yeah obviously corrupt shills out for the right. money so danger of food privation rise from about 100 million to about 350 million that's a major price to pay for a little bit of what what would you say for for progress on the climate front that's so narrow it can't even be measured i don't for think they increase in, in uh oh well, hello everyone Oh. Hello, everyone. 
I'm what pleased. Do you do? Oh my God. What happened? I fucked up. I clicked oh. on the wrong thing. Where were we? How dare you? I can't believe you did that. I totally messed up. The heck? I think it's totally possible that somebody might say, okay, well, when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it seems to cause. Were, am I close? I don't even know. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying, I have to open up the stream. Figure it out. Help us out, guys. What was the, what was the time like, code that we were just at? I don't know. <laughs> but this is a good wake up call. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's like, boomer, boomer. Yeah. Yeah, my bad, guys. This climate change stuff really gets under your skin. I just think it's, I, I just think it's boring because it's like, again, I think it's just so, so reliant on this information that I don't think, I don't trust any source of information to, to basically figure out what's actually going on. Right. Jordan's argument kind of becomes this is utopianism we can't we can't indulge it because it's utopianism but right I, I, don't, I don't think that's a good argument yeah i don't think i think that's the worst argument yet so thank you chat chess uh oh, got us did. the time codes nice i knew sooner or later one of them was going to come in and save save me 100 million to about 350 million that's a major price to pay for a little bit of what what would you say for for progress on the climate front that's so narrow it can't even be measured i don't think the increase in in hungry people on the in the planet is because of climate policies why not think, because because i don't think that countries in africa are being pushed away from fossil fuels i think most developing of course nations, they are right? they can't even get they can't even get loans from the world bank to produce for per, pursue fossil fuel development and there's do you remember the video we covered where the it was i think it was the imf went in and they made the government shift over to all organic farming and it completely eviscerated their agricultural exports um was it, was it yeah, sri lanka yeah what was yeah that was, what was totally the deal with insane. that i don't remember what was the deal with that yeah but that was all climate ch change driven so yeah look, well, no I wasn't it it, I'm trying to remember. Was it the IMF, or wasn't there some internal reason, like of corruption, of why they were doing it? It wasn't an external pressure dictating it. I, I don't remember. And like the environmentalism was just an excuse. That seems to be my vague recollection of what was going on there. It could be. I don't remember exactly, but but look, they were using climate change as the excuse for switching. Yeah, over to that all, was the excuse. Yeah. So just climate change being there as an excuse is kind of right. can be dangerous. But look, Destiny hasn't heard of that story. So there's plenty of African leaders who are screeching at the top of their lungs about that because the elites in the West have decided that, well, it was okay for us to use fossil fuel for so that we wouldn't have to starve to death and our children had some opportunities. But maybe the starving masses that are too large a load for the world anyways shouldn't have that opportunity. And that's, that's direct policy from the UN fostered by organizations like the w, WEF. They're going to have to turn to renewables. Yeah, well, good luck with that because renewables have no energy density. Besides that, they're not renewable and they're not environmentally friendly. And then one you, more thing. There's yeah, one sure. more weird thing underneath all of this. Okay. Well, let's say if carbon dioxide was actually your bugbear and it was genuine. Well, then why wouldn't the Greens, for example, in Africa, the progressives, be agitating to expand the use of nuclear nuclear energy, especially because Germany has to import it anyways, especially because France has demonstrated that it's possible. We could drive down the cost of energy with low cost nuclear and there'd be no carbon production. And then the poor people would have something to eat because they'd have enough energy. And that isn't what's happening. And that's one of the things that makes me extremely skeptical of the entire narrative. It's like two things. The left will sacrifice the poor to save the planet. And the left will deindustrialize even at the nuclear level, despite the fact that it devastates the poor. And that's even worse because if you devastate the poor and you force them into a short term orientation in any given country where starvation beckons, for example, they will cut down all the trees and they will kill down all the animals and they will destroy the ecosphere. And so 
even by the standards of the people who are pushing the carbon dioxide externality control, all the consequences of that doctrine appear to me be, to be devastating even by their own measurement principles. We're trying to fix the environment. Well, boys and girls, doesn't look like it's working. All you've managed to do is make energy five times as expensive and more polluting. You were wrong. That didn't work. And so, and I can't understand. You can help me. That's why you're here today talking to me. Okay, I can't so understand okay. how the left can sure. support this. Just one quick thing. I did find it as Sri Lanka. I'm so on it. It's so badass. I can't believe I hey, well, yeah, it was Sri Lanka. Like, yeah. Yeah. Crisis in Sri, Sri Lanka. Yeah. Farming disaster in Sri Lanka. So that's it if anyone wants to look into it. Let's say that everything you've said is true. What do you think is the plan then? What is the goal? What is the drive? Like why push, why push obviously horrible ideas for the planet and the poor? That's a good question. That's well, a good question. Well, because you're positive it, right? So what, what do you think is the driver goal? Well, I listen to what people say. Here's the most terrible thing they say. There are too many people on the planet. Okay, so who says... Sit, you've got to be loving this. <laughs> you've no, got to be loving this. I don't like this. Why not? Yeah, I don't like this. Look, there are too many people on the planet. They want to narrow down the population. Mm. That's why these people are pushing clim these climate policies. I don't think... So there's been like this widespread conspiracy about the elites want to depopulate the planet for a long right. time. And I kind of understand like, like that conspiracy coming to fruition, you know, I don't know, 40 years ago when... Like there was this people that were worried about like overpopulation of the planet. But now it seems very clear that everyone, including all the elites, understand that you need more, like as I said, modern economies work on growing populations. And so it like it doesn't make sense that the quote elites would want to depopulate the planet at this point. Because yeah. they would end up just screwing them over. And then even under the like the conspiracy idea, like, well, they don't care because they're going to have robots do everything. It's like, well, OK, you, you, they still need to have like the quote elites are able to maintain their power by selling things to people, right? By making yeah. money. You know, you can't sell things to robots, right? You still need the masses to buy your shit, even if you have robots to do all the physical labor. Yeah, yeah. You have people that are the consumers, you would think, right? Yeah. So I, I don't buy these depopulation uh, conspiracies. But. Right. I don't either. Is that? I've heard people say that for 30 years. Perfectly ordinary, compassionate people. Well, there's too many people on the planet. And I think, well, for me, that's like hearing Satan himself take possession of their spine and, and move their mouth. It's like, okay, who are these excess people that you're so concerned about? And exactly who has to go and when and why and how and who's going to make that decision and even if you don't even if you're not consciously aiming at that you are the one who uttered the words you're the ones who muttered the phrase what makes you think that the thing that possessed you to make you utter that words isn't aiming at exactly what you just declared and so that's you know that's a terrible vision but when you look at what happens in genocidal societies and they emerge fairly with fair regularity, and usually with a utopian vision at hand. The consequence is the mass destruction of millions of people. So why should I assume that something horrible isn't lurking like that right now? Especially given that we have pushed a few hundred million of people back into absolute poverty when we were doing a pretty damn good job of getting rid of that. And I just don't understand what's happening in Germany or in the UK. Like, it's insane. Like, look, man, if they would have got rid of the nuclear plants and made energy five times as expensive, and the consequence would have been they weren't burning lignite coal as a backup, and their unit production of energy, of pollution per unit of energy had plummeted, you could say, well, look, you know, we hurt a lot of poor people, but at least the air is cleaner. It's like, no, nope, air's worse, and everyone's poorer. So, like, the... Explain to me how the hell the left can be anti-nuclear. Okay. I don't understand it at all. Gotcha. All right. Um, this is something that I brought up earlier that is concerning to me. 
Um, <clears throat> I feel like when people get political beliefs, I feel like what happens is, what we think happens, what we would hope happen, is you have some moral or philosophical underpinning, and then from there, you combine this with some epistemic understanding of the world, and then you combine these two things, you engage in some form of analysis, and yeah. your moral It'd be view, nice if that was you, true. Yeah, you start to apply like prescriptions. So yeah. maybe I'm religious, maybe I analyze society, and I see that uh, particular TV shows lead to premarital sex, so my societal prescription is we should ban these TV shows, right? Ideally, this is how you would imagine this process works. What I find happens, unfortunately, all too often is what people do is they join social groups. And then with those social groups, they inherit something that I call like a constellation of beliefs. And this constellation of beliefs, instead of rationally building on each of these, you basically get this like Jenga tower that is like floating over a table and every block is like supporting itself and no real part of the tower can be addressed because you pull out one piece it all falls apart. Right. So people become like very stuck in all of this combined constellation stuff and none of it is really given like any analysis and you can't really push anybody from, from one way or another uh, in, in terms of like reevaluating any of the beliefs that are part of this constellation. Um, I wish I would have. Is climate change part of that constellation, Sitch? Definitely. I yeah. think it is. A hundred percent, yeah. That's I really good. Would come, well, yep. That's fine. I wish That's I would right. Have... Oh, yeah. I love this part. <laughs> Beam. <laughs> okay. Sleep is the foundation of your health. I mean, there you go. It's not untrue, right? Oh, yeah. That's good. Come, well, yep. That's fine. I wish That's I right. Well, I, yeah. you know there are models now of sure. There are models now of Carson oh, for forty percent off. Right. I think yeah. we missed a little bit here. That's good. Come, well, yep. That's fine. I wish That's I right. Well, I, yeah. you know there are models now of sure. There are models now of cognitive processing, belief, belief system processing that make the technical claim that what a belief system does is constrain entropy. This. Look, I, I accept this constellation of beliefs type thing. I would categorize it kind of as group thinking. It's people are kind of peer pressured into having certain beliefs, true or not, to be part of some kind of social system. So what I, what I don't like is that destiny has been using this constellation of beliefs thing to kind of assume that people have certain beliefs because he sees that they have one belief. So he assumes, you know, since someone is in favor of the status quo narrative on climate change, they support the idea that Kyle Rittenhouse is a murderer who went to Kenosha to raise hell and start well, chaos. I mean, yeah. yeah it, well, it's one of those like, you shouldn't you, you shouldn't make assumptions based on if you're talking to an individual you shouldn't necessarily make those assumptions even if there's predictive power to them um yeah I, that's that's the problem that i have with right but it's true like right but i think it is true overall from non individuals perspective that generally people on the left and the right do follow fall into these constellation of belief uh groupings generally yeah i just i don't know how much I don't know how much power this idea has other than to talk about people being peer pressured into believing things that are, aren't necessarily true based on no evidence because they're embedded in some sort of political tribe. I don't think you can, because you have to look at individuals. I don't think it's a useful metric to go out and start saying, Oh, because I know this person supports, you know, believes well, in climate change. I know everything about them. Right. I, I don't yeah. know. Well, it depends what the, I think it is a useful concept. It depends what the point of the concept is. Like, I think it'd be a useful concept in sort of understanding, sort of saying, okay, like we, you know, we all need to, from the most high minded perspective to say like, we need to all uh, be careful not to fall into the various flavors of tribalism, AKA constellate constellation of belief uh, patterns of thinking. We all need to go out of our way to sort of, uh, police our own intuitions, our own thoughts, our own political beliefs to make sure we're not falling into those categories. That'd be like the most high-minded way of doing it. Now, a more, you know, uh, maybe low way of doing it, which we you know we're definitely guilty of doing this too, is that when we attack people, you know, you can accuse them of just basically becoming tribal simps 
or just becoming, you know, falling prey to the the team politics, which I definitely think happens very often. So, yeah, I agree. Sure, that's not okay. surprising at all. Okay, to me. yeah. So, and now, now the signal for for released entropy, which would be a consequence of say violated fundamental beliefs, uh -huh. is a radical increase in anxiety, right, and a decrease in the possibility of positive emotion. And so people will struggle very hard against that, which is exactly the phenomena that you're describing. Yeah. Okay. I agree with what you said. Although, so here's here's my yeah. So I'm issue not sure why it's relevant to what, the issue I was. I'm getting. Pursuing. I'm getting. Okay. I'm getting, fine. Yeah. 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 Here's here's my issue. Okay. So <clears throat> when I'm trying to evaluate a situation, I like to think that I have some. Uh, I've got some insulation from the effects of what liberals think or what conservatives think, is because on my platform, I don't necessarily have an allegiance to a particular political ideology. Like right now, I'm like center left to progressive, but I break really hard from progressive on certain issues. I think Kyle Rittenhouse is in the right. I think basically everything you guys are doing with indigenous people is insane, uh, including the complete mass grave hoax. Uh, I think that uh, I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, I have beliefs where I can break from my side, you know, pretty hardcore because I am not like allegiant to certain political ideology. One thing that worries me with this constellation of beliefs thing is that- But if anyone else does that, they're a secret right winger, of course. Just keep that in mind, Sage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when it comes to evaluating a particular policy or a particular problem, I feel like it's part of the constellation and sometimes it inhibits people from like taking a step back and reasonably thinking about the issue. So when we're talking about climate change, you mentioned the WEF sacrificing tons of people, the UN, global elites, uh, five times energy costs in Germany, uh, genocidal people. I feel like th this is part of like a whole thing where it's like, okay, well, let's take a quick step back and let's just like think rationally about this particular issue for one moment. Okay. Well, you asked me what the motivation for anti-poor policies might be. So that's why I was trying to Well, I to did, but, that th but I got all of those things before I even asked that question. Um, because I think it's totally possible that somebody might say, okay, well, when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it seems to cause an increase in surface temperatures. This has been happening from about the 1800s. And as we started to track surface temperatures, whether the thermometer is on top of the Empire State Building or in the middle of the field, it seems like there's an average rise in temperatures. And people all around the world are observing this in some places more than others. If you live in Seattle and 20 years ago, your apartment building wasn't built with air conditioner units, you feel that now. If you live in a place in London and you've never had an air conditioner before, now that's not acceptable. I think that people on the ground can see that there are changes. And I think that scientists, when they look in labs, can see changes. It might be that some models aren't precise enough, and it might be that for reasons we don't even understand. Well, the now, economic models they, certainly aren't precise enough. Sure, maybe, maybe that Not might be maybe. true. Maybe they can't even use them to predict the price of a single stock for six <laughs> months. The economic models are not sufficiently accurate to calculate out the consequences of climate change over a century. Uh, and not in the when least. You, when you, I, I like the comparison because economic models can't predict individual stocks, but they do predict the rough rise of the market. If you invest in the S&P yeah, 500, the you get about... the cataclysmic collapse. Nope. Even with the cataclysmic collapse accounted for, you're going to see about 7% returns on average with inflation okay. over long periods of time. I wouldn't call an average a very sophisticated model analogous that's to fine, a climate change. That's the difference between climate and weather though, right? Is that climate isn't going to tell you what the temperature is on a given day, but it might tell you the average surface temperature over a period of one year or 10 years. And then that's the difference between climate and weather. That's, well, that's between, the like, the market and stuff. difference. It is a hypothetical, but again, we're seeing more and more and more data every okay, single well, year. Okay, that things so are getting can we use that to, if we're just averaging out the, the weather all over the planet, can we make it like 10,000 degrees some places and 10,000 degrees below zero other places. So it's like hospital, hospitable in no place, but appears to be hospitable over the whole planet. I mean, you could, that is one of the, that would the, be a good model claims, to use. Right? Yeah. That obviously would be one of the claims is, you know, that you can use the numbers and properly to create these sorts of situations theoretically. Right. Yeah. yeah. I just want to get rid of winter, Sitch. I winter really <laughs> bums me out. Okay, really doesn't. We, it? Yeah. yeah, I don't uh -huh. think we need. Yeah, what's all this rain? What do you mean about? you live in you live in California? I know okay, there is no we, winter where you live. What are you talking we've about? We've done our best. We've done our best to eliminate it, but it still lingers a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look, we have we have fans that live where it snows. You know what I'm talking about. I think, listen, I think instead of eliminating winter, I think it's better if people want winter to be gone to move to a place where winter is not a thing. Okay. There's plenty of people in the Midwest that are like, why can't summer move to me? Right? The <laughs> they want climate go. change. They want it to be a little bit warmer. They're like, you based. Right. I like milder right. winters. Mm -hmm. 
this is why climate change is a tough topic because there is a bunch of winners and losers, right? Mm -hmm. You live on some island with a rising ocean. Oh, you're fucked. <laughs> you're totally fucked. But you got a nice place that's the right distance from the beach. You could have beachfront property. Listen, as in Florida, I feel like I'd be on the fuck side if it's true. So I'm more uh <laughs> Right. Yeah. Look, this is this is why the COVID is so difficult for me because I get it. Like a lot of people totally got fucked by COVID. But I mean, COVID mm -hmm. was pretty good for me. <laughs> I mean, it really was. I mm -hmm. you know, it was nice to be able to not, you know, have an excuse to stay home. The Los Angeles freeways were, I mean, they were downright nice. There was nobody <laughs> on them, right? There you go. There Everyone you go. was staying home watching YouTube. I mean, our chant, our, our show was growing. I mean, COVID worked out well for us. So it's mm -hmm. hard for me to be critical of COVID just because I have that bias. But right. look, if COVID killed your mom and dad, you're going to have a completely different perspective. Yeah. Hotter, let's hotter, let's, so jump, I mean, let's yeah. jump out of our cloud of mm -hmm. presuppositions for a minute. Sure. Now, one of the things that... Or no, wait. I, 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 oh, yeah. Okay. Before we do that, actually, yeah, because okay. I don't want to say, yeah, there, are, there are some things that we've gotten as a result of investing in green energy that have been good. So, for instance, uh, the power of solar energy has dropped dramatically in the United States, faster than anybody thought possible, such that... Uh, uh, solar energy is like competitive or beating fossil fuels in certain areas. If as long as you can set the solar panels up, you're literally beating yeah, fossil fuels. Yeah, and as long as the sun is shining. Well, it's. I mean, it still is. But we're not a nuclear winter no, yet. No, no, so. but it isn't when it's cloudy. And it that's why I said depending on where you live. There are places, right. equatorial places. If you're trying, this is this is where I'm like, Jordan, no, stop, please, stop, <laughs> stop. You've had Lomberg on your show twice. I assume you read his book. Like he talks about this. Mm -hmm. Ah. No. I set up a solar panel in uh in Seattle. You know, you might not have as much luck, or in New York City, or might not have as much, uh, or in Germany. True. Or um, all there of are also, Europe, I think, or there, in Canada. There are also look. So we should just not do solar. <laughs> it's like so, it's such a ridiculous argument. Uh stop, Jordan. Please stop. Other issues <laughs> that are coming up that I think are obfuscating our ability to evaluate what's being caused by green energy there versus not. When we look at energy increases in Germany, um, I think there's a similar constellation around nuclear energy, for instance. People don't want nuclear energy because they think of nukes, and they think of nuclear meltdowns, and they think of Chernobyl, and they think of Fukushima, and they think of atomic bombs, and that's it, and that's stupid. And I agree with you, but nuclear energy is a totally viable alternative to other forms of Then why fuels. does the radical left oppose it? You think it's just this map? See, you... For the, same, for, the just... same, for the same reason the, the right opposes vaccines, because it sounds scary and it's a big thing and they don't trust it it comes well the right promises. has a reason to distrust vaccines in the aftermath of the covid de debacle <clears throat> well because they were imposed by force and that was a you, very you, you get to idea. choose if you have a nuclear power plant that's imposed by force too no you don't get to choose where your energy comes from if you live in a country you just you turn the light switch and hopefully you don't have a chernobyl that melts down in your particular town right okay since so you have to pay particular attention here well, I've, I've been being yeah. accused that people in the chat have been accusing me of straw manning this argument that Jordan Peterson is making about the force thing. Mm -hmm. So, was this the I thought I thought it comes later. I don't remember. No, this is where they start talking about the force. Okay. So, I mean, I, I understand that force, right? I understand, um, Destiny's point here that it's like, yeah, you don't choose, you know, generally, you don't choose. Like whether you live next to a nuclear power plant or whatever, I mean, you can move, right? I mean, you could say the same thing like, well, if your city enacts a vaccine mandate, you can move, right? Like you could say the same argument. Um, in I, that that's regard. not a good argument, though. Right. I don't think it's a good argument. But I, so I, I kind of understand the point Destiny's, Destiny's making, but I do feel like there is a distinction, there's a difference between being forced to like live in the proximity of a nuclear power plant or live in the proxy, like, you know, live in a city that uses like, uh, you know, uh, coal or oil versus like, you know, solar or something. I feel like that's different than like saying you have to inject something into your body, like specifically. These feel like different things, right? Different levels of force on, even if it's similar, it definitely feels different to me intuitively. Right. Yeah. I'm just the, the disagreement I have is that Jordan seems to be making the argument that our society is very much consensual. And 
I just, I don't see how you can look at taxes and uh, think that. Taxes he, he, are force. I mean, Jordan definitely makes the argument at one point in the conversation um, about this, which I think to me is a, is a mistake or just kind of like sucked into the moment. I don't think it's something that he would say normally. Yeah. So, I mean... Look, I mean, it is what it is. Well, you get to choose I, it because you can buy it or not. Well, That's I mean, a choice. It does, but it, the nobody negative, had a choice with the vaccines. Nobody had a choice whether or not they lived near Chernobyl or not. Nobody's a choice. Sure, they There's can, a nuclear they can move power plant. Away. Well, how realistic well, is it to choice. move like 500 miles? That's like telling conservatives when uh, Biden tried to do okay, the OSHA well, mandate for vaccines, look, like, well, you can just get a different job, I'm right? Not, I don't want to debate about whether or not large nuclear power plants are mm -hmm. frightening. They are. Sure. The argument here that's usually made is these places that live, you know, these homes that are close to nuclear power plants and like dangerous, polluted areas usually are less expensive because of that and therefore are inhabited by poor people who are willing to live there just because it's economically affordable at the expense of their health, so. Okay. And there mm -hmm. are technologies now where that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and I think, I don't, I think that's I a counterproductive place for good, our okay. discussion to go because mm -hmm. I also understand why people are afraid of it. But what I don't understand, for example, is why the Germans shut down their nuclear power plants and the Californians are thinking and have doing the same thing when they have to import power from France anyways. Like it's complete- Or bloody. burn coal, which is a million well, times worse. Not yeah. just coal, mm -hmm. lignite. Yeah. Right, and then with regards to these renewable power sources, they have a very, they have a number of problems. One is they're not, ener they're not energy dense. They require a tremendous infrastructure to produce. They're, they might be renewable at the energy level, but they're not renewable at the raw materials level. So that's a complete bloody lie. They're insanely variable in their power production. And because of that, you have to have a backup system and the backup system has to be reliable without variability. And that means if you have a renewable grid, you have to have a parallel fossil fuel or coal grid to back it up when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, which is unfortunately very, very frequently. And so again, and so and I'm not- I mean, you can have a reservoir. And just pump water up to uphill while the sun is shining and run it downhill while it's dark or overcast and run a turbine and create electricity that way you don't need to burn coal totally clean system sitch look i've solved mm -hmm. all your problems okay well, of course you have to live in a place where you can have a reservoir up in some mountain sure, top, right sure yeah those are tend to be more difficult to build so not going to say there's no place for renewable energy like solar and wind because maybe there are specific niche locales where those are useful but the logical uh what would you say antidote to the problem of reliability if we're concerned about carbon but we're really not would be to use nuclear and the greens haven't been like flying their bloody flags for 30 years saying well we could use fossil fuels for fertilizer and feed people, and we could use nuclear power to drive energy costs down in a carbon dioxide free manner. That seems pretty bloody self-evident to me. And so then it brings up this other mystery that we were talking about earlier. You know, what's the impetus behind all this? Because the cover story is, oh, we care about carbon dioxide, which I don't think they do, especially given the willingness to sacrifice the poor. It makes no sense to me. And I think it's relevant to the issue you brought up, which is that people have these constellations of ideas and there's a driving force in the midst of them, so to speak. They're not necessarily aware of what that driving force is. Don't we, isn't it more likely that people are either misinformed or misguided than people are legitimately trying to depopulate the planet? I'm, look, misinformed and ignorant, that's, pl that's plenty relevant and worth considering. And stupidity is always a better explanation than malevolence. But malevolence is also an explanation. And no, I don't think it's a better explanation because- Why would we waste so much money sending food aid, having Bush do uh, you know, programs through Africa for AIDS, having other billionaires like Bill Gates invest so much money in anti-malarial stuff? Like, Why would all the global elites be so invested in helping and killing the people here at the same time? Well, some, so okay. well some of it's confusion. Okay. You know, and some of it's the fact, you know, many things can be happening simultaneously with a fair bit of internal paradox because people just don't know which way is up often. But the problem with the argument, okay, so 
So you you tell me what you think about this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Hitler's cover story was that he wanted to make the glorious Third Reich and elevate the Germans to the highest possible status for the longest possible period of time. Okay, but that wasn't the outcome. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin while Europe was in flames. Well, he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames and wasn't that a catastrophe? Or you could say that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning because he was brutally resentful and miserable right from the time he was, you know, a rejected artist at the age of 16. And so he was working or something was working within him and something that might well be regarded as demonic whose end goal was precisely what it attained, which was the devastation of hundreds of millions of people and Europe left in a smoking ruin. And the cover story was the Grand Third Reich. And so there's no reason at all to assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think that's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess that he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that secret, his Aryan supremacy secret, was going to lead to the destruction and the murder of like so many different people in concentration camps. Like, none of this was a secret. It's not like he was hiding it. Um, he hid a lot of I mean, like, he, well, he tried to all, maybe hide the death camps, but nobody in Germany was wondering, like, wow, crazy the pogroms are happening as Jewish people. That's so crazy. Or, wow, they're all being shipped to just mainly the Jews to camps to work. Like, that's kind of interesting. Or, wow, he talks about this a lot in Mein Kampf, but maybe it's just a coincidence. Uh, I don't think you can compare, like, Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I Why have here not? is because if we're applying this... People, thought hit people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent... Uh, if I, would, if I would have take this standard of evidence and apply this lens of analysis, couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti-immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted to ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because they want homeless people to starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, but like, I feel like if I— Some if of that's true. And yes, you can ad adopt that criticism. I think the difference— with regards especially to the libertarian side of the conservative enterprise, but also to some degree to the conservative enterprises, they're, they're not building a central gigantic organization to put forward this particular utopian claim. And so even if the conservatives are as morally addled as the leftists, and to some degree that might be true, they're not organized with the same gigantism in mind. And so they're not as dangerous at the moment. Now they could well be, and they have been in the past, but at the moment they're not. And so, of course, you can be skeptical about about people's motivations when they're brandishing how, how the moral say, flag. How would we? Why would we say that they're not as concerned about the gigantism? I feel like everybody is when it's a particular well, thing that they care about. You mean okay? I, I think it's a really bad idea. <laughs> from Jordan, um, because while it's true that certain elements about the size and scale of the death camps and the Holocaust were actually not widely known outside of Germany in some places until after the war, obviously. So, I mean, but, but Destiny's point, which I agree with is that, yeah, even if people didn't know the size and scale and scope of the Holocaust, I mean, Hitler spoke pretty open uh, and explicitly about the fact that like Jews and gypsies and these other forces were like the degenerate forces that were coming into the country and destroying it and that we need to quote like do something about it right so you know and and it was known that they were rounding up jews and other groups of people and, and putting them somewhere right even if they didn't know that they were all being exterminated they you know knew they're being rounded up so i don't see how that could be comparable to like behaviors of people that are worried about climate change when it, you're actually when there's a claim that these people are worried about climate change for these sort of like under the radar subversive reasons that are not anywhere near as explicit as Hitler's reasons and also are so widespread that they're sort of like infected all these various governments all around the world or institutions all around the world yeah it's I mean I don't buy into any of the nefarious conspiracy theories around climate change anyway so and obviously we have proof that all the stuff hitler did really happened so sure you're yeah. sure like i could believe that in a, in the future that 
you know, there could be people that find out that climate change is not true and that information could end up being suppressed by certain people because the train has run away at that point, essentially, mm-hmm. and there's too much invested in the the narrative. But I don't, but like in order to depopulate the planet or to create these harms or these other things, it just doesn't make sense to me in terms of what would be motivating people to do this, why they'd want to do it, and that none of this would ever really um, come out in any way that makes sense. It just seems so much more clear and, and so much more sensible that they're just people that think they do. They think the kind of bleeding heart think that they're doing their best to help everyone, and they're just ending up, you know, accidentally, you know, creating a situation that's worse. The road to hell is often paved with good intentions, sort of scenario yeah. playing out before our eyes. Yeah, they're do-gooders. They're totally do good. It's the same thing with the trans stuff we're always bringing up. You know, they're trying right. to help people. They lit- they really are trying to save the planet. Yeah, yeah. But you know, sometimes I think people it, are wrong. And I think it's the same token with you know the examples that Destiny brought forward, which is that like, yeah, I'm sure there's some conservatives or some people on the right who are fine with like, you know, all the poor people dying. But I don't think that's anywhere near i think that's a minority of the, the right wing in america i think it's an extreme minority of the right wing in america I, I i don't think that's the motivational thing i don't think they're being motivated by these uh malicious intentions so right yeah if if whether they would be inclined in that direction? For sure. That conservatives wield the power of the government whenever they feel they need to, just as liberals do, right? Conservatives were very happy to well, see, that, for instance, abortion okay. was brought back as a look, state regulated thing. Look, that's a, good, that's a good objection. I think that you're correct in your assumption that once people identify a core area of concern, they're going to be motivated to seek power to implement that concern. I think cancel culture is a good idea, too. I think conservatives uh, prior to the 2000s, if they could censor everything related to either LGBT stuff or weird musical stuff or so that they didn't want their kids to watch, conservatives would do it. But now that you see that like liberals and progressives are kind of wielding that corporate hammer, now conservatives are very much, well, hold on, we need freedom of speech, we need a platform, everybody. And now progressives are like, well, hold on, maybe we shouldn't platform people. I got, I feel I've like- got no disagreement with mm-hmm. those things that you said, and I have no disagreement about your proposition that people will seek power to impose their their central their central doctrine okay so then you might say and so we can have a very serious conversation about that what do we have that ameliorates that tendency in the united states we've got a uh, hopefully a form of decentralized government i can't speak to canada as much but yes well yes that's that's true so that's one of the institutional protections against that because Mm -hmm. what that does is put various forms of power striving in conflict with one another Mm -hmm. right and so that's a very intelligent solution but then there are psychological and philosophical solutions as well. And one of them might be that you abjure the use of power, right, as a principle. And so, the, and this is one of the things that was done very badly during the COVID era, let's say, because the rule should be something like you don't get to impose your solution on people using, using compulsion and force. There's a doctrine there, which is any policy that requires compulsion and force is to be looked upon with extreme skepticism. Now it's tricky because now and then you have to deal with psychopaths and they tend not to respond to anything but force. And so there's an exception there that always has to be made and it's a very tricky exception. But look, let, let, me, let me tell you a story and you tell me what you think about this because I think it's, it's very relevant to the concern that you just, you just expressed. And I, I don't believe that the conservatives are necessarily any less tempted by the by the calling of power than the leftists that's going to vary from situation to situation though i would say probably overall in the 20th century the leftists have the worst record in terms of sheer numbers of people killed so i, I mean it depends on how we're quantifying not that. really I okay yeah, we'll I just mean, quantify sure. mao how's that direct death of 100 million people so you know that's a pretty stark fact. And if we're going to argue about that, well, then we're really not going to get anywhere. 
So and I, I'm not disagreeing that the Holodomor happened as well. The Soviet Union and the and yes. China were horrible. Twenty to I mean, fifty I'm not gonna, million yeah, I'm not gonna, people in the Soviet Union. Yeah, okay. well, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's a war of. You know, I'm just saying that it, for World War II, it depends on how much you attribute the war does to Nazi Germany, et cetera, et cetera. But but sure, like largely speaking, I, I don't think that the left beat the right uh, because the right wasn't trying. I don't think it's because Hitler's lack of trying led him to kill less people than what who ended up dying during the Great Leap Forward or during the industrialization of the Soviet Union. Yes, well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policy were right wing versus left wing, and no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Well, what do we because consider? Because it was a national socialist movement for a reason, and the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the so I mean, there was no uh, you know cooperatively formed businesses that were owned by all of the people for the people and distributed to the people. And I don't think redistribution was high on Hitler's list of That's things true. to do. For, That's yeah. true. It was but a I strange mix that, of, sure. of well, totalitarian politics. I don't think it was a strange mix. I think it was a bid to appeal to uh, mid left and center left, the KPD and the German Socialist Party, by calling themselves National Socialists. I think it was very much like an authoritarian, ultra nationalist regime that pretty squarely fits with. I, people get mad if you call something far right or far left because they have a, an attachment Well, you know, terms, one but. of the things I would have done if I would have been able to hang on to my professorship at the University of Toronto would have been to ex extract out a random sample of Nazi policies and strip them of, of markers of their origin and present them to a set of people with conservative or, or leftist beliefs and see who agreed with them more. And that analysis has never been done as far as I know. So we actually don't know and we could know if the social scientists would do their bloody job, which they don't, generally speaking, that's something we could know. We could probably use the AI systems we have now, the large language models, to determine to what degree left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism. So that's all technically possible. So, And it hasn't been done, so it's a matter of opinion. Sure. So, I, but, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, but that, that's something you could do. Okay, I, yeah, so but, I was going to tell yeah, you this yeah, story. Sorry, sorry, okay, well, this mm -hmm. has to do with the use of power. So um, I spent a time at, uh, with a group of scholars putting and analyzing the Exodus story, an Exodus seminar recently. And so the Exodus story is a very interesting story because it's... Uh, well, before I get to Exodus, I just, you know, we talked about this a lot, but I think fascism as an ideology can be difficult, like Italian fascism, the more I've looked into it can be kind of difficult to place down what exactly where you'd want to put it in terms of being like left or right and it doesn't neatly fit into one of those categories specifically and it has kind of various elements of, of like left and right but nazism um seems to me to be pretty squarely on the far right in terms of the ideology you know any ideology that's hyper fixated on the degeneration of society and the subversion of society by, you know, what they view as an external force, like, you know, the Bolsheviks or the Jews or whatever. That's pretty specifically, pretty clearly uh, a, a far right concern. Mm -hmm. Right. That's definitely even if there are policies in there that might not be clearly, quote, right wing, it's definitely when you talk about like we need to we need to lock down our government. We need to lock down our society. We need to erect borders around our group of people to keep out the degenerates, the subversive elements from coming in and ruining our purity. These are all very clearly hitting right-wing moral intuitions, 100%. That's no, none of those are left-wing moral intuitions at all. Yeah. Well, appealing yeah. to tradition, that kind of stuff, which was definitely involved in Nazism. So. Yeah, and in a, in, a, in a purity. The left right. doesn't care. It's interesting because we talk about like the left gets very mad when, you know, they, they purity spiral, right? But that's more like you're viewed as a traitor to the revolutionary cause. You never really hear the left say, our cause, our people are degenerate. Our people are degenerating, right? You never hear them say that because that's they're actually generally in favor, at least right now, the far left <laughs> is in favor of degeneration, right? They want to degenerate everything. And then from the ashes, they think some kind of righteous utopia will rise out of the degenerative ashes. You right. know, they want to apply the acidic solvent to all of society and kind of melt it down. That's kind of like the the, the neo-Marxist prescription here. Um, it's the right that is always afraid of the kind of 
the toxic degeneration coming into society. It's the right that's very fixated on uh, the purity and sanctity of things in terms of your Heidi and moral foundations. I don't, I don't really like the left right conversation so much because so many people are just using it to their own advantage. When yes. it, it would yeah. be so much easier just to clarify these things, come to some clear definitions and just call it a day. Right. Well, but I agree with you really because wants to do that. people, you, you're correct. People use it for right. their political gain. But I do think it's important beyond that because it's important to see that if you're on the left or you are on the right, that your philosophy, if taken to extreme roots, will lead to bad places. And I think that's an important lesson for people to acknowledge that, yes, my philosophy if taken to an extreme, you know, will no longer be the philosophy that I subscribe to. It will be this different thing. It will no longer be medicine. It will be poison, essentially. Right. And I, that, to me, that would be a very helpful notion. And maybe that would make people not become so emotionally defensive or bristle at these concepts is understand that like when something, and I think it was a, uh, I think it was uh, what if all his was, you know, I don't know if it was a Plato quote or, an, or Aristotle quote. He was saying, you know, there's some quote about like when something is taken to the extreme, it ceases to be the thing it once was. And unfortunately, because people do this in political arguments, it makes people end up defending the extremes when they shouldn't. And they should just acknowledge, well, once you take my idea and you make it very extreme, it's no longer my idea anymore. You've made it something entirely different. And I just wash my hands of it. I don't have to defend it anymore. Right. It does seem like there is the right is nationalist and the left is globalist. Yes. It does seem like just a broad spectrum that you can look at. So and I I think the Nazis kind of fit into that being on the right. I just they can't describing people on the left as nationalists just they hate <laughs> They hate that whole concept. Yeah. They're, they're very much like the world needs to unite. Global right. humanity, all ethnicities working together as one. Yeah. It just seems so crystal clear to me. So when people start playing these games, I'm just like, uh, we're just, we're in the word game. Yes. Yes. And I, I don't like that. I don't like yeah. that word game. It's like, right. why is it got to be so unclear? Oh, because well, yeah, I have it, a point to make about how it, the left is all Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And no, I mean, but you're you're completely correct. You know, it kind of goes along with my definition of left and right. The left is, you know, hyper fixated on, on openness and opening the borders, yes, right? That's yes. the more global perspective. And the, the right human more, race. Right, right. And the right is more uh, focused on closing the borders and closing the categorical uh definitions of things right so that'd be more nationalistic right and you can work from there you can say you know they believe you know all ethnicities can work together in co a cooperative fashion the right tends to believe that you know diversity hinders people's ability to work together and both of them have have a point to an extent right i do think mm -hmm. different I think people, I think the left is right in people that look different can all, you know, join the same team or tribe and have the same philosophy and work together in solidarity. And I do think the right is correct when it's harder for, for people who disagree fundamentally about life and politics and culture to work together, right? <laughs> Sure. I think the I think the left kind of makes a mistake of framing it as, you know, they look different superficially, you know, because a lot of people on the left are in fact racists, mm -hmm. right? So it's it is it is a the I think you can overcome the superficial differences if everybody opts into what I I think of as like a I think we should call it an ethnic. It is kind of an ethnicity. It's just the history of ethnicity comes from like French and German and, and English, where they tended to be the same 
race and look the same, even though mm -hmm. ethnicity is more like a cultural term. Like I think Americans, like black Americans and white Americans can have the same American ethic, which right. should be an ethnicity, but well, maybe you it's don't difficult call it culture for, instead of an ethnicity. Yeah, ethnicity is tough because it is kind of married to that that uh, skin color problem. Right. So yeah, I think I think the way that I frame it is the left is correct in terms of that people who have different skin colors or different origins kind of work together unified, and the right is correct in that in order to facilitate the various different people working together, they should have a unifying philosophy or culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. And the, yeah. And that's kind of the problem is that those two ideas, you know, the can are not married so much anymore in American society with the prevalence of the sort of uh, multicultural attitude that everyone should just be able to have, you know, their own, uh, you know, non-unifying kind of American identity, sort of. Right, yeah. Yeah, the fragmentation of those cultures. Right, yeah. right. It's a, what would you say? It's an analysis of the central, the central tendency of movement away from tyranny and slavery. That's a good way of thinking about it. So the possibility of tyranny and the possibility of slavery are possibilities that present themselves to everyone within the confines of their life, psychologically and socially. You can be your own tyrant with regards to the imposition of a set of radical doctrines that you have to abide by and punish yourself brutally whenever you deviate from them. And we all contend with the issue of tyranny and slavery. And there's an alternative path, and that's what the Exodus story lays out. And Moses is the exemplar of that alternative path, although he has his flaws. And one of his flaws is that he turns too often to the use of force. So he kills an Egyptian, for example, an Egyptian noble who has slayed a Hebrew, uh, one of the, uh, Moses' Hebrew slave brothers, and he has to leave. There's a variety of indications in the text that he uses his staff, he uses his rod, and he uses power when he's supposed to use persuasion and legal or verbal um invitation and argumentation. And this happens most particularly, most spectacularly, right at the end of the sojourn. So Moses has spent 40 years leading the Israelites through the desert, and he's right on the border of the promised land. And really what that means at a more fundamental basis is that he's at the threshold of attaining what he's been aiming at, what he's devoted his whole life to. And he's been a servant of that purpose in the highest order, and that Israelites are still in the desert, which means they're lost and confused. They don't know which way is up. They're still slaves, and now they're, they're dying of thirst, which is what you die of, spiritual thirst, if you're sufficiently lost. And they go to Moses and ask him to intercede with God, and God tells Moses to speak to the rocks so that they'll reveal the water within. And Moses strikes the rocks with his rod twice instead, right? He uses force. And so God says to him, you'll now die before you enter the promised land. It's Joshua who enters and not Moses. Okay, and you're, you might wonder why I'm telling you that story. I'm telling you that story because those concepts at the center of that cloud of concepts that you described are stories, right? They're stories. And if they're well formulated, they're archetypal stories. And this is an archetypal story that's illustrating the danger of the use of compulsion and force. You know, and so one of the problems you're obviously obsessed by and that I'm trying to solve is what do we do as an alternative to tyranny, whether it's for a utopian purpose in the future or maybe for the purpose of like conservative censoring music lyrics they don't approve of. And one answer is we don't use force. We do the sort of thing that you and I are trying to do right now which is to have a conversation that's aimed at clarifying things. And so that's a principle that, that's something like the consent of the governed, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's something like, but it's also something like you have the right to go to hell in a handbasket if that's what you choose. And I'm, as long as you don't, you know, in doing so, you're not in everyone's way too much. You have the right to your own destiny, right? And so... And you, and you don't get to use power to impose that. That's the other thing that 
worries me about what's going on on the utopian front. Because the, the problem is, you know, once you conjure up a climate apocalypse and you make the case that there's an impending disaster that's delayed, and you might say, well, delayed how long? And the response would be, well, we're not sure, but it's likely to occur in the next hundred or so years, which is pretty inaccurate. You now have a universal get out of jail card that can be utilized extremely well by power mad psychopaths. And they will absolutely do that because power mad psychopaths use whatever they can mm -hmm. to further their cause. So here's my, this is my issue, I think. This is my issue with a lot of people when it comes to political conversations. I think that. Well, before Destiny, we hear the answer to this. So there's a couple of things I want to say. I, I always like Jordan's um, symbolic explanations of biblical stories. I think they're very interesting. You know, he's kind of going through the whole thing with Moses and the use of force and kind of this message against use of force. Now, some of this, I think, is basically fitting a pattern to a story after the fact, right? As opposed to the intention of these stories when they're when they're sort of uh, written or created. Because I mean, my thought process would be that if these, like a lot of these messages were in the stories intentionally, maybe they'd be a little bit more explicit. Just be my guess. Maybe not. I don't know. But it does kind of illuminate to me especially with the old testament like so many the old testament makes a lot more sense if you look at it purely symbolically if you look at it literally it just completely breaks down to me <laughs> like in any sort of sense making uh uh way of looking at the world if you're to, if you're going to believe that the old testament stories are like all literally true right yeah of course you know especially especially because like the moses one because i remember as a kid you would be in hebrew school and you'd be like wow you know, Moses did all this stuff for, for God and he hits a rock too hard and God banishes him from the fucking promised land. That seems pretty fucked up, God, right? That seems like an extreme penalty for like hitting a rock, an inanimate object with your stick, right? And so yeah. when you're Ooh. a kid, you Ooh. know, you hear these biblical stories and you're just kind of like, I know if this is my experience, I get turned off to like even like believing or like really having any... um not faith, but any value in the Bible, because I'd hear like these weird stories. I hear that story, um, and you, you know, you hear a lot of these like weird stories where people seem to get penalized by God in very extreme ways that don't make sense, and it kind of turns you off the belief here. And I and I think like if I had been taught to kind of look at the Bible in this more symbolic way as a kid, I would have had a lot more appreciation for it growing up. And a lot, and I wouldn't have been so dismissive of a lot of the various aspects of religion and Judaism and things of that nature. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of the magic of Jordan Peterson, or was the magic of Jordan Peterson. I don't, maybe he's still doing that. I just, I don't see his content that much mm -hmm. anymore, so. Right. Um, but in terms of like the force thing, I mean, you do... <sighs> Well, I mean, you. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. Listen, listen. listen Look, I, I'm just. Listen. I'm dying to have a conversation about my fucking tax rate. I think you should have to convince me. Listen, I think everyone the knows. Should come in and negotiate. Big fans of liberalism here. Okay, on the such a such an Adam channel, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. But there does need to be, you know, levels of force that exist in our society. And you can't just say, well, let everyone do whatever they're going to do as long as it doesn't impact me. Because in that, like, there's always going to be sticky areas of like, well, what exactly does impact you mean? Right. Precisely. Right. Yeah. Like, this came up in the, the vaccine conversation with COVID. Like, just theoretically, okay, I understand and agree. I don't think the COVID vaccines really prevent and spread. But just say, like, theoretically, we had a vaccine because we do, you know, have chicken pox and measles and mumps and other things, vaccines that actually do work or that we know work and that we know prevent spread. Like, well, if someone doesn't get it through their own choice, that affects you or could affect you because then they're spreading the sickness that even if you do get vac vaccinated, you could still get it because they're not getting it right. Yeah. And then that allows it to mutate and other things. So it's just not so. Herd immunity. We all know what it means. 
sure, right? So it's not just so clean and simple. Same thing in, in a more complicated level is like, you know, TikTok. You could say, okay, well, you know, if you don't want to, you know, basically get your kids to have, you know, be controlled by the Chinese government, don't let them use TikTok. It's like, okay, that's fine. So I won't let my kids to use TikTok. And then obviously that's going to, first of all, create like massive headache and complications in your life because your kid is going to lose their fucking shit when you don't let them do the thing that everyone else lets their kids do, obviously. Right. Look, and all their friends are going to be being manipulated by the Chinese Communist Party. So what's the difference anyway? Well, well right. And then it's like, yeah, and it's like, okay, well, that's good. So then even if you somehow, you know, you have all these fights with your kid and your kid resents you and you don't let them do TikTok. Okay, well, so then when all the other kids are basically manipulated by the, the Chinese Communist Party and they all grow up to be communists and they all enact communist changes in our country, it's like, well, congratulations. Your yeah. whole like let everyone do whatever they want attitude basically fucked you. So that's why it's like it's not so simple to have this kind of like simplistic rule of like like just being, you know, let everyone do whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't impact everyone else. Because it's not always clear what the quote lines of impacting everyone else looks like. Yeah. Yeah. It's very complicated. I just, the whole idea, I mean, force is everywhere. This is why libertarians are so angry about everything. Of course, mm-hmm. we're surrounded by force. It's everywhere. Right. Yeah. I think that, I think that everything you've said is true. And I think that all of it is it's it's good analysis but i feel like it just gets wielded sometimes in one direction and then people kind of miss that it completely and fully describes their entire side as well um and and the thing that i feel like the only solution for this is you hinted at it um it's more than just conversation although that's a good start we have to go back to inhabiting similar areas we have to go back to inhabiting similar like media landscapes i think that the issue that we're running into right now more than anything else is people live in completely separate realities at the moment such that uh if we were even to describe basic reality how many illegal immigrants came into the united states last year that should be a factual number that we can know how many do Um, you think somebody um i the actual number probably- <laughs> this is so good this is so hilarious mm-hmm. i mean do you know the i don't know the actual number but it's just it's funny that destiny brought it up and he doesn't know it's um it was it's over a million right yeah yeah it's over a million well listen to what he throws out Probably in the hundreds of thousands. I think some conservatives think it's three million per year over the past three years because they look at like border contacts or they look at asylum seekers and they're not looking yeah, at the process. Yeah, I like, think it's 3.6 million. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best. This is, oh God, I was laughing out loud when I heard this the first time. This is the best exchange because he's like, uh, I, I don't, I actually, I don't know. But let's lowball it to like a hundred thousand. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, but, I'm surprised. Cause I thought he did, I thought he was looking into immigration stuff. And I mean, when I was looking into immigration stuff to try to understand like why things are the way they are, it was like, there's something like, it was like a hundred thousand people like a month that were basically yeah. trying to come into the country illegally. Yeah. We looked it up when we were covering some yeah. video or something, but right. I just think it's funny that he brought a, he brought it up. <laughs> then he doesn't know. <laughs> then he low balls it. And then right. he tries to say that conservatives are have some crazy number that's totally untrue <laughs> and jordan peterson goes i believe that number plus some. <laughs> yeah, right right this is like the, one of the best exchanges on the internet <laughs> in recent days this is just so fucking mm-hmm. amazing yeah so it says uh in 20 in 2022 the record it was actually a record year is 2.2 million illegal border crossings right that does not include crossings at official checkpoints Right. Now, I guess you could make some argument. I don't know. Maybe some of those are repeat offenders or something. I, I wouldn't think that'd be enough to substantially change that number. But do you think it's a it. good strategy? A lot of the Democrats now, their strategy is to pretend that this is all just Republican gaslighting. But aren't a lot of the Democratic strongholds in these cities that are experiencing it firsthand? Right. It's like yeah. if you're in New York City. And look, New York goes blue because New York City goes blue, right? Mm-hmm. To tell them, oh, it's all in your imagination. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a good strategy. It's it's a losing strategy. Um, yeah. It's not going to work. It, it'll work for some areas of the country. It, and you're right, there are a lot of blue areas that 
people just know it won't be accurate. Oh, it'll work in some areas. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but the, but the areas the place, that actually are impacted by it will know it's not true. So. Right, and I would argue a lot of those places are obviously blue cities, right? Yeah. Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. Come on, <laughs> Los Angeles is totally blue. <laughs> but I mean, it's pretty obvious. You can see shit's going on. But I mean, even like there's a New York Times article. It's a New York Times article. It's from 2023 of October. And they have, you know, in 2001, in 2021, you had 1.6 million apprehensions on the border. On in 2022, you had 2.2 .2 million. And in 2023, you had 2.05 million. So, I mean, it's like you can't, you That's could try New to gaslight New York Times. It's not happening. This is New York Times. New York Times? What? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you just to, told me it was 100,000. <laughs> You can try to gaslight people, but it's, it's, I don't think it's going to be a winning strategy for Democrats if that's the, the route they take in the right. election. All right, let's get back to this amazing exchange. Came into the U.S. and stayed? Yes, through the okay. southern border. Okay. So, you know, the historical wait, 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 you know, okay, the wait, 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 average is about it. a million. I understand, I understand the chart. Well, the history, historically, there's like 13 to 15 million people full stop in the United States illegally. That's like the all history of illegal immigration in the United States. But some, uh, but hey, maybe I'm wrong there, right? So we can say that, that that's an example of us living in a fundamentally different reality. Um, well, the Pew Research Group has established quite. Well, there you go. At least he's, ign he's acknowledged that he could just be wrong about the, the number. Yeah, no, that's great. That's okay. great. Also, and the point he was making was just fundamentally different reality, which I right. think this exchange is like yes. the perfect yeah. exchange to prove that. Right, right. Yeah. Inclusively, that the very inclusively that the variability over the last 20 years for illegal migration in the south border is between 300,000 and 1.2 million. Well, the Pew research can only establish, I think, the number of people attempting to cross. I don't know if they can know. I don't know if Pew does, like, census analysis. I'd have to see. Well, the, I don't. Well, here. that's that's a but, different issue, right? Sure. Because I don't know how you measure how many illegal immigrants there are actually in the country. I understand. I just want to point illegal. out. I just want to point out. I agree with you. I listened to a lot of Rush Limbaugh growing up. I understand the fear of having a government agency say climate change. Therefore, Therefore, we have a blank check to do whatever we want. That's a yes, scary. Which is what they are doing. The conservatives do the same thing, though. I'm, I'm not they claiming otherwise. Yeah, but the problem is, I think people don't talk about it. So, for instance, I heard. So, we can pretend now that the conservative argument was just compulsory vaccines are bad because they infringe on my freedom. That wasn't the conservative argument. The conservative argument was that mass deaths were going to happen, mass side effects were going to happen. Uh, there was going to be all this corruption and stuff related to vaccine distribution to the crazier theories were microchips and blah, blah, blah. None of that came true. Absolutely none of the conservative fear mongering related to the mRNA vaccines came to fruition. But now that's all forgotten. And that was used as What do you mean none of it? What do you make of the excess? Oh, okay, now oh we're gonna, yeah. Fortunately, getting to all the COVID stuff now. So, oh, uh, yeah. Do you know the difference between mRNA vaccines and and traditional vaccines? Um, the mRNA one, I think, doesn't it, it, it does something, it trains your cells or your DNA to be able to reject the specific spike protein that the COVID is supposed to latch onto or something, right? Yeah, I thought that was it. You're, instead of, instead of exposing you to the actual virus, they exposed you to the spike protein that was in the virus coat where traditional vaccines actually expose you to the virus. Yeah. Well, no, is it, um, so, okay. So like, okay. My, yeah, the traditional vaccine, some chat probably knows this. Traditional it's like vaccine a weak version of the actual, would put a weak or an act or yeah. a not activated form of the virus in your body that would trigger an immune response. So basically your body would learn how to send its like white blood cells or whatever to go destroy the virus when it actually enters your body, right? Right. Okay. Um, but then the mRNA RNA one, it wasn't just that it would target the, the spike protein, right? Didn't it, it, it did something else um, beyond that? Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure what it is. But anyway, they are qualitatively different. I've heard, like, can I even say this? Everyone's going to lose their minds. Why is mm -hmm. Brett Weinstein, like, everybody's enemy now? I've heard Brett Weinstein talk about COVID a lot, and every time he talks about it, 
he's saying completely reasonable things. And it's been spun into this thing that he's like a complete anti-vaxxer or something. Okay, I, I, okay, I, I, I explain it wrong. So it says mRNA, basically what it would do is it would provide, this is how they're using the language that these websites are using. It says it provides a recipe that your cells can use to make the, the spike protein itself. It includes instructions to make one portion of the virus, the spike protein, that is harmless by itself. After injection, the cells in your arm pick up the mRNA, oh, okay, okay, okay. make the protein, and display it on the cell surface. Your immune system sees the protein and learns how to make an immune response to it. Okay. So I guess the, the, yeah. the people would be concerned is that it's basically the DNA. It's teaching your body to, to manufacture the, the spike protein, as opposed, which then creates the immune response, as opposed to just creating your body to create the immune response, which mm. I don't know what the point of doing that is technologically or biologically, why you would use that, but I'm assuming some specific, specific reason for it. Well, viruses take over your cell and, and teach your cell to reproduce the virus. So it is something mm -hmm. similar, but I don't know the reason for it, but that is right. qualitatively different than just exposing your body to an inert virus. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, like, so this like weird step. Yeah. Well, the people that, obviously uh, make and push mrna technology claim it's safer than the alternative the traditional vaccine right right but they say it's we... safer because you're not actually exposed to the virus you're just exposed to the spike protein right that i don't but, know if, i don't know if we have enough long-term data yeah. for that information but who knows and the, right. it might be just a different process so that they can get some new patent or something Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Now, let me read some supers though. Twitter sucks for twenty dollars. Thank you so much. Says Adam, the conservative opinion isn't that the government can do nothing right; it's that the market can do it better. The problem is that legislation restricting the market is what will inevitably screw up the system. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, yeah. No. Like I said, when I was saying, I get it. I totally get it. I understand right. that they believe that the market can do it better. Yes, right. I get that. Uh, Brian Sh for fifty dollars says Jordan Peterson is talking about the metrics on measuring the climate, not that we aren't pumping CO two, but that if you are, ex but that if you're extending the modeling back one hundred fifty thousand years, it's not obvious that the spike shown in the time frame of a hundred years is something worth worrying about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Majin for twenty dollars says hello pumpkins. Let's talk about a serious subject. Sitch, how do you feel about the anti spring break propaganda? Our home has been pushing. I think it might be an economic nose cut for the population face problem. Yeah, I don't know if you know, this is like this weird thing where um, Florida has been pushing a lot of <laughs> anti Don't come here cities. for spring break, really? Yeah, so I don't remember which. There's a bunch of cities all over South Florida like that had problems with like spring break stuff and uh, people basically being very obnoxious on the East Coast, I think, beach areas specifically yeah no it's and, great i love it and so uh and causing all sorts of problems yeah. and so a bunch of different like large cities in, in south florida have been basically trying to uh deter spring breakers from showing up i'm not sure how effective it will be so i don't know if it's going to make a, that big of a difference what a bunch it, of it boomers is, it is kind of it is kind of weird it is kind of weird um because if it's just like they just had like one bad experience last year and that was it, then I, I don't know. You, it would seem to be like, why would you want to hurt your economy so much to do that? But I don't know. Maybe it, I don't live in any of those areas, so I don't know what it was like. Maybe it really was that bad. I don't know. Now, you are silly. in favor of a bunch of drunk, rowdy college kids taking over a town and having fun, right? No, obviously, I wouldn't be in favor of that. Really? But. If I, but <laughs> If I owned a business, Adam, in one of those mm. areas, and I made shit tons of money during spring break, maybe I would be in favor. Of course I don't know. you would. Yeah. Look, if you sure. had a bar that they right. were all getting drunk and rowdy in, you'd exactly. love it. Exactly. I own the bar. If I owned a parking lot in one of these fucking places where they right. gouge you, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, JD for twenty dollars says climate doom has a long history. Hole in the ozone, global cooling in the seventies. Al Gore is a billion climate alarmist. Profit system does exist mostly about rich people, guilt, charities, endangered species, save the trees. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with any of that. Yeah. 
Uh, Equishadox for $20 says, thank you. Says the conservative opinion on climate change is driven by psychological re- reactants to the insane prescriptions put forth by the woke left. Unfortunately, it goes too far. In a vacuum, most people want to steward the environment. Nuclear energy is a good compromise. Clean, abundant power can solve the world's problems, plus drive down energy prices now to convince the ignorant hand ringers that it's also very safe. Yeah, I do agree a lot of people's feelings or intuitions are driven by the psychological reactants of one side going too far and and putting for and putting forward or at least the perception of putting forward insane prescriptions definitely seems to be driving a lot of the political conversation at the moment unfortunately yeah horrible file van go for 20 dollars. thanks so much says the left argues for present person over the future baby person when it comes to abortion but it's future poor over present for poor for climate death of the fetus is certain where the peril of the future poor is not that's an interesting that's definitely an interesting uh thing to bring up vile so that shows you that they're the principle that's at play here has nothing to do with whether the left or the right cares about past person or i mean present person versus future pre- for the present person versus future person that that's not the principle that there's a completely other principle at play here and that when people bring up we have to save the people in the future that's sort of a that's a secondary thing that they're not really getting to the root of what's actually motivating their position here but that's a very interesting point Brian for $50. Thank you, Brian. Says most people don't buy into the conspiracy, but there are many people on the left that do buy into the idea that people are. Most people don't buy into the conspiracy, but there are many people on the left that do buy into the idea that people are the issue and that there are too many people. That's why less why left wingers will give the climate as a reason to not have children. So I've definitely heard lots of people say i'm not going to have kids because of the climate but i don't buy it i think i think they don't want to have kids for other reasons that maybe they feel like they just don't want to be bothered having kids yeah they think that that sounds bad so they want to like make it sound more noble so they say well you know i'm not having kids not because i just want to you know not have to deal with changing diapers and waking up you know two in the morning from a crying baby and paying for it i'm not having kids because i'm so noble in climate change and i don't want to bring them into the world so to me i think that's just a cope that people make i, I you know this is just an intuition obviously i'm doing mind reading here but i think it's just a cope i don't think that's their actual motivation yeah it sounds a lot better to say hey look i'm saving the planet not i don't want to have kids because i'm selfish and greedy <laughs> right? yes yes I don't, I, I, I'm not sure how many people who are like actually in the know about things still believe in overpopulation as a problem. I'm sure there's still like people in the lower tier of the left that believe it, but uh, Twitter sucks for $25. Thank you. It says population control isn't strictly about population density. It's about control. Charles friggin Swab said home gardens produce more carbon. The elites are mass immigrating people that are easier to control. They want to control where you live and what you eat, eat the bugs. So I just, I don't see that. I don't, I don't see, like if population control was the issue, wouldn't they be against immigration? Why would you want to, why would you want to have more people immigrate into your country, which would cause more instability in your country? Yeah, that doesn't and make also, a lot of sense. Yeah, and you want to immig- you want more people to come. Like, you think wouldn't it be easier to control? Like, if if the goal is to depopulate, if the goal was to depopulate, I just if the goal was to depopulate. You'd want basically every government be going around trying to limit immigration as much as possible, and trying to make every third world country start to emulate first world country via force. Right? We we'd have basically global empires running around forcing um western democracies at gunpoint on all the various populations i just feel like the the world looks so different if there was some kind of elite conspiracy to depopulate and control the world it wouldn't look like the way it's looking right now which is kind of just people doing shit that makes sense for them to do on an individual or group level perspective once we perfect 
robots, the immigration thing is going to flip. It's not going to be, I mean, they want immigrants because they want cheap labor. It's economic boon for, for everyone. But as soon as we can do that through technology, oh man, it's going to be like, shut that border down. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it's definitely good. I don't know if it's going to f- like 100% flip, but it's definitely going to change a lot of people's calculation. Well, the demographics are all off. You know, we need more younger people. So, right. That's what I'm saying. Not... You still need more younger people, even with yeah. robots. Not so. necessarily. Oh, I guess maybe you do for consumption. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You still need the, yeah, because you still need new, more and more new customers. Yeah. Who's going to make all the cool cars that the robots make? Who's going to use all that shit? Who's right? going to use them? Yeah. yeah. Right. Who's going to consume them? Right. Right. I mean, I can consume a cool car a week. There you go. Uh, an alien for 20, 30, 40, 55 dollars. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is your 20th ever super chat. So thank you. It says, hey guys, just caught the stream and I know this will be off topic, but I want to mention some things I noticed in the last video. Well, here we go. You guys talk about how one of the main reasons people aren't having kids is because they can't afford them, which as far as I know, I thought the data showed that even in Western countries that poor people have way more kids than rich kids could be wrong about that though. Well, let me pause there. It's not that if we said that, then I guess maybe we weren't being clear. It's not that people can't afford them. It's that the f- people are financially incentivized to not have children. So kids are viewed by quote, the educated class as an expense, you know, and I think you, the term you use, Adam, was like, kids are an expensive- um, Conversation piece. Conversation piece, right. right? Yeah. We're in more, in societies that are f- more focused on where kids are allowed to work via labor or more involved with farming, kids can they're be- cheap labor. Because they're, ne- they become, yeah, they go from being conversation piece that cost you money to cheap source of labor, essentially. Right, yeah. So that's what we meant when we said like, the 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 economics of it but anyway let me continue uh that would mean the declining birth rate would have to be something else i don't know what it is though also when adam was analyzing the housing section of the video from an mmt perspective but even if you believe in mmt which i am neutral i don't think it applies to countries outside the united states because countries like the uk and australia which they're mostly talking about at least seem to have their currency backed by the u.s dollar so mmt doesn't work there s class is best class and a team reigns supreme I believe the UK has economic sovereignty and so does the Australian dollar. I don't think mm-hmm. they're, they're not pegged. Neither of those currencies, as far as I can tell, they're free floating currencies. They, they're not pegged to the dollar. So they can well, run mm-hmm. the printing press and print as much as they want. Whenever, at least whenever I talk about the housing crash, I'm only strictly talking about it from the U S perspective. Now, there's a problem of complexity here because since the U.S. is the most important, best, most free, dominating country in the entire world, baby, that anything that happens in America to our economy has global repercussions. Um, so when our housing market kind of explodes, it's going to have global repercussions. And I don't know how much of the rest of the world's problems was simply because of our problems or because the rest of the world um, housing market was emulating and copying the the housing market that was doomed to fail in America. And I, I don't know the answer to the question. I'm not um, informed enough to know the answer to that. But. Right. My, and my argument on the, on the kids thing, and this could be completely untrue because supposedly there's been some research and I think Constantine Kissin brought it up in the video that we, we responded to that, people are answering surveys saying that if they had more money, they would have more kids. Like they want to have more kids and they just in the current economic environment can't afford it. So that makes you think, well, if you raise their economic conditions, they would have more kids. Obviously there are people who are going to have kids, whether they they're going to have kids they can't afford. Right. I would argue that a society would be better if the people who are conscious of, or who are not having kids that they can't afford could have kids, could afford the kids. So and in the, the um, cheap labor versus expensive conversation pieces, I think, well, if you want to get the price of the conversation piece down, then I think people would like to have more conversation pieces around the house. 
Yeah, right? that's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. So it's just well, a simple supply and demand thing. And, and talking again about how like birth rates are still high in, in quote poor countries and low in like rich countries, um, it's because there's a different cultural attitude. So like if you exist in a quote rich country or richer country, there's an attitude of like, well, if you have a kid, you know, you have to do all this expensive yeah. stuff for your kid. He's got you know, to have college. He's got to have his own car when he's sixteen. Yeah, he's got to have yeah. a car. College. He's got to go to the best preschool. He's got to have tutors. You know, he's got to go to you know extracurricular activities. You could blah 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 blah. You have to do all this stuff, right? Where if you're in a poor country, uh, I'm assuming the cultural attitude about yeah. kids is not very expensive. <laughs> yeah, their <laughs> labor the consideration. Yeah, you clean the house, like, oh. right? You walk the dogs, you feed right. the horses. Right. So that's why I say it's not exactly like a clear, like one to one um, thing to look at in, from that uh, perspective. But look, it uh, could be wrong. These people could just be gaslighting on these surveys and, you know, they get extra money and they're like, ha ha, fuck that. I don't want any kids. Right. I'm greedy. Right. I'm going to France. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Oxtracy for $20. Thank you, Oxtracy. Says, I think Adam is downplaying the storage issue with green energy. However, gravity batteries might work, seem cool, but haven't done the research to verify their effectiveness. Well, there you yeah. go. I, I don't know either. But. I put it, I can't remember what, what, what it was, but it's hydroelectric mm -hmm. energy conversion or something. Anyway. Mm hmm. Uh, Squirrel and Oz for 20 Aussie bucks. Thank you. It says Bill Gates did a TED talk about lowering the population of the world. Well, check it out. Oh, that guy. Did he? Oh. Video targets Gates with old clip misleading edits. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is, I don't know if this is true. This is just what, what like a headline is saying. So I'll have to go look into it to see if, if it actually was. Um, dishonestly edited or if this headline is fake and he actually was doing it. I would guess, my guess would be my intuition I would be pretty shocked if Bill Gates was in favor of uh, depopulating the world or, or something to that effect. So Was he trying to eliminate malaria? Like why would you want to eliminate malaria if you're trying to depopulate the world? Wouldn't it seem like just let malaria run its course and get out of the well, way i mean that's an excellent point <laughs> well, I mean, well if you're gonna believe the conspiracy you say that like the vaccine the malaria vaccine was actually secretly doing something insidious right like the, the getting rid of malaria would just be the excuse to vaccinate a bunch oh, of people. oh okay i got it so really you develop a malaria vaccine that's makes everyone sterile right yeah yeah exactly or oh, okay. put some microchips on this whatever so i yeah i don't know i'll but i'll check it out i am curious but i, I would be surprised if he was advocating for some kind of widespread depopulated depopulation initiative so okay. uh, potato thank you so much for being outside the simulation for 20 months look at that wow says That's zero amazing. says zero taxes after three kids oh yeah look that's I, it there you go there's your policy zero taxes after two kids why it's got to be three I guess if you want to increase population as opposed to just hitting a replacement. Yeah. Look, three kids you get to tax your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that policy would work very well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that have a lot of unintended consequences. Yeah, look, I'm just throwing ideas out there, okay? Okay. They can't all be winners. Uh, Knight of the Diamond Spoon for $20. Thank you. Says climate change is real and inevitable. The earth was super hot in the beginning, then it cooled down, then it got very hot, then it got super cold. Now it's getting hot again, yet the world continues. The left needs to calm their tits. Well, I mean, that's true. Well, that is true. The climate changes. Their their argument to, to steel man the left position or the climate alarmist position is that they're saying the change is occurring at a significantly faster rate due specifically to human intervention and is going to lead to catastrophe. Like that's the actual argument that they're making. So, which I don't, I admit, I don't know the exact validity of the argument, but. But I mean, you agree that they got to cool well. their tits, right? Well, I do agree with that. They got to cool. Yeah. I mean, it'd be nice if people cool their tits. I do agree with that. So yeah, that's always the best. And that was what do you mean? None of it. What do you make of the excess deaths? There, that for related to vaccines, there are almost none. This, the mRNA vaccines have been.
Look, he doesn't know about the excess deaths argument. Well, no, he I, he knows about it. He just he doesn't agree with it. Really? Of course. I mean, I don't. I can I can basically bet there's no way Destiny's not argued with someone about the COVID excess vaccines, deaths. excess death stuff already. Is it from the vaccines that the excess deaths are supposed to be happening? I just thought they were. Saying. Well, no one knows, right? It, right. If you're anti-vaccine, then that's an easy thing to point to, right? To say right. that it was because of the vaccine. Right. Been administered the excess, to excess for related to Europe. vaccines. Absolutely. We don't know. No, no. We absolutely we don't know. know. We absolutely. This is second. like what settled science. What do we know in terms of vaccine related? No, 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 no. That's not my question. Excess deaths in Europe are up about twenty percent, and they have been since the end of the COVID par- par- Sounds pandemic. Sounds really high to me. Twenty percent. Go look. Uh, Go we, look. I'll check afterwards, but um. Is this including like the Ukrainian war with Russia? No, no, it's not including the Ukrainian war. Okay. No. What else? You've heard this argument, right, Sitch? The excess yeah. deaths, I'm sure. But uh, Scott, oh, Scott Adams, I'm sure, <laughs> talks about the excess deaths quite a bit, right? Well, he, so, I mean, he has a position, I think, kind of vacillates nowadays, um, which is that he doesn't think anyone will know. Right. The answer to any the, anything related to COVID, no one will know, and I kind and I do agree with that. I don't think we're going to really get reliable information or data. Number one, just because it can be difficult to get the data. Number two, because there's too many people that would want to make data look in specific directions. I don't think we're going to get really trustworthy, reliable data on like COVID and the vaccines and all stuff for like 10, 20 years. Yeah, I completely <laughs> agree. Yeah. Yeah. There's. Too many people are worried that the data is going to be bad. It's going to look like it's going to make things that they did seem horrible. Yes. Yeah. So they're going and, to suppress the data. And now I don't know the specific argument that Jordan is bringing that he's talking about because when he talked about like ex- excess deaths, I don't know how you could. I don't know how there's if there's the information that he's pointing to that's saying that it's clearly from the vaccine. And I don't know what information Destiny is saying that's clearly not from the vaccine because my understanding would be, well, you just don't, you know, is it from COVID itself? Is it from the vaccine? Is it from people being in lockdown? Is it just that people are basically more and more becoming unhealthy due to diet and sedentary lifestyle and it's just catching up? Maybe, you know, maybe the lockdown accelerated it or maybe it's just catching up in the numbers. Like, you know, there's a mil- I feel like there's a lot of reasons that could kind of be the culprit here for excess mortality in the right. last, you know, four years or so. Right. Yeah. But the argument is that there is a a predictable number of deaths each year mm-hmm. according to demographics. And for some reason we've had a rise in that mortality rate. Uh, it's a suspicious rise in that mortality rate mm-hmm. that is as yet as of yet unexplained. Right. Yes. Right. So. And or it could just be some weird math errors that people are making. So <laughs> maybe it, yeah. one one of the scary things, and I don't know if this is true with this number, so I want to be very clear. But one of the scary things I've noticed that when you do like deep dives in a lot of these like numbers and research, is that you'll find kind of the base set of data that a lot of people are working off are all like, it's like one or two sets of data that right. everyone's using, yeah. assuming is correct. And sometimes you get in these wacky problems where like, well, it turns out the base set of data everyone was using was actually wrong. Yeah. The so, guy who was recording it for 20 years died during the pandemic. And well, I guess right, that wouldn't his, make sense because he'd stop recording it, right? His lazy, yeah, <laughs> his, his lazy son, uh, you know, took up the mantle and did it. Right. Like so there you go. Right. Yeah. So I'm just saying, yeah. so I, I don't know the answer to, to this question, but. But I do know a lot of people talk about it. No, are, are you implying that you think it's because of vaccines? I'm or? not implying anything. I'm well, saying you're, you're, what the excess deaths are. But what, now, what this, is your take on what's causing it? Well, you said that, in, and you said that in a counter. He also, I, you notice how he said that it's settled science. That's always a. I'm like, what? That's definitely a trigger word for. When is what, what settled? What's settled here? Yeah, for for people in this conversation. To me, describing mRNA vaccines, he said, well, the excess deaths are 20%. That makes sense that the implication is that the vaccines are causing well, it. Or some, okay, it? first of all, something is causing it. 
Well, at that, obviously, okay. yeah. Something is causing <laughs> sure, it, or, or some exactly. combination of factors. Sure. Now, one possibility is that the healthcare systems were so disrupted by our insane focus on the COVID epidemic that we're still mopping up as a consequence of that. Wait, are these exit deaths tracing back through COVID as well? Post-COVID. The- Just post-COVID. Post-COVID. Okay. okay. Right. They're terrifying. Right. They're terrifying. And, and they're not well publicized. And I think excess trusts are de- the fact that you're speaking to them right now seems like. Yeah, but I ferret down a lot of rabbit holes. It's not like it's front bloody page news on the New York Times. Sure, but I think excess deaths is a, that's a metric that you can Google. And I'm pretty sure there are like three different huge organizations that track excess deaths around the world. And there are many countries. more than three, yes, sure. in every single European country. Right. Okay. Well, so one relatively straightforward hypothesis is, is that it's a consequence of the disruption of. The healthcare system, the staving off of cancer treatment, etc., the increase in depression, anxiety, suicidality, and alcoholism that was a consequence of the lockdowns, the economic disruption. And there's plenty of reason to believe that some of that is the case. But the other obviously glaring possibility is that injecting billions of people with a vaccine that was not tested by any stretch of the imagination with the thoroughness that it should have before it was forced upon people also might be a contributing factor. Partly we because we know that it led to a rise in myocarditis among young men. And we also know that there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to ever recommend that that vaccine was delivered to young children. So whose there, risk of death at COVID was so close to zero that it might as well have been not, zero. When you're talking about a disease, the risk of death isn't the only thing that you worry about for the disease. Also so you're going to talk about transmission? We're, we'll, because we're, that we're was another about, thing that the we can talk COVID about vaccine transmission. pushed. Yeah, we but can, it didn't do anything to transmission. Talk, it absolutely did because it decreased your chance of getting affected. It didn't destroy, it didn't get rid of transmission, but it reduced transmission. Yeah, but it was your claimed that it would get rid of only transmission. Only if you take one reading of one single quote, I think that oh, Biden said one time where he said, no, come on, I've heard so many times they say, oh, you can't take anything Trump says seriously. Biden, one Jesus time on the news Christ. says, if you get the vaccine, you won't that transfer the so disease. That is so silly. Which was a, no. Do you know that our prime minister in Canada deprived Canadians of the right to travel for six months because the unvaccinated were going to transmit COVID with more likelihood than the, than the vaccinated? So this wasn't one bloody statement. This I, was no, like no, hold on. thorough I, what government I, what policy I, What I'm saying country. is there wasn't a statement given that if you get vaccinated, there is a 0% chance of transmitting the disease. The idea is that vaccines were supposed to help because Fine, it, well, reduces, it reduces we, your hospitalization, <laughs> it reduces... Well, okay, wait. I, I think it's a really bad um, argument about the, the... Like, there definitely was... And I, don't, I don't know exactly what Biden said or even what Trump said or what the Fauci said at the time, but I know that there is definitely a a implicit if not explicit prescription from kind of the mainstream narrative at least at first that getting the covid vaccine would um help prevent the spread right like wasn't that the line prevent the spread get the vaccine of course like yeah that's the way they sold it that was definitely the way it was sold in the beginning now that changed at some point when it was accepted that 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 it didn't actually prevent the spread all it did was basically limit uh your symptoms supposedly right, it right. Would give you some yeah. level of make it so that it wouldn't hit you so as bad potentially it wouldn't hit you as right. bad yeah um, and then that. and then at that point the narrative changed but there definitely was a narrative at least at first that i clearly remember where it was about limiting spread I mean, it was partially, it was limiting, one of it was limiting hospitalizations to not overtax the system, but part of it definitely was limit the spread. And it was the same thing with the mass. I mean, that was the whole point of the mass was to like limit the spread, right? Right. So I guess the mass, I guess that's not really relevant to the, because they're really just specifically talking about vaccines. But I, I do remember that they were talking about vaccines as limiting spread. That wasn't the case. And to me, it doesn't even like that was sort of the central thing for the vaccine va- vaccine mandates was if I mean, besides the fact that you could say, you know, it was not as well tested as other vaccines, which I think is definitely a, a good point. But I mean, you don't even have to get to that argument, because if the vaccine itself doesn't actually limit the spreading of it or it only limits it in some very negligible way, because like, well, maybe you'll you'll still get it, but your symptoms will be less severe. So maybe you won't be as can maybe right. You won't be as contagious. I don't see how you could compel people to get a vaccine at that point then. 
Yeah. Yeah, the vaccine mandate should be completely set aside. You want to get it because it would help you if you got COVID, your symptoms right. would be less severe. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there's before no you reason even, to mandate it. Right. Yeah, at the bare minimum, the vaccine should, at least in my mind, be able to prevent spread if you're going to try to get it mandated. Right. Death and it reduces transmission, hopefully by making it so that people don't get sick or don't get sick for as long. All three of those things, the vaccines did exceedingly well. They continue to do that to this day, but especially for the first variant um, and then the Delta variant, the vaccines helped immensely here. Um, they were well, tested. The myocarditis rates are like seven out of 100,000 injections, and the myocarditis is generally acute. And it's generally not as bad as even getting the coronavirus itself, which will lead you also to having myocarditis. It's a much worse severity. side effect than side effects that have caused other vaccines to be taken off the market before. That so, a but seven it, out of 100,000 rate of acute myocarditis or pericarditis is not a worst uh, side effect than any other vaccine. I think that is a completely acceptable, given that the disease itself is more likely to cause myocarditis or pericarditis. Yes, I don't totally think the data suggests to support that presupposition anymore. The latest peer-reviewed studies show that that's simply not true, especially among young men. The, the, so there is an age bracket of young men where the elevated rate of myocarditis, acute myocarditis from the vaccine might have been higher, but we're talking about like three or four cases per 100,000 people. And again, myocarditis, pericarditis are generally acute conditions. Well, they I don't told last you at for the very beginning, long. I told you at the beginning of this conversation that the progressive leftists were on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's not about being on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's about- Really? One, really, yeah. It's yeah, well, I like, see. So what I see, what I see as the unholy part of that alliance with the pharmaceutical companies is that it dovetails with the radical utopians' willingness to use power to impose their utopian vision. Well, then what do you because make of the fact that— Otherwise, how would you explain it? Because the leftists should have been the ones that were most skeptical about the bloody pharmaceutical companies. And they jumped on the vaccine bandwagon in exactly the same way that you're doing I mean, right pharmaceutical now. Pharmaceutical companies have helped us tremendously yeah, throughout the— Right, there we go. Fine. No, do you think I don't think hasn't? so. No, I don't think that so. You're just wrong. Just, I hate this conversation so much. It's just driving me crazy. Because it's yeah. like the most extreme positions on both sides. It's like Destiny completely sucking up to the pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies can do absolutely no wrong. They did everything they did was perfect. Everything <laughs> was completely uh, verified by the science and all this right. kind of stuff. And then you have Jordan Peterson, who's basically like, oh, there's these shadowy elites out there who are basically trying to use this to implement their utopian <laughs> communist right. goal it's like yeah um yeah. what's going on here Sitch? i i listen i'm the exact same i'm <laughs> in the exact same boat you are yeah can we get can we get just a little bit can you guys step off the gas just a little bit here? <laughs> just a little bit yeah I think they're You're utterly wrong. I see. So you don't think that the pharmaceutical companies who dominate the advertising landscape with 75% of the funding are corrupt. I don't corrupt is a corrupt. very broad. No, 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 it's do you targeted. think that do you think that corrupt do you think with they, a tinge of malevolence, you think willing that, to extract money out of people by putting their health on the line. Do you, you don't think believe that, we, that do you think that we get effective drugs from pharmaceutical companies? Not particularly. <laughs> oh my god that's incredible i think it depends on what field you're looking at specifically it's just the, the thing so, that's funny is just the hedging like yeah the answer is hell no <laughs> right sure but he goes but sure. he says not particularly <laughs> well i mean i i think i think jordan i would have guessed that jordan's position is rooted very strongly in his journey of all oh, the medical I know, problems that I know. he's had but that's why you should say hell no more than anything in, in terms of you know because i do think one of the the areas that is very dangerous for medicine um and maybe we'll look back at this time period and, and see this is a lot of the the you know drugs that we give for a psychiatry for anxiety medications for depression seem to have very mixed results of course. You know, some people can be greatly helped by them and some people can be like really fucked up by them. So you, you got know. the pharmaceutical companies go they've got sales reps and doctors' offices. How can you say that's not corrupt? That's totally corrupt. Yeah, or you know, my own experience with you know being on the uh 
anti-acid protein pump inhibitor medicines were so for so long, which are like horribly bad for you. And I don't really think anyone should really be on these uh, medicines at all. And the fact that they were basically doc- doctors were giving out this medicine like candy. And then on top of that, after some period of time, the, all these medicines basically became over the counter. They lost their prescription. Right. Yeah. And it, and like, it's so ridiculous because they're like, oh, like you should only take these medicines for like two weeks, but buy a bottle that will last you a full year. Like, like, wait, why are you selling, you know, a, like a year long bottle? If you're only supposed to take it for two weeks, if that's the, the safe realm of taking it, you know? So it's just, it is. So there's obviously lots of corruption going on in this field. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Do you, so do you think that any vaccines work? Yes. Do you think that any- I don't think 80 of them work at once for babies. I I think- <laughs> I mean, I just, look, this is like way comedy for me. That maybe, <laughs> I guess, look, I, I'm, and people are probably against me in the chat. A lot of people thought Jordan Peterson was great in this, but this just, mm-hmm. I mean, it just, I think it's hitting me different than it's hitting other people. Like a lot of people are seeing- the righteous indignation here but it's just i don't know it seems very childish to me well i mean again it depends on who's right like if he's correct then the then that level of anger is justified if he's wrong then it's not well i do think the pharmaceutical corrupt companies are corrupt as fuck obviously but sure yeah i think that's a little risky but but yet we've been on this vaccine schedule for how many decades like and this don't- like this not like this, not carefully. I had a ton of vaccines when I was a child. I'm pretty sure that was the norm for people. There were a ton of vaccines. You had to There's take way it more to. now. <sighs> oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna stop pausing, but this is, <laughs> I just, I wanna laugh with you, Sid. <laughs> okay, and you think well, that- Well, you can understand why. I mean, look, part of it, no doubt, no doubt part of it is a consequence of the genuine genuine willingness to protect children. But the moral hazard is quite clear. And people on the left used to be aware of this. What do you, you make of the fact, can, what do you think the mRNA vaccine, the speeding up of it came from? How do you make for the fact that it was Donald Trump that didn't terror, work speed? Terror, so you, foolish panicking, just like we're doing with the climate issue. So you think foolish Trump was, panicking. was he in bed with the pharmaceuticals? Was he working with the left or was it just a dumb, that was the only panicky thing he made. He didn't try to push for the mass lockdowns like other far left people would have wanted him to do. That was just the one mistake he made was the pushing for the vaccine. No, I think Trump undoubtedly made all sorts of mistakes and lots. And it wasn't, it certainly wasn't only the left that stampeded toward the forced COVID, COVID vaccine um, um, debacle. But it was most surprising to me that it emerged on the left, because the left at least had been protected against the depredations of gigantic predatory corporations by their skepticism of 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 the gigantic enterprises that can engage in regulatory capture. And that just vanished. Is it not possible that maybe people looked and they said, hey, if all the governments, all the institutions, all the schools, all the private companies across all the countries around the world are saying the same thing. Yeah. Maybe it is the case that this vaccine just helps. Is that not possible? Oh, sure. They probably, that's sure. Of course it's possible, but that didn't mean it was right. Well, who's they this? used force. Well, if, if, who, they used force. We use force for all sorts of things in terms of public health. We don't health. generally use force to invade people's bodies. How long have vaccine mandates been a thing in Canada, the United States, and the entire world? I don't think they should have been a thing. That's great. I if you don't think they should have been, but when you say we don't Geneva generally policy. use force, we absolutely use force. We use, look, we, we've, okay, we've enforced look, vaccines for a long time. Okay. It's an important part of public yes, health. Fair enough. We did it on a scale and at a rate during the COVID pandemic, so-called pandemic, that was unparalleled. And the consequence of that was that we injected billions of people with an experimental, and it wasn't a bloody vaccine. Of Just, course. It no, it wasn't. Yes, it, it was. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's what, not. Doesn't it have a 100% success rate? You think it's a definition of vaccine? The whole point of the vaccine is to give your body a protein it's to train on so the immune system works. Who cares if it's not the same? There's plenty of. There's they different used types the word of, vaccine so that they didn't have to contend with the fact that it wasn't the same technology. There are different types of vaccines there certainly that are, 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 that are different technologies. Fine. The mRNA vaccines is a type this of used vaccine to be technology. Vaccines. Now this is vaccines. No, it was like this and now it's like this. No, no, no. It was like this and now it's like this. The mRNA technology was a radical, 
qualitative leap forward in technology. You can call it a vaccine if you want to, but it bears very little resemblance to any vaccine that went before that. And the reason it was called a vaccine was because vaccine was a brand name that had a track record of safety and shoehorning it in that was one of the ways to make sure that people weren't terrified of the technology. And I you think know, the reason it's called a vaccine is because they're injecting you with something that's inoculating you against something in the future because it has proteins that resemble a virus that infects you. There are your overlaps system, between, between the mRNA technologies and vaccines to be sure, but they wouldn't have been put forward with the rate that they were put forward if they weren't a radical new technology. And it's bad in principle to inject billions of people with an untested new technology. Isn't it also bad in principle for billions of people to get infected with a worldwide pandemic that initially was causing a decent number of deaths, a ton of complications, shutting down world economies? Maybe, maybe it was. Maybe it was. So shouldn't we be able to engage like, in that analysis and figure out, like, if we look at the We're not engaging the in the analysis. No, because now we're, we're talking about whether or not vaccines happened. or even vaccines or not instead. No, 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 we're, no, no, don't play that game. That is not what I was doing. I was making a very specific and careful case. The mRNA technology, by wide recognition, is an extraordinarily novel technology. And that doesn't make it, it not a vaccine, though. Well, okay, it's a radically transformed form of vaccine. I don't we give a damn. Updates. That still makes it something so new that the potential danger of its mass administration was highly probably highly probable to be at least or more dangerous than the thing that it was supposed to um, protect against. And we are seeing that in the excess we are deaths. Absolutely not. Saying. So, are you implying now that the excess right. deaths were caused by the vaccines, or I don't? It like I don't bloody well know what they're. Well, that's caused what you're implying by. now. Well, the, look, if you're going to use Occam's razor, you're kind of stuck in an awkward place here. I'm because absolutely are, not stuck in an. This is yes. the most administered vaccine in the hit or inoculation or whatever you prefer to call it. The history of all of mankind. Every single organization around the world is motivated to call this out if it was a bad thing. You don't think Russia or China would be screaming if Donald Trump or the United States warp sped through a vaccine that was having deleterious effects on populations all around the world? You don't think there wouldn't be some academic institution? You don't think there'd be more than a handful of doctors and Joe Rogan and some conservatives saying this vaccine might have been bad if it was the case that American companies working with companies in Europe and Germany, especially. Why? Because that's where biotech is from. In order to create a ma uh, or a manufacture a vaccine that was causing excess deaths all around the world, there are so many different people that we motivated to call this out. How do you explain they the fact that no, one, it out. no, it's a handful of people? Where are the governments Look, calling it? Where are the academic institutions calling it? Where are the other private companies calling it out? There would be way more people motivated to suppress it, especially if they were involved in its dissemination. The it's vaccine just, dissemination it's or, or, or yeah. COVID dissemination. The vaccine dissemination. Right. Like, if, if there is. You know, if there is some there there and, you know, mm -hmm. this somebody finds out this is going to kill us all in 10 years, right? Right. Their motivation to say that would be great. The people who would have to spread that signal to the population who are involved in creating and disseminating the vaccine, their motivation to suppress that information would also be great. So I don't think well, the argument Destiny's making is really good. I mean... I don't think that I don't think my understanding is that there isn't really uh, you know strong data to point you to show that vaccine injury has caused that the COVID vaccine has caused all this injury that that data doesn't exist yet. It's my understanding. Yeah, my understanding um, too. But right. I mean, maybe it does, and it's being suppressed. Sure, sure. Um, but I agree. I, I don't think. I don't think the argument he's making is the best argument, especially because like the number one way or not the number one way, but like one of the best places that would maybe dig that information up, I would imagine, at least in America, would be through the legal system and lawsuits. Oh, yeah. And I think that's kind of part of the problem is that, you know, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to sue for vaccine or, or perceived vaccine injuries. Yeah. And so that that kind of shuts down that avenue for for true seeking. Yeah, they didn't they structure all this stuff so you can't sue. Yeah. And they already yeah. right. head off that valley of attack that Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um but I mean it, it, this call could end up being a wash cuz we could all find out hey the vaccine actually did help or the vaccine kind of helped but didn't really do much damage anyway. That that's pro my intuition, my guess 
my prediction would be it would be in that camp. The vaccine like sort of helped, but didn't really do that much damage. It did some damage to some people, but didn't do that much damage overall to most people. Yeah, and look, and if you that'd got, be my guess, but if you got fucked, if you're one of the people who totally got screwed of course, by the vaccine, sure, look, I'd sure. be hella pissed. I'd I be would mad. be too. Yeah, and I do think that those people should be able to sue. Yeah, because especially if those people didn't necessarily need to get the vaccine, or either forced to by the government, by oh, their yeah. job, or just because there was so much fear about COVID, you know. But obviously. It's difficult when you're in the midst of the pandemic. Everyone's so afraid. You know, these decisions are kind of, you know, made in these very fearful circumstances. So, especially if you're young and your chances of being hurt by COVID were so slim. Yes. Man, that's so well, fucked up. But then the biggest problem was because the COVID vaccines, the lockdowns, everything became so politicized, it became this left right issue which then completely clouds people's judgment in order to f figure out what is true. Yeah, yeah. So we're not going to know for 20 years until the the tribalist cloud clears. Sure. This is sure. like a perfect example of the tribalist crowd too because these two people are at such far extremes. Yeah. Wouldn't you stand well, to make a kill? Well, I was just saying in terms of like foreign governments, like I don't think russia i'm just guessing i don't think russia would have the capacity to make arguments or to even figure out whether the american or european mrna vaccines caused any damage and even if they did would anyone really trust them number one and number two um, even if i think china could be more competent maybe to figure that information out considering i still believe that covid was an accidental loud leak from china i would think they would want to just keep their fucking mouth sick because like exactly because if, if, if china keeps comes out and says like oh you know your american vaccines are dangerous like that's just going to motivate america to be like bitch you're fucking release the vaccine because of your incompetency so i mean if i was trying to just shut the shut up about it they supposedly cooked up a bunch of fake vaccines too i don't think they ever even had real vaccines oh really i don't think they used our vaccines either so they had, I mean, they, yeah. I thought they came up with their own vaccines. I don't know if they worked or not. Yeah. But. No. Killing, if you were a private company in Europe and you could say, look, the mRNA vaccines for sure are causing all of these issues. Why wouldn't Putin, why wouldn't Xi Jinping, why wouldn't anybody else in the world call this out? It was as horrible as it was. There are plenty of people attempting to call Nobody out credible and no huge institution. What do you make of the excess deaths? You haven't come up with a bloody hypothesis. I don't even know if there are 20% at the excess deaths in Europe right now. If I had to guess off the top of my head, it's going to be, like you said, one might be lingering effects of an overworld healthcare system. Another one might be uh, deaths related to the war in Ukraine. Another one might be rising energy costs that have happened for a couple of reasons. But it's absolutely impossible that any of it could be unintended consequences of a novel technology injected into billions of people. I think that if excess, first of all, there aren't billions of people in Europe. So if there were I excess there deaths, were. I understand, but you're talking about excess deaths in Europe. I'm not aware of excess deaths that exist in other places that are completely and totally unaccounted for where the only explanation could be the vaccine. I think if well, there were, I think more people would be talking about it. Well, we have to, well, first of all, the number of people talking about something is not an indication of the scientific validity of a claim. Quite I agree contrary. with that, but for well, a vaccine- Well, then why are you using mass consensus as a as the determinant of what constitutes because truth? Because I think for That's something- never been the case. Because I think for something that was given to billions and billions of people, if this was something that would have a measurable effect on people, it would be it would be impossible to cover it up or ignore it. Well, we wouldn't have to look at the one case right. brought up on a, on a documentary. We wouldn't have to look at the one thing being talked about. Then what do you, you know, make of the VAERS data? The VAERS There's more negative side effects reported from the mRNA vaccines than there were reported for every single vaccine ever created since the dawn of time. And not by a small margin. So it's not just the excess deaths. I agree. It's the VAERS data. What is VAERS data? It's the data base that until the COVID-19 pandemic emerged and we had the unfortunate consequence that there were so many side effects being reported, it was the gold standard for determining whether or not vaccines were safe. And now as soon as it started to misbehave on the mRNA uh, vaccine front, we decided that we were going to doubt the validity of the VAERS reporting system. Okay, the VAERS reporting system never been the gold standard for anything. VAERS reporting is just if you want to report that there is some issue that you have after getting a vaccine. 
That's it. I think it's what vaccine, vaccine adverse. What the hell do you think it was set up for? To, to report adverse events Why? that happen after a vaccine. Why? To track and see if something was related to the vaccine. Right. right? So Why? most people, most people didn't even know VARES existed until after the COVID vaccine. Once people know that it exists, of course, more people are, are going to engage with it. But what happens? So it's all noise. Report, no, it, well, it could be or couldn't be. So what do you do when a bunch of stuff? Well, being, you first of all, might su you so might begin by it, suggesting that maybe it's not all noise. Correct. So when Especially all of these things deaths. are admitted to VAERS, what they do is from there, they investigate. All you can do, all of that, all VAERS is, is I might go and get a vaccine and maybe in three days ago, hmm, I got a headache. I'm gonna go ahead and like call my doctor and, and make this report. And they'll say, okay, well, it's an adverse event after vaccine. It doesn't mean the vaccine caused the headache. And now that more people know about this system than ever. I'm sure, saying I'm that just the saying VAERS, that VAERS is not the gold standard of determining if a vaccine is working or not. Compared to what? Compared to actual uh, longitudinal perspective, randomized control trial you studies. You mean like the ones they should have done to the goddamn vaccine? Like the ones that they did do for the vaccines oh, and they oh, continue yes. to do to this day. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. They, yes, You really correct. think that you're in a position to evaluate the scientific credibility of the trials for the vaccine? Do you? No, really? I don't. So I have to trust. Then what are you what doing? I, have to do, what I, have, I don't trust. I have them. to I trust love the bloody I have data. To, you have first of all. You have to trust third parties to some extent. When you go outside, I don't have to trust. Of course third you do. You do every day. When you turn the keys in your car, you hope your engine doesn't explode. When you're drinking water, you hope that the public water or whatever tap or bottle water you got it out of isn't contaminated or poisoned with cholera. I don't when do you that as a consequence of consensus. No, you, you. Of course you do. No, I don't. I do that as a consequence of observing multiple times that when I put the goddamn key in the ignition, the truck started. Why do you know it's going to start the 50th or the 100th time? Why do you, how don't many times do you wear those? with me. I'm you know not perfectly playing well Hume. Why. You don't know if the denim in those jeans isn't leaking into your bloodstream. To some extent, we trust, we have to trust third-party institutions Except to make determination. Except when they use force. Ex how about especially that? Especially when they use force. We trust the police officers. We trust the we judicial. We do. Okay. Um... Do you have anything to say about all this? What's up, man? Forth? No, it's great. Yeah. Look, I'm just having some popcorn. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> look at them. Look at the people yelling at each other. Ha 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 Sitch, this is great. Mm -hmm. We should mm -hmm. yell at more people. Shoot. <laughs> yelling is good. <laughs> I mean, you do. I, I do feel like this is sort of. Like we've entered sort of a d debate brain. The twilight kind of, zone, of course. Kind of space. I mean, you, obviously you do have to trust. Um, I don't know if, I, I, I don't know if like putting your key in your car is a good example of that, but you obviously do. We live in a society where we do tr have to trust that like when you go to a restaurant, that the restaurant is going to be following like health codes, right? That they're not going to be serving you toxic food. They're yeah, not going to be serving you you know, things that are, that are going to make you sick and unwell. If we, if we talked to Jordan Peterson, we asked him, look, from a sociological perspective, is it better to live in a high trust society or a low trust society? Look, he could go on for an hour about high trust societies. This is complete debate brain here. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing. Now he does qualify it with saying it's the things that you use force at the end, at the end of the last thing that he just said here. And so you could say, okay, well, I would agree that when it comes to things that are forced upon you, there should be a higher threshold of what that trust is. Sure. And I. So, <laughs> oh, God, I love it when such size. So I'm, I don't know, like, it's just with the. Hmm. Just enjoy I, it, Sitch. Just okay, man. I'll just because I just I'm just not knowledgeable enough to know about like the mRNA technology to to give like a really clear take on you know how trustworthy was that the vaccine technology in terms of the safety when it was kind of rolled out or not. His D Destiny's comeback on the VAR system, I think, is accurate. Like, not many people knew about the VAR system before COVID, so you could get a bunch of people who are reporting just any little thing that syncs yeah, up with yeah, they yeah, took 100%. the vaccine. Yeah, I, yeah. But I don't. I honestly don't think Destiny has has read anything on the excess deaths or knows he. I think he's kind of BSing his way through this. So mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson should stick on the excess deaths because. You know, supposedly the pandemic's over and if we're still having excess deaths past the pandemic, I mean, that's strange, right? Like, why are we still having excess deaths dragging into the future when COVID is no longer an issue? 
Yeah, but it wouldn't be clear what exactly is causing those excess deaths. It's not like you, my, my understanding would be you wouldn't know if it's like, there's no proof that it's the vaccines that were causing the excess deaths, right? Right. But look, if, mar, if myocarditis, and look, I, I haven't looked into this. I haven't read a lot of stuff on these excess deaths. I just know the arguments that other people are making. And my critique would be, I just, I don't think Destiny is really engaged with these arguments. And he's got a lot of hubris here to be you know, trudging through a debate with Jordan Peterson on a topic that he really is not familiar with the, mm -hmm. the excess deaths, you know, if myocarditis and, and look, this is how insurance tables work and whatnot. They know how many people are going to die in a population each year of cancer, of heart attacks, of heart disease. All these things are like stable, uh, developments over populations. If you went from, from, you know, X number of people dying of heart disease every year to suddenly it's up 20% people dying of heart disease, like something changed, right? Right. And if it's right after the pandemic, maybe it's the vaccines. Maybe it's, I don't know. What is it? And that's, look, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at cdc.com. I'm looking at the, or cdc.gov. I'm looking at the census bureau.gov. <laughs> like these different, these huge Look, and Destiny even says, like, a big institution is not reporting this. Yeah, they are. Uh, last I checked, CDC and the Census Bureau are big institutions. Mm -hmm. So he just doesn't really know what he's talking about. Right. Yeah. You know about insurance actuaries and stuff like that, right? Yeah, sure. It's completely consistent. Mm -hmm. They They can't tell you, you know, when you're going to die of cancer, but they know, like exactly the number of people who are going to die of cancer each year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they have a, yeah. They have very a good consistent. Estimate, right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We, we, do. we, we on the left trust the police. Do to we? some extent, do we? If somebody's breaking That's into your house, who do you call? Them. I'm not, I'm not a defunder, but if somebody's breaking into your house, you can be the most defund person in the world. Who are you going to call? Are you going to call your neighbor? Are you going to call? Look, he slipped into the constellation here. He's like, you're on the left. Defund the police. <laughs> That's a bad metric. Call Joe Biden, are you going to call Obama? Are you going to call the Black Panthers? You're going to call the okay, cops. Okay, so, so tell me this. Tell me this then, because the core issue here is use of force as far as I'm concerned. You know, we, we examined some of the weeds around that. Politicians throughout the world, and this would be true on the conservative side now, in the aftermath of the COVID um, tyranny, because it was more a tyranny than a pandemic, okay. were, are now saying that we actually didn't force anybody to take the vaccine. So what do you think of that claim? Like, so let's define force. I think it's because technically Canada, true, but I think it's silly. What do you mean it's technically true? Define force. It's technically force, true then. and that in the United States, at least, I think the idea, what they tried to do, they weren't able to do it because the Supreme Court shot it down, was Biden tried to make it so that OSHA, who's the body that regulates job safety, could make it so that employees had to get vaccinated. Now, eventually, that it was- Or what? Or they'd lose their job. Okay, does that qualify as force? That's why I said technically. Yeah, I know, but, no, not but I'm at, it's a serious question. I mean, because we need to define what constitutes force be, before we can. It seems to me. You could argue it's a type of force, sure. I mean, I think it'd be silly to say it's nothing. It, it is a type of force. It's the same as a cop telling you you have to do this, you're going to be killed. No, but it's, it's right. on the spectrum, sure. Of course, yeah. It's as much force as the mRNA, mRNA vaccines are vaccines. Sure. <laughs> It is a type of force, and the mRNA vaccines okay, are a type okay, of vaccines. So, so okay, sure. so okay. I look, I really <laughs> think, I really think the problem was mm -hmm. with the COVID response. I really think the problem was the use of force. I mean, I can understand to some degree, although I'm very skeptical of the pharmaceutical companies and far more skeptical than your insistence upon the utility of consensus might lead me to believe you're skeptical of them, which is surprising, I would say, given I'm that- I'm very skeptical of them. That's why I'm glad there's multiple companies, multiple countries, multiple academic institutions that do research, and the FDA. Yeah, I'm very skeptical. You should be in any private system. You should be skeptical of every private company, of course, whether we're talking media, pharmaceuticals, or automobile manufacturers, yeah. But skepticism doesn't mean a blind adherence to the complete total opposite of whatever it is they're saying, right? They're in doubt, undoubtedly, like if you look at how Alzheimer's research, there's been groundbreaking improvements on drugs to treat Alzheimer's research over the past three years that five years ago, none of these drugs even existed. And now, yeah, so I mean- How about depends. if you're skeptical of anyone who's willing to use force to put their doctrine forward? Then, you, then you're skeptical of, of literally every single person, political ideology ever to ever have existed in, in all of humankind. Some degree of force, you would, 
I undoubtedly believe this, right? Some degree of force is probably necessary for any kind of cohesive society, right? No, I don't believe that. Of course there is. No, even I if don't you had a what? What's the argument he's making here? <laughs> well, okay, let, let's hear. Let's hear the argument. Yeah. Tribe of 100, 120 people. If somebody was, uh, if somebody was stealing something, right? You have to punish that person. I that said earlier that 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 becomes complicated when you're dealing with the psychopathic types, right? So that's a complication. But, but I would say, generally but, okay, speaking, go. that. The, the necessity to use force is a sign of bad policy. And no, I don't think, see, I'm not particularly a Hobbesian. I don't think that the only reason people comport themselves with a certain degree of civility in civilized society is because they're terrified by the fact that the government has a monopoly on force that can be brought against them at any moment. I think that keeps the psychopaths in line to some degree. But I think that most people are enticed into a cooperative relationship and that formulating the structures that make those relationships possible is a sign of good policy. I've got to, I have to ask, because I have watched a lot of your stuff in the past. Um, I remember you speaking very distinctly on this, that for instance, when- You think that applies to taxes, Sitch? Well, I guess I don't really understand what Jordan means when he says that, when he says what he said. Right. Because, I mean, he's definitely talked about how society um and you know and he said this in kind of his talks about like nazism how you know most people that went along with the nazis weren't psychopaths right they were basically pressured into that way via society right um but then i guess he would say well that's that you say that's my point those people were basically pressured into it via force i Are people enticed into a cooperative relationship with taxes or are they doing it because they don't want to lose their home? Well, no, they're doing it via the people are paying taxes because of force. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. Well, it's, it's difficult. So like, for example, you could go, there's some places where there is a cultural norm that is so strong that will prevent stealing. Okay. So, for example, you know, I don't know if it's true. I've heard this is true that if you go to like an Apple store in Japan in a lot of cities, like, you know, if you go to Apple store here, the phone is like attached to the, the desk. Right. Yeah. It's like a little wire. So you can't steal yeah. it. I've heard that like if you go to Japan, like it won't be like you literally just pick it up and steal it. Right. But people won't because it's such a strong no cultural norm against stealing, you know, in Japan. Right. Or certain areas. Right. Of Japan. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> they cut okay. off your hand if you steal something. Well, no, it's just okay. Maybe not quite. But what? But whatever. I, I just to say, if it's not true, let's just say theoretically it's true for this uh, example. And in America, okay, you can go. And I'm not just talking about like in a poor area. You can, I've gone to you know Apple stores, phone stores, and like, yeah, Beverly you know, Hills. It's like Beverly Hills, down to rich the thing. areas, right? It's fucking tied to the thing, and, and it's not just like quote poor people or you know lower income, you know urban youth stealing phones like you know there's a lot there's fucking you know rich white kids would be middle class kids too would just be jacking phones left and right you know because they want a new phone of and course. and so you could say okay so you could say well you know you don't need force because you know the japanese can do it via this cultural pressure and i guess that's theoretically true but the problem is okay but what if you exist in a society like are we do in america where the cultural pressure for stealing certain things doesn't exist to that capacity and it would be very difficult not impossible to like quote create a culture that it does then you do need to use force to stop that action so i do think it's yeah. a bad a bad um example and, and, and stealing here is actually a perfect example look at the prevalency of theft online like we oh, yeah. probably live in a in a society if you were to include the amount of things that are stolen via content if we're to include content like movies and uh, music and dare i say pornography right mm -hmm. the, the amount of theft of pornography alone <laughs> is probably more theft than anything that's ever been stolen in america ever. <laughs> like the amount of theft that we probably have in america now is actually maybe far greater than we've ever experienced we just don't think about it because it's all like content on the internet that's being stolen hmm. and it's because there's no way to enforce it really effectively 
that people basically threw their hands up in the air and said, I guess we're just going to allow it now, right? Yeah. No way to enforce it. Right. So, I mean, I, I do think that, yeah, you obviously need to construct a society where you do have force to, and it's not just the psychopaths. I think a lot of average people will steal shit, will do things. If they think everyone can do it and get away with it, then that's kind of the way it works. I just think it's kind of a Pollyanna view from a quote unquote conservative. Conservatives well, I don't think Jordan usually is believe conservative. In, yeah, look, I don't either, but, but I do I usually am believe of, in a law and order and you know, punishment for wrongdoing keeps I people kinda, from doing wrong. I am kind of surprised to hear him take this position. So I mean I would I would attribute it to and maybe he'll flesh it out more so to like kind of address these points because I don't remember exactly this part of the conversation. But I would attribute more to just sort of like the heated debate brain of the of what's going on right now. Oh, I would too, you know, and it's not the end of the world. I just, people were making it sound like Jordan was making some argument. And I just, what what is the argument that we're being enticed into a cooperative relationship for taxes? <laughs> like, how's that not force? Right. I think well, most people would think, well, no. If I had the opportunity not to pay any taxes, I wouldn't. Sure. Yeah. And the sure. only reason I am is because they're going to lock me up and throw me in jail if I don't or take my house away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, I backed up a little bit. So let me hear, I want to hear the, like, the full argument again. Comport themselves in that they that said earlier that, 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 that becomes complicated when you're dealing with the psychopathic types. Right, so that's a complication. It but I would say, generally but, okay, speaking, go. that the the necessity to use force is a sign of bad policy. And no, I don't think, see, I'm not particularly Hobbesian. I don't think that the only... See, that means taxes are bad policy right there. Yeah, or theft is bad policy. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't agree with that in a vacuum, obviously. Yeah. But reason people comport themselves with a certain degree of civility in civilized societies because they're terrified by the fact that the government has a monopoly on force that can be brought against them at any moment. I think that keeps the psychopaths in line to some degree, but I think that most people are enticed into a cooperative relationship and that formulating the structures that make those relationships possible is a sign of good policy. I've got to, I have to ask, because I have watched a lot of your stuff in the past, um, I remember you speaking very distinctly on this, that for instance, when two men are communicating with each other, there is an underlying threat of force that kind of puts on the guardrails those particular social interactions. For instance, yeah, I the threat of force is yeah. don't be psychopathic. What is, how broader is psychopathic here? Are we defining? Well, I can define it. I mean, sure, yeah, go for it. Well, a psychopath will gain short-term advantage at the cost of long-term relationship. Okay, I'll that's really the core issue. Well, you know, you you made it you made a reference to something like that earlier mm -hmm. in your discussion, when you pointed out that people. So wait, he said his defi the definition of psychopath he's using is someone that will gain a short term advantage for a, at the sacrifice of a long term advantage, right? Sure. Well, I mean, he later elaborates that it's he's specifically talking about predation on other individuals well hold on, i think on. that's the most important component. Your relationship what is it how broader is psychopathic here are we defining well i can define it i mean sure. yeah go for it well a psychopath will gain short-term advantage at the cost of long-term relationship okay I'll that's really the core issue well you know you yeah the psychopath will throw you on bus. <laughs> yeah for any is reason is that too yeah. broad i mean i mean i feel like that's too broad I don't know. I mean, when oh, I, it is. well, I mean, as I said, steal. Okay. So if you go to a store or let's just even say it online. Okay. If, if you download, um, a Marvel movie illegally, right. Yeah. I, I wouldn't as call opposed you to a playing psychopath. for Disney plus, yeah. like I wouldn't say it's a psychopathic behavior, but uh, you can make the argument that you're essentially engaging in an action, a short term game for yourself, which at least potentially could have a long-term harm of like making, you know, less likely for Marvel movies to exist in the future or something. Right. Sure. Yeah. That's a good point. You, the, you made it. The psychopath it. stuff is Sorry. such a, it's such a, I don't know. I don't know that it's relevant here when we're talking about 
a society constructed look i want to minimize force too and the reason sure. why we do a lot of the things uh, the way that we do it is to give the veneer that there is no force right you're doing this out of the, your own free volition right mm -hmm. but ultimately if you dig down a little deeper you're like yeah society's held together by force well, I mean, a reference would, to something like that earlier no, I'm i was just say off. like um well two things first of all when i hear the word psychopath i think specifically that you're talking about someone who who has a personality disorder right specifically Yes. Um, number one, you know, who feels no empathy or something to that effect, um, and just use people as like objects to, yeah. to manipulate. Um, but in terms of like the force, I mean, and we've said this before, I, I think like the entire point of culture is essentially a force mechanism to sort of control behavior. It's yep. a way to it's a way to pass down behavior controls through another mechanism that's not DNA, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, culture can change faster than DNA too. That's the advantage right. of it. That's true too, yeah. Yeah. You're in your disc you're in your discussion when you pointed out that people claim to be motivated, let's say, by principle, but will default to short term gratification more or less at the For drop of a hat. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Well, the the exaggerated proclivity to do that is at the essence of psychopathy. So it's a very, it's very I'm immature. Curious, with, that, with this definition of psychopathy, what, does it's that mean the like, definition of psychopathy. It's not an ad. It's not mine. That's the core of psychopathy. Okay, I'm not I, in the in the United States. I think we call it all ASPD now. Um, no, it's, the, it's separate from that's antisocial personality disorder. They're I thought separate. that subsumed psychopathy and sociopathy. psychopathy is no psych, psychopathy is more like some. It's more the pathological core of antisocial personality disorder. Okay. Finally, a topic Destiny has well researched. <laughs> Since everyone calls him a psychopath all the time, <laughs> he knows. He's like, yes, I get this. Well, that might be, I think, maybe it's part of the problem with me not understanding exactly what Jordan means here. Because when when I hear someone say psychopath, I'm assuming they mean antisocial personality disorder. I don't know exactly what he's referring to here. Yeah, yeah, lack of empathy. Yeah. Okay, maybe that might so be true. Okay. That's a better way of thinking. The, like the worst... A small I'm, number of criminals are responsible for the vast majority of crimes. It's 1% mm -hmm. commit 65%, something like that. Do you think, and, is psychopathy something that can be environmentally induced? Or do you think this is core to a person? It's both. Okay. So, for example, if you're disagreeable, mm -hmm. like you are, by the way, one of the, your proclivity, if you went wrong, would be to go wrong in an antisocial and psychopathic direction. Mm -hmm. That's more true of men, for example, than it is for women. That's why men are more likely to be in prison by a lot. I think it's 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 generally. It depends on the particular crime, with it being higher proportion of men as the violence of the crime mounts. Uh -huh. So you Do you agree with that? I thought it was completely genetic. I didn't think it could be, you couldn't turn somebody into a psychopath. Well, I guess it, maybe you could. Well, again, so it depends how we're using these terms, right? Well, look, if you... If you think of a psychopath as someone who has no empathy for other people and they just see people as objects to be used and manipulated, mm -hmm. I think if you if you could start off with somebody who has a lot of empathy and put them in situations where, you know, basically they're fighting for their lives, maybe prison, you could turn someone into a psychopath who was a very empathetic person, right? Well, okay. This is the way that I conceptualize it. So... And maybe this is kind of the issue. So you say like, okay, a psychopath to me, or at least like someone who has it from like a biological perspective, okay, right. who's born a psychopath, who was born with antisocial personality disorder or something to that effect, they don't care about anyone and they never will. Yep. Ever. For any reason, right? Um, and that's very different than a person who could engage in psychopathic behavior but does is able to who's taught that behavior or is culturally incentivized that behavior, but is able to have loving and empathetic relationships with other people. So for example, like you could have, and I'm sure there were Nazis who were biological sociopaths that cared about nothing and were totally fine just, you know, murdering and killing people, torturing people, experimenting people, doing all that stuff. 
born psychopaths, but also Nazis who were doing all that behavior, but still then went home and they had, you know, emotions of love towards their their wife and their children. Could couldn't that be induced just through tribalism though? Because if, exactly, if they that's see, my exact point. Yeah. That's my exact okay, point. Okay, good. Right. Oh, so all right. it so that behave psychopathic behaviors can 100% be induced through tribalism because then the person basically says like, oh well, the people that I'm en- enacting this whore on, yeah, they're they not like human people. Yeah. They're not human. They're a different group than me. This is how like people justify <laughs> slavery you know, and things of that, that nature without being, quote, a psychopath, right? Even if they're engaged in a psych- psychopathic behavior. So I think yeah. those types of behaviors can be taught. But I think to be the, quote, psychopathic person, the person who will never care for anyone else, I think that's just innate. I think you're just born that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree. You can imagine on the genetic versus environment side. So imagine that when you're delivered your temperamental hand of cards, you're going to have a certain set of advantages that go along with them that are part and parcel of that genetic determination. And there's going to be a certain set of temptations as well. So for example, if you're high in trait neuroticism, you're going to be quite sensitive to the suffering of others and be able to detect that. That's useful for infant care. Uh But the cost you'll pay is that you'll be more likely to develop depression and anxiety. And if you're disagreeable, if you're disagreeable, extroverted, and unconscientious, then you're the tilt The place you'll go if you go badly is in the psychopathic or antisocial direction. And there are environmental determinants of that to some degree. Sure. Genes express themselves in an environment. I I agree. Um, When I'm just curious for the definition of psychopathy for short term gain at the expense of long term relationship. uh, relationship. Really? That's probably the best bit. Yeah. When you look at stuff like people that are self destructive, say people that engage in behavior, at least like obesity, is that like a type of psychopathy? pathy to you or is that like something different or how do you define these types of things i guess or how do you view that type of thing well the 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 no no there is an overlap in that addictive processes one of which might lead to obesity Uh do have this problem of prioritization of the short term but the distinct so that overlaps with the short-term orientation of the psychopath but a psychopath is see an obese person isn't gaining anything from your demise at to facilitate their obesity, uh-huh. right? So there's a predatory and parasitical element to psychopathy that's not there in other addictive short-term processes. Do you think, is it possible that there are things, because uh, then to circle back to the, the tribal example I gave, isn't it possible that people can commit harms against other people or they're not necessarily gaining from their demise, but it's just some other sort of gain that well, they're doing better? So for it, instance, like well, say yes. like I'm talking to some friends and I'm just gossiping or shit talking another person. I'm not necessarily feeling good that I'm trashing them per se. I'm feeling good because this group of friends might view me more favorably because I have like a gossip or something to share with them. Well, but the, but that's the gain right there. Mm-hmm. Is And you are contributing to the demise of the people you are, that you're gossiping sure. about. But, the, but I think there's like, I feel like there's fundamentally different type of thought process between like, I want to tell you something juicy about this guy because it'll make you like me versus I want to tell you something juicy about this guy because I hate this guy and I want him to like have a worse reputation among people. I feel like there's different drivers for that. I would say that's a, that's an interesting distinction. I would say probab- probably that the hatred induced Malevolence it's is a worse the, form of malevolence than the popularity-inducing malevolence. Yeah, the, the know, only it's, reason it's a I, tough one, but yeah, the only reason I bring that up is because I feel like a lot of malevolence that we have social guardrails for is that type of like selfish malevolence, where you're not. I would argue even the majority of malevolence in the world is usually people acting selfishly or being inconsiderate, not necessarily like I hate this. Yeah, person, I, I think that's right. Sure. I think okay. that well, that's why Dante outlined levels of hell. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, exactly that. And I mean, that 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 book was an investigation into the structure of malevolence, right? Uh-huh. He put betrayal at the bottom, uh-huh. which I think is right. I think that's right, because people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, which almost only accompanies an encounter with malevolence rather than tragic circumstances, they are often betrayed, uh-huh. sometimes by other people, but often by themselves. And yes, there are levels of hell, you know, and you outlined a couple there. Mm-hmm. So I guess then my question is just that if you have people, so the kid that steals an orange from a stand, not because he hates the shop owner, but because he wants the orange or he's hungry, without some type of societal, it doesn't have to be the government, it could be family, religious, without some type of use of force, do you think that society ever exists without Use force on your wife? Um, well, what are we considering force? Is withholding sex, for instance, is that considered force? Or is, uh, you know, saying we're going to well, cancel a vacation? Deprivation of an expected reward is a punishment. So, um, so you sure. could, 
Well, no, but, but I mean, this is a serious question. I mean, yeah. look, look, if we're, we're thinking about the optimization of social structures, mm -hmm. we might as well start from the base level of social structure and scaffold up. Sure. So, right? I, I, so like if a wife is upset at a husband, for instance, would that be considered uh, use of force? Well, okay, before we get off on this, I, I don't know, I, I feel like it would just, it's easy. I don't know why we've changed the subject. It'd be easier to answer the question about like the kids stealing the orange before we get into the realms of withholding sex, right? Is that, is that yeah. force? Right. Yeah. Because even that, I think that's a bad example because, um, this is like, when you're talking about like withholding sex, it's a, it's an act that you are participating in yourself as well. Right. Uh, you would hope w one hopes, right? It's a more of a dual activity as opposed to like you stealing an orange is more of like a singular you doing something that is essentially wrong, right? Right. Is hunger force? Well, the fact that you're hungry is something forced upon you by nature, sure. Okay. Right, but it's not forced but upon you innocent. by like a conscious entity, you know, unless you're going to say like blame God or something. Sure. But. I do blame God. I'm glad you brought <laughs> okay. it up. Mm -hmm. We might as well start from the base level of social structure and scaffold up. Sure. So, right? I, I, so like if a wife is upset at a husband, for instance, would that be considered uh, use of force? I think a negative punishment. You're removing a stimulus to punish a person mm -hmm. for something. Yeah. Would you consider that like a use of force? Or I would say it would depend to some degree on the intent. The intent is to punish. A behavior, well, if the right? intent is to punish, then then it's starting to move into the into the domain of force. I mean, look, mm -hmm. look, while we've been talking, you know, there have been bursts. It's just, it's so simple, and it's like, I just this is we're delving into the needless complication realm here. It feels like it. This does yeah. feel needlessly complex, and also it's like, well, so if if you, I mean, may, there could be completely justifiable or good reasons to use force in a relationship. You know, you, of you know, course. use force against your child to prevent them from running into traffic, right? You use sure. force, and I don't mean like you know beating them, but you could say like, oh, if you don't you know, eat your vegetables, then, right. you know, I'm going to use force so that you can't use your cell phone or you can't play video games, right? That's a right. use of force. You're making, sure. you're forcing something onto them if they don't eat their vegetables. Right. Just beat right? them, Sitch. It's so much Why? easier. Okay. But, I mean, it's just, and I, you know, same thing, like, if you're in a relationship with someone and they basically like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to shower anymore. Oh, my God. Right? I mean, you could yeah. say, well, I guess I'm not going to have sex with you anymore, right? Like, that's a completely, <laughs> at, like, 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 I would say justifiable use of force in the relationship at that point. So I like, so I feel like these are all bad examples because the, the whole conversation is supposed to be about like that. Like, is it possible to construct a society where there's no use of force, which to me just seems not possible. It's laughable. And I just, I feel like it's just something Jordan Peterson threw out there offhandedly. And now we're going down this weird path. Maybe. I don't know. I haven't heard him say this in another context. So I'm not familiar with the idea, but it is an uncomfortable truth. It's not mm -hmm. comfortable to think, well, society only exists because it's forced upon us. Like that's not, I mean, that's, that's a real downer. That's a real black pill. So I see why people want to argue against that. Why people want to believe that just, you know, we're all, we're all volunteers here. Well, we're all here of our own free will. It's, I think it's a matter of perspective. So you could have the, the attitude that you're saying. Where it's like society's forced upon us, so that's like a downer, right? Or you could have the ad the attitude that society oh, no. is this gift that has been constructed oh, by our ancestors. The gaslighting for no, no, no. This is, but they're both true. Okay, okay. so I, okay. so you could say society is the gift that has been constructed by our ancestors for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. <laughs> that was basically cultivated by humans working together and mm -hmm. saying, you know. In order for us to live and work in a cooperative group and to be able to do all the amazing things that humans do, like build amazing cities and build amazing technologies, we all acknowledge that we basically have to sacrifice some level of freedom in order to live in a society together and to cooperate. And to me, that's not a black pill. To me, that's like a beautiful thing. I think that's why oh. society is worth protecting. Oh my God, Sitch. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about lower taxes now? 
We can. We can't talk about lower taxes. I'm just saying. So I don't think you shouldn't have a black attitude about like the force of society. It's like, no, it's it's a beautiful thing that we've constructed. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, sir, look, go, go to, I mean, I, you know, I can look at any like, like, uh, you know, emerging city skyline and see like all these amazing bridges over water, all these amazing skyscrapers people have built. And to me, it's just, these are all, it's an amazing thing that humans have basically been able to construct a society to do all this wonderful stuff. Yeah, so. no, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. Okay. I don't, yeah. We started by living in caves, banging sticks together. Okay. And look at right. where we are now. Yeah. I'm talking to you, someone who lives thousands of miles away from me on the other side of the country to people who are listening, who live all across the world. And we're all interacting in real time yeah. through magic. Okay. It is, it is beautiful. We're building a culture together. That's right. Right. That's right. And if you don't think about it too hard, there's no force. In <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's completely of our own volition. The thing is like life itself is force. Okay. If we're to remove, you know, um, you know, spiritual ideas about people choosing their destiny or whatever, if we're just going to look at it from a, a non-religious, non-spiritual materialistic perspective okay? okay you're born you don't choose to be born um and you just have to kind of deal with what's thrown at you essentially okay and so like so how do we how do we react to force you know so so we're already built and we're already kind of like born in a very unfair situation where we're forced to survive essentially of course yeah nature forces us into it that's where right. the force begins yes that yes. hunger yes Yes. Yeah. It's of emotion, right? Yeah. And that's because we're freeing entropy and trying to close and to enclose it again. Uh -huh. And so that's going to produce, it produces negative emotion fundamentally, most fundamentally anxiety and pain and secondarily something like anger because those emotions are quite tightly linked. Sure. And so within the confines of a marriage, because we might as well make it concrete, there are going to be times when disagreements result in bursts of emotion. Mm -hmm. And those bursts of emotion don't necessarily have to have an instrumental quality, right? It's when the emotion is used manipulatively to gain an advantage that's short-term for the person, and then maybe that's at the expense of the other person or even at the expense of the person who benefits future self. That is, isn't this amazing that all this marriage counseling is done? is taking place with destiny do you think <laughs> you think jordan oh, i didn't even Pe think about that oh my god that's awful oh no you think, i no. do you think jordan peterson is like just trolling destiny here i like no, i kept wondering I like so. i don't think so does no. he know anything about destiny's marriage or backstory or anything i don't stuff? think i think it's just because he brought up the example of withholding sex that let us down. I don't think this is any. I mean, this is a pretty time. masterful troll here. I mean, if yes, yeah, you sure. know, when a wife is being manipulative. Oh yeah, I didn't even think of all oh, your right. Oh, that's this rough. That's rough. That's rough, buddy. And it starts to tilt into the manipulative. There's a there's a tetrad of 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 traits. Mm -hmm. So narcissism, Machiavellianism. That's manipulativeness. Nar narcissism is the desire for unearned social status. That's what you'd gain, for example, if you were gossiping. Somebody put a picture of Molina up right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Where? Don't look, I need to grab one. This is Don't perfect. Do it. This is Don't a perfect do meme. No. Come on, Sitch. We got to back it up a little bit. But this is like this is the meme. Uh huh. No, you have you have to fade in the Molina like fade in picture. <laughs> As as he's At like fifty percent opacity. You know, there's like narcissism. Right. <laughs> there's manipulativeness. <laughs> and elevating your social status. Mac oh my god! There's elevating your social status. <laughs> so it's tell me he's not trolling destiny right no, now. No, no. Oh, tell me no. that's not happening. Come no, on, I don't think it's happening. Be realistic here. I mean, he's got a pretty straight face. So. <laughs> Look, he's got the three fingers. Yeah. You know he knows what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Narcissism, psychopathy, that's predatory parasitism, and those culminate in sadism and that <laughs> cloud of <laughs> negative emotion that's released in the aftermath of disagreement. 
can be tilted in the direction of those traits. And that's when it becomes malevolent. And that's when the problem of force starts to become paramount. Because I, I think I think that your I think that your fundamental presupposition was both Hobbesian and ill-formed. I do not believe that the basis for the civilized polity is force. Now you're saying that you know you can't abjure the use of force and time. See, he, he says, look, the the base of the civilized polity is not force. That's so wacky. That's so wacky. I just, I, I can't. I don't look, know what, I, I don't, I mean, I don't I know exactly. I can't abide by that. I don't know exactly what he means by that. That's just, yeah, that is utopian thinking right there. Mm -hmm. As much as he, t he talks against the utopian thinking, that's why I was just, I was, all of the, look, I started talking about this before it even came up because all this stuff, I was like, what the fuck are, what are you on, Jordan? Well, I don't, you know, he, he said Hobbesian, you know, um, well, Hobbes, or was it Hobbes or Rousseau? Who is the man is born free, but everywhere he's in chains? Is that Hobbes or Rousseau? Look at all the people who are saying that I'm getting Jordan Peterson's argument wrong here. Like, well, how is it, how is this not explicit, Sitch? How, it, it, he's saying society is not predicated on force. That's the argument me, that he's making, right? Let me go back. So, me... Of those traits, and that's when it becomes malevolent. And that's when the problem of force starts to become paramount. Because I, I think, I think that you're, I think that your fundamental presupposition was both Hobbesian and ill-formed. I do not believe that the basis for the civilized polity is force. Now, you're saying that, you know, you can't abjure the use of force entirely. And I would say, unfortunately, that's true. I would agree with you. But okay, okay, okay. Thank goodness. He says you can't, you've got to have some level of force. Okay, so then what's the, okay, so if he agrees with that, then what's, what is the exact argument that he's making then, I guess? That just yeah. is not, like, that the, I mean, that's why I said, like, I don't know what he means by that, because if, if he's if he's making the argument is that, like, society's not based on force, I would maybe <laughs> agree I, with that. I, I guess it depends would on how to define that, like, because I'd say society's based on cooperation, maybe, but then cooperation. It's forced cooperation. I, You're I would totally say that, coerced into it. What are you yeah, talking I don't, about? I, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can remove force. I don't think i could remove force from the entanglement of culture and society and all these things like i it's think they're coercing too around every yeah it's coercion right. around every corner i mean we do our best to hide it to make everyone believe that they're you know you're you're paying your taxes as a good citizen you know contributing to the to the common good right mm -hmm. and if you don't we're gonna throw your ass in jail right i mean i just mm -hmm. look Try not to think about it too much, but it's there. Look, this libertarians and they do focus on it more than most people do, and I think probably to their detriment because you know they're going to die of stress or whatever. But but if the if the policy isn't invitational, uh -huh. if I can't make a case that that oh God, please make taxes okay, invitational. Wait, wait, okay, so, hold, hold, please, me, I, I, I gotta hear the whole argument please sitch make taxes invitational god oh my god it would be nice the world and that's when it becomes malevolent and that's when the problem of force starts to become paramount because i i think i think that your i think that your fundamental presupposition was both hobbesian and ill-formed i do not believe that the basis for the civilized polity is force now you're saying that you know, you can't abjure the use of force entirely. And I would say, unfortunately, that's true. I would but, agree with you. But if the if the policy isn't invitational, uh -huh. if I can't make a case that that's powerful enough for you to go there voluntarily, then the policy is flawed. Now, it may be that we have some cases where we can't do better than a flawed policy because we're not smart enough. And uh -huh. so, OK, wait. so I think, OK, I think he's making a different argument. And maybe he's walked it back from the debate argument, or maybe it's the argument he meant originally and got sidetracked. I don't know, because he's making a he's making a different argument. Because the original argument he made seemed to be, and at least the way that Destiny was reacting to it, was that you can't have you shouldn't have any policy based on force. Now yeah. he's making a different argument, saying, "Well, there you will have things that are based on force." But at least you should be able to argue them, like 
that people should want to do them voluntarily, right? Even if it is inevitably based on force. And that's a very different position, right? So like you could argue that you shouldn't steal and everyone would agree to that even if they're still going to do it, right? People would still voluntarily say, okay, I will voluntarily choose to be part of a system where stealing is like bad, right? But mm-hmm. then obviously still p- people will still try to steal when the situation arises. So it seems to me he's making kind of a, a distinction between the original position, at least it seemed to be that he was saying. He's saying that you should be able to argue, even though the force is there, you should be able to argue that it shouldn't be there or that you should do it You should be able... Okay, so you, you, it sounds like he's saying that you should be able to articulate your society or the rules of your society in such a way that people in some state of mind or in a neutral state of mind would voluntarily agree to participate in that system without be or participate in that law or follow that law without, without having being to be coerced. forced into doing it. Even though ultimately they are being coerced. Yeah, or, or yeah, even though ultimately if they end up violating that there is some coercion, you know, coercive element there, some force element there. Which okay. that makes a little bit I mean that makes a lot more sense than the thing that it sounded like he was saying, you know, twenty minutes ago. So Well, I agree. You should make things sound voluntary. <laughs> you should make people <laughs> believe that their participation in society is voluntary. Right. I think they'll be happier. I think society will be better functioning. I, just don't I think, think about what, it too much. It's like a time travel movie, guys. Just don't think about it too much. I, I think if if what I just said is Jordan's position, I think he needs to make it like a lot more clear right. what he's yeah. saying. Because I think it is a much more complicated, subtle uh, concept and what it seemed to be what he was arguing 20 minutes ago, which kind of led down this whole sidetrack. I could just be maybe too charitable. Yeah. It's, right. it's very possible being well, too good faith carrier. I don't know. It's fun. It's fun either way. Right. Maybe the incarceration of, mo- of criminals with a long-term history of violent offenses is a good example of that. We don't know how to invite those people to play. Uh-huh. They, they have a history... F- generally from the time they're very young children, from the age of two, of not being able to play well with others. And it's a very, very intractable problem. There's no evidence in the social science literature at all that hyper-aggressive boys by the age of four can ever be socialized in the course of their life. The penological evidence suggests that if you have multiple offenders, your best bet is to keep them in prison till they're 30. And the reason for that is It might be delayed maturation, you know, biologically speaking, but most criminals start to burn out at around 27. So it spikes, it's a big spike when puberty hits, and then stability among the hyper-aggressive types. So actually what happens is the aggressives at four tend to be aggressive their whole life, and then they decline after 27. Uh The normal boys are not aggressive. They spike at puberty and go back down to baseline. Right. And so you don't really rehabilitate people in prison for obvious reasons. I mean, look at the bloody places. There are great schools for crime in in large. But if you keep them there until they're old enough, they tend to mature out of that. Except the worst of them tend to mature out of that predatory, short term oriented lifestyle. So, yeah. yeah and they, that's disagree. the force I think, issue. Yeah, like, I agree. I agree. So I fundamentally to, to clear uh, my my um, I guess my stance up. I agree that fundamentally you're not building society on force. Uh, if for no other reason, because there'd be so much friction, it would fly apart at the seams, right? You, you can't force it. You get resistance if you use force. And then look, he, then he totally gives in. <laughs> Dusty, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> then he totally gives in to this wacky argument. What happened to the old Destiny? <laughs> Don't let him get away with his shit. Talk about taxes. <laughs> What's going on? I guess Destiny's in favor of taxes. So well, well, really... okay. So, but yeah, but taxes, tax. Okay, but yeah, but taxing is at force because like you vote for your representatives who establish the taxation, right? Maybe that's what they mean by fo- like. So you're voting for. I mean, it's still enforced. That's what I'm saying. I don't know clearly what what he means when he says force. Yeah, 
when they talk about enforcing the tax code, like, why do you think the word force is in the word enforce? No, but like when he means force, does he just mean something that's established upon you against your will? Coercion. By, yes. By a, but wait, by a higher coercive element society that you have no control over and that no one has any control over? Oh, okay. Is that what it means look by at force? You, look like, at this. I don't Good know what he's Gary's what in, the, in the house I here. don't know. I don't know. What, like, it's just, it's not clear to me what's being discussed in this conversation. You're making, you're, you're saying, look, it's coercive, but you do have a say in it. You're one little vote in three well, million. Well, no, that's, I, that's what I'm trying to understand. Otherwise, the argument doesn't make any sense to me. Because yeah, because because you are yeah, tax taxation is coercive, but you vote for the policies that create the taxation. So is it so so? Are, would you say that it's no longer force at that point? What if you didn't? What if the person you voted for didn't win, and you don't have the tax policies you want? Is it force at that point? Like so? Yeah, I don't yeah. understand exactly. Well, what a lot of libertarians say, "Look, I I won't vote. Don't tax me. That's fine." Sure, sure. Yeah. I just, I can't believe this thing's like, okay, I agree. Right. What? Fundamentally, we're building yeah. off of cooperation. You want to invite people to participate in society. I agree with that. I just, I feel like once you start to hit certain thresholds or certain points and you've got so many different types of people involved, um, at some point, we're going to have to have force around the edges on the guardrails just to make sure that we don't allow, are you familiar with like tit for tat systems? Very. Yeah. Tit for tat is probably a really important part of our evolutionary biological history and an important part of the animal kingdom. And I think to some degree, that tit for tat punishment is important. Is that to, force or justice? Uh, you can call it what it is. No, but, no, no. I'm curious mm -hmm. what you think. I'm, I'm very, this is a very serious question. Yeah. Because the tit for tat, the tit for tat is very bounded, right? It's yes. like, you cheat, I whack you, and yep. then I cooperate. Right. Yeah. So, and, and I do think that there's a model there for what we actually conceptualize as justice. Sure. It's like you don't get to get away with it, but the goal is the reestablishment of the cooperative endeavor as fast as possible. Of course, I agree. But in a reductionist way, we're kind of just using. Okay. See, this is why I said this is the problem <laughs> with all this stuff is because this is kind of like we're going into the weird realms of like Jordan. Peterson defining things in very unique ways. Yeah. It's kind of like the conversation, um, the four hour conversation about truth you have with Sam Harris. Right. That basically got bogged down by like how we were defining truth in some kind of like, you know, novel way or a more novel way, I should say, than right. we're accustomed to. Because like if someone does something wrong and then you do a tit for tat thing it, it is justice but you're using force to enact the justice yep like that's, Coer that's coercion how, right you're using coercion to enact the justice so i don't that's why i'm saying i don't know what jordan means when he says force in this context in this conversation really at all yeah in the truth conversation there's a lot more gray area when you're talking about truth i just feel like with the coercion topic here things are pretty clear I mean, it's clear when you're being, when there's coercion involved and when there's no coercion involved. Well, not if, right? if you're making some distinction between force and justice, then I don't know if there is clear, because then I don't know what you're talking about at that point. What are we, if you're making a distinction between force and justice, then that means that you're inherent, you're saying that inherent in your use of force means it's not, an, means it's an unjust use of force? Right, but we can think of all kinds of situations where there is absolutely no coercion at all. Right? Of course. Yeah. Of course. No, but th that's not my point. My point is that it's just if he, I'm saying if that Jordan Peterson is making a distinction between the the words force and justice, as if these are two different concepts. Right. That yeah, means no, that he's a, using the word force in a weird way. Yeah. No, and I get that. I totally yeah. get that. Yeah. Well, I, I'm saying using it in that weird way is not helpful. I agree. There's not as much wiggle room as there is with a, a concept like truth. I agree. Because I think coercion is it's clear. It's definitely sure. clear when there is coercion and when there is no coercion. Right. Right. But he's he's using like these these um edge cases where it's like, well, there is some coercion going on here, but it's justified coercion. So therefore, mm -hmm. is it really coercion? Yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Sure. But I mean, we could just clearly talk about cases where it is coercion, like pay your taxes or go to jail, right? Yes. Or yeah. non-coercion, like I have this nice car. Would you like to buy it? Oh yeah, I love nice cars. Here, let me buy it. Mm -hmm. Right? No coercion. 
Now, when you have to register that co car, coercion, right? <laughs> like, it's very simple. When you have to buy your license plate, yeah. Yes, coercion to drive right. it on the street. Coercion, right. right? Yeah. Using justice here as a stand-in for force, right? Well, because a, I don't. Because a tit, well, a tit I for tat system. That's a good. A tit for a tit. So there are different types of tit for tat systems, right? You've got tit tit for tat. You've got tit for tat tat. You've got there's all sorts of type systems where maybe you'll let somebody make a mistake one or two times, but you can't have a tit 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 system because then somebody could come in and take advantage of it. Yes, so that, which is the problem with the compassionate left, exactly. by the way. For, to some extent, sure it can be, mm -hmm. um, or a problem with the right that's far too forgiving of Donald Trump. <laughs> um, but I would say that that tat part, the, you can call it justice. I think justice is a perspective of force, right? Where some people might consider a force to be just the cop that arrests the murderer. And other people might consider that force, that tat to actually be injustice because the, the murderer was responding to environmental conditions, blah, 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 or was yeah, penalized whatever. That's a stupid theory, that Which, responding to environmental conditions theory. Because well, I mean, here's it why it's, no, it's not. It well, I mean, because essentially that's Rittenhouse's so, self-defense so, is, so is here's responding why. With, with violence. So if you assume that there's a causal pathway from early childhood abuse to criminality, uh -huh. let's say, which is... So did we just get... <laughs> we just got sidetracked into a completely different conversation. <laughs> like, instantly. <laughs> like, as, instead of trying to understand what the fuck this force versus justice thing, now we're on, like, well, what causes criminality, the environment, or, you know... Well, yeah, like, look, so, yeah. I don't like the topic bingo. I like to right. zero in on a topic. Right, right. Especially when we abandon a topic before we've ever <laughs> really reached any kind of comfortable resolution. Right, right. So, but you know, it is what it is. What are you going to do? Look, you're hanging out with Jordan Peterson, right? That's so many true. times in this conversation, I keep thinking, man, if Destiny was on mushrooms right now, this would be so trippy. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck is happening? What is going on with Jordan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that carpet's pretty intense. If you were on shrooms, I don't think you could pay attention to the conversation. Of course. Look, Jordan <laughs> seemed to really like Destiny. He seemed to really warm up to him. Mm. Yeah. You think so? I don't know. He's pretty angry about the COVID stuff. Yeah, but I, I, I think of, it seemed to me like a bit of showmanship was going on. So and I don't think so. I I think it's he's extra emotionally reacted to it because of his own experiences with like the medical industry. That'd be my guess. Because he got because he had addicted all addicted to like S SSRIs and or yeah, or the anxiety yeah. medications or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, sure. That sucks. It does. The test case for environmental determination of. The proclivity for the exploitation of others okay then it spreads it spreads near exponentially in populations that isn't what happens so here here's the data most people who abuse their children were abused as children but most people who are abused as children do not abuse their children and the reason for that is because if you were abused there's two lessons you can learn from that one is Wait, on. identify I gotta, with the i gotta hear that again but yeah. exponentially in populations. That isn't what happens. So here, here's the data. Most people who abuse their children were abused as children. But most people who are abused as children do not abuse their children. And the reason for that is because if you were abused, there's two lessons you can learn from that. One is identify with the abuser. The other is don't... Never right, exactly. And what happens... And if this didn't happen, every single family would be abusive to the core very rapidly. Yeah. What happens is the proclivity for violence is self, it, it dampens itself out with it as a consequence of intergenerational transmission. So the notion that privation is a pathway to criminality, that's not, that's not a, that's not a well-founded, that's not a well-founded formulation. And, and there are an infinite number of counterexamples, and they're crucial. Uh -huh. and some of the best people I know, and I, I mean that literally, are people who had childhood so absolutely abysmal that virtually anything they would have done in consequence could have been justified you know and they chose not to turn into the predators of others and that was a choice and often one that caused them to reevaluate themselves right down to the bottom of their soul and so that casual association of relative poverty even with criminality we know also we know this too you take a neighborhood where there's relative poverty the young men get violent. They don't get violent because they're all hurt and they're victims. They get violent because they use violence to seek social status. 
And so even in that situation, it's not, oh, the poor, poor. It's no wonder they're criminal because they need bread. It's like, sorry, buddy, that's not how it works. The hungry women feeding their children don't become criminals. The extraordinarily ambitious young men who feel it's unfair that their pathway to success become violent. And that's that's 100% well-documented and generally by radically left-leaning scholars. Sure, so, I don't disagree with any of that. Wealth inequality. I, I think that's... 100% true. And I wish in our political conversations in terms of like like understanding crime and things that that, that was the understanding of both the left and the right. When obviously it's not. I do think the left is too enamored with the myth of like you know as as actual just where he says like the Aladdin scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. All um, crime is from derivation of resources. Right. When it's like, well, it's, you know, when you have uh, environments where status is gained via antisocial behavior, you know, you shouldn't be surprised that you have lots of young men engaged in antisocial behavior to seek sad. I think that's completely correct. Yep. Yeah. In areas is a much better predictor of crime than, than poverty, than absolute Right, poverty. but it's course, a very yeah. specific form yeah. of crime. It's sure. status-seeking crime by young men, mm -hmm. right? Well, but, but that shows you what the underlying motive is. It's not even redress of the economic inequality. It's actually the men striving to become sexually attractive by gaining position in the dominance hierarchy. Well, There's I think nothing you have to the be, least have to bit be, about I think you have to be really careful with that assessment, though, because you can say that it's not economically... Uh, it's not seeking economic. Why do you have to be careful? The biggest because predictor because, of a because, male. Well, because we're assuming that people that commit crime in these types of circumstances are status seeking and not trying to seek uh, economic remedy. But That's it might exactly be exactly what we're assuming. But it might be the case, for instance, that in economically prosperous areas, that the men there aren't actually seeking economic prosperity. They're also just trying to elevate status, but they do it through economic prosperity. It's potential, right? They do it. They do it with a longer term vision in mind. Sure, sure they're trying to elevate. I wouldn't disagree mm -hmm. with that. In, in the least, sure. but they do it with a much longer time horizon in in mind, and we know this partly because I, I, I'm confused as to what Destiny's point was because it's true, but he's bringing it up as if it's a counterpoint. But it's not; it's just obviously that I means it's just true, right? Well, this this is why, like the the Western capitalist system is better, is because you're you're channeling that will to status into some productive pro-social like, behavior yeah, yeah exactly sure exactly well and also i mean in a, it plays heavily into dignity versus honor honor culture yeah right like well, if you're existing in a dignity culture generally engaging in sort of like anti-social criminal activity is seen as an undignified action to to gain you know status and wealth yeah, of course. Yeah, that's a way. That's a good point because it's a great way to lower your status, not gain status. Yeah, right. But that right. is that is the capitalist framework. Yeah, so you're, you're yeah. doing good in the world, and therefore you elevate your status through doing good for more people. Right. Yeah. Right. There have been detailed studies of gang members, for example, in Chicago, who are trying to ratchet themselves up the economic ladder, but they do it with a short-term orientation. Most of them think they're going to be dead by their early 20s. Sure. So they're trying to maximize short-term gain. So it has nothing to do with the, with the redress of economic inequality, except in the most fundamental sense. And it is status-driven because they're, they're looking for comparative status. Sure, I, understand what you're I, just, I don't think any human being has baked in a desire to seek economic prosperity. I think that that's like a third order thing that we look for. And fundamentally, it's probably more like safety, security for ourselves, and then status seeking for other things. I think like, that changes when you have children. Um, no, well, I mean, the safety and security would extend to your children. Is irrelevant or start Did he, he just say that it's not inborn people want economic security? So weird. Well, no, he, he means is that it's a, he's saying it's third order. So like people want safety or they want status like first or second order. But then, like the way that that materializes in our society is via economic um, security. Security, right? So it's like, like people aren't born like I want money. People are born like I want to be safe. How do I be safe? Oh, I have to have money, right? Right. Okay. Starts to become irrelevant at that I, point. I mean, depending on how you view your status, right? 
<laughs> you can't do that every time we have a discussion. Sure, you know, well, I'm just saying, for instance, the one of the important things for my term. child is to be able to send my child to a good school. I need to have an elevated status, right? I need to be able to buy a house in the right school district. Or I need to be able to pay the education. Right, but go. you're not yeah. telling me, I hope, mm -hmm. that the driving factor behind your desire to care for your children is an elevation in your status. No, but I'm saying that the elevation of status might be what allows you to take care of yourself. So, for instance, one of the biggest predictors of getting... Isn't this argument basically based on Jordan Peterson saying crime is driven by status-seeking young males and Destiny trying to argue, even though it's not explicit, argue that it's driven by poverty, deprivation of resources? Well, the thing is that they're both, tr they're both correct, sort of. Yeah. Well, so look, I, I would say more crime, maybe 90% of it is driven by status seeking young males than deprivation. Well, what I mean by that is that they're both correct. They're correct in different ways. So I think Jordan is correct in terms of like, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of status seeking uh, young males and also young males that exist in a system where playing by the rules is seen as being lame and pathetic, right? Right, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, because you can, if you're going to constitute that all that behavior as status seeking, then I agree. That is like the primary drive for most crime, I'd assume, um, or most, let's say, like property crime, right? Sure. Or even yeah. assault, right? But like, we'll just say most crime. Okay, most crime is is from status seeking young males. Um, but the where the, the poor thing comes into play here. And where I think you could say that that also is true is because, as I said, as you know, as Destiny said, and, and we tend to agree, is that because it's an honor culture, because it's an honor culture, and because what it means and the way it means in order to gain status is by being basically in social, rules, yeah. where if you exist in an upper middle class area or a rich area or a dignity culture area, to accomplish the same thing is going to be like the exact same motivation to accomplish status and security is going to be go seen it, as. Yeah behaving in a behavior that is pro-social, you know, going to school, getting education, getting a job, blah, blah, blah. Completely different. You're going to um, go about it a completely different way. You're going to try to get a job. You're going to try to move yes. up the corporate ladder. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Right. So you basically have, you have humans that are, are wired to try to accomplish the same thing, but their environment and their cultural environment has basically crafted very different outcomes for trying to achieve the same goal, essentially. Yeah. Which is, that's the giant problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 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 Yeah. It's interesting because the argument most leftists make doesn't take into consideration anything you've said. Like the, they're, they simplify the argument down to poor people need stuff and they steal it. Right. And that's, that's like, that's totally untrue. Like well, the, mm -hmm. what you just laid out is completely different than that. You're saying, look, poor people have a different way of achieving status than rich people. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. sure there are some people that steal things because they require them. Um, but I don't think it's like the overall, the average, the norm. And yeah. there are other ways to, to generally get resources without theft. I, I think the less problem is that when it comes to like, when we're talking about like uh, crime and poverty, the left wants to ignore things that can't that can't be solved easily by um government involvement or by resource redistribution right so they ignore those elements and then the right ignores anything that maybe would be solved by resource <laughs> redistribution and government involvement so basically because they just basically want what they want so i, I, I don't necessarily it. I don't necessarily agree with that just because there are tons of places where mm -hmm. the left tries to change culture, obviously like, um, representation in movies and stuff like that. That's like actively trying to change culture. It's not, um, mm. it's not government policy, right? Yeah, right. No, you're correct. I, I said specifically in the element, the rate in the realm of crime and poverty. Right, but they could um, work on changing the culture. No, but via yeah, movies no, that's that's a good that's yeah. a good point. And and the reason they don't is because they don't want to get called racist. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, that yeah. is very true. That is very true. We got to make those movies, Sitch. We can do it. We can change this culture. We can rid ourselves <laughs> of honor culture forever. It'll be great. We'll be superheroes.
We'll get that $10 billion from the government. It's on the list. It's got to be somewhere. Well, I think that's, and I, I think that's kind of maybe as part of the problem in terms of, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you change or if, you, how, like, how does a culture change from being an honor culture to a dignity culture? Like, I don't even know how that is accomplished, if that's even possible. Hmm. You got to make it cool to be square. I mean, that's the thing. You got to make mm -hmm. being a rebel rule breaker uncool, which is, that's, that is a tall order. <laughs> I don't know. Being a rebel rule breaker just strikes me as innately cool. So maybe it's impossible. We'll think about it. Yeah, we'll but, well, but here's this. the question. So like, is Japan an honor culture? Or dignity culture, or are they just outside? Are they some kind of weird amalgamation of both? Yeah, hmm. I don't know much about Japan, so it's hard for me to delve in. Honor, honor culture is basically the gist of it is you have to protect your honor with physical force. So this is why you get people who are like, you looked at me funny, I'm going to beat the shit out of you, right? That's honor culture. Dignity culture is you're supposed to shake off slights. You know, you're not supposed to resort to physical violence. Physical violence basically lowers your status. So that's a that's a, probably the biggest distinction between honor culture and dignity culture. Hmm. Well, I, I, that's not hmm. that's not how I view it, the, the distinction. Okay, what's um, a, what is the big distinction to you? The way I view it is like that the honor culture is sort of your importance is the importance in your place in society is sort of more heavily based on can like is more based on like can be taken away and, and granted to you via the people around you or the dignity culture is more about like you're you as an individual have your own independent worth. Yeah, that's part of it too. Exactly. Okay. Your, re your reputation is inbuilt and yes. where an honor culture is more like your reputation is, is bestowed on you by the people around you. So if somebody looks at you funny and you're a chump and you don't kick their ass or you just take it like a, like a pussy, then that is going to re affect your reputation. You're going to want to fight against that. Right. No, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. So, so yeah, if someone calls you out in an honor culture, since your worth is granted to you by the people around you, that's right. a slight. They're taking it away from you. Yeah. They're diminishing right. your reputation. Where yeah. in an honor culture, if somebody calls you, you know, you, you see this all the time, even on YouTube, people are like, what? Just because I called you names doesn't mean, you know, you're supposed to just have thick skin and not care anything about that. Right. Right. Yeah. That's dignity culture all the way. Yeah, yeah. Where the dignity culture is like someone, uh, you know, calls your name or whatever, and then if you engage in a physical act against them, it's like you you could be losing your dignity to them by engaging the physical action. Right. I triggered you. Look, you're so exactly right. Your, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Two very, now obviously, very different cultures. Now, obviously, no no culture exists like purely one way or the other. No person exists purely one way or the other. There are times where people enact, quote, honor values and times where people enact dignity values. But I think there's like general, you know, overall things shift in one direction or the other, essentially. Um, yeah. But to kind of to, to answer your question, I mean, I think you're right. You have to make honor. Maybe this is a problem. I don't know if you can transform an honor culture into a dignity culture, you know, quickly or any sort of time scale. I don't know how that manifests itself. Maybe, and you're saying the way would be to you try to make it so that the honor, you have to make the honor be being square, being cool, is what you're saying, essentially, right? Well, I mean, the sociologists have studied this, and a lot of people, a lot of them say that the South is still very much an honor culture. Yes. And the, the like the Yankee North is the dignity culture. So it is. Yeah. Right. But then, even then, you could have like, so you can have in the South, you can have in Japan, you know, you talk about like, you know, there's a lot of honor and like, you know, you just the same word, but, me. I can right, see but there's a lot Japan. of honor in like being honorable. There's a lot of honor in like, I, you know, it is my honor that I must protect the weak. I must protect those that cannot protect themselves. You know, I am like the honorable samurai warrior, like stereotype, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Or I am the honorable southern gentleman, you know, who, you know, 
will offer hospitality to the person that needs it when their car breaks down. And, you know, like, so there are definitely ways you can construct honor cultures to be pro social. Right. Um, and I think maybe that's maybe that's kind of the problem is that a lot of the lefty people who are trying to fix these sort of problems are not looking at that perspective. They're basically trying to force a dignity culture lens onto lower income honor culture lenses that don't work because they're not compatible. And so they have to fashion a a pro-social honor culture, a a pro-social honor culture that can basically be implemented in certain environments of the country. This is a very interesting point because I do see a lot of the conservatives using that dignity culture lens on an honor culture situation and not really getting the miscommunication there. And it really is. It's, it's like two completely different, <clears throat> two completely different ways of seeking status. Both are st- seeking status, right? Right. But seeking status in an honor culture way and a dignity culture is the opposite of how you seek status. So that is the miscommunication that goes on. But it mm-hmm. is interesting. All right. Back to this. Married is, is already status achieving status or a- position? Well, I, that, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying there's like a, there's a, I know all of these things kind of play into it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Look, mm-hmm. we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're I, okay, smart. Wait, real you're quick. smart. Yeah, just go back. You're I want to say that, that tit for tat thing. I was just saying yeah. that the tat thing, there is some underlying built into probably our genes, right? Because we see it all throughout the animal kingdom that there's some level of punishment or justice. some level of force. You can call it's it justice. justice. No, but, but I think, mm-hmm. I think it's the right. It's I really justice think when it's... you're the tatter, not when you're the titter though, <laughs> right? No, when you're the no, titter, no. it's just retribution. No, 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 no I don't yeah. think that's true either. Look, if you read Crime and Punishment, for example, one of the things you see that emerges when Raskolnikov gets away with murder. And it's a brutal murder, and he gets away with it. It's completely clear, and he has a justification for it. And what happens as a consequence is that that disturbs his own relationship with himself so profoundly that he can't stand it, such that when a just punishment is finally meted out to him, it's a relief. And that's not rare. And that is, like, there isn't anything more terrifying. This is why Crime and Punishment is such a great novel. There isn't anything more terrifying than breaking a moral rule that you thought you had the ability to break and finding out that you're somewhere now that you really don't want to be. And then that, you know, you know, there's nothing worse in your own life than waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. If you've transgressed against a moral rule and now you're an outsider because of that, you live in no man's land. The fact that you have just retribution coming to you. That can be a precondition for your atonement and your integration back True. into society. But it's probably important to note that depending on the system you exist in, those moral transgressions just aren't, right? So to take it back to, I'll use your leftist example, you might consider a uh, threat of force for somebody to get a vaccine to be a highly immoral thing that might be a transgression against some fundamental moral thing, but a person on the left might think that they're actually satisfying their moral requirement to society by doing so. Much the same as a child soldier, or or, or not, I won't use child soldier, but maybe an older person that's committing intifada or some kind of Islamic terrorist thinks that they're fulfilling some moral calling as well. No right? doubt, no doubt that that's the case. That's why I was focusing in on the use of force, is sure. that I think it's a rule of, a good rule of thumb policy that if you have to implement your goddamn scheme, with force, then there's something wrong with the way it's formulated. Does it there's bother no that every reason religious... we could have used we could have used a pure invitational strategy to distribute the vaccine. It would have been much more effective, and it was bad policy. Rushed. We're in an emergency. We have to use force. It's like no, no, you weren't. It wasn't. It wasn't the kind of emergency that justified force. Not least because behavioral psych. Do you think if if well, here's the problem. Because I, I maybe could believe, like, say that they didn't have any force element whatsoever. There are no lockdowns, right? There's no force vaccine mandates in any country or in any uh, environment or any business or anything to that uh, extent. Um, and they just said, okay, we made a vaccine. Take it if you want. Right. Maybe I could agree that more people were taking the vaccine. I, I could definitely see that. Because I think a lot of people are reactive to someone's forcing me to do it. I don't want to do it. So I, yeah. I do think that's true, but I don't think it it made. I don't think that's like logistically possible, because the 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 lockdowns happened way before the vaccine existed, and that was the issue. Like it took like a year, year and a half for the vaccines to even come into being, didn't it? 
And so like the lockdown and all that stuff was sort of what existed before the vaccines were even a thing. Yeah. And once you have the, the mandatory lockdowns, like, so once you had the mandatory lockdowns, even if the vaccines were not mandatory, I, I don't think people would have taken them. I, I don't think it would have made some substantial difference because it still would have been rolled into psychologically the vaccine the lockdowns. All that stuff got rolled in and conflated together in people's minds. So. Right. You're saying because they already mandated the lockdowns that even if you made the vaccines voluntary, a lot of people would just rebel because of the previous lockdowns yeah because one because as as you saw like so once the lockdowns and all that stuff started to become and it being implemented by force a lot of people didn't just say listen i'm anti-lockdown because i think i should have the freedom to choose it some people said that but a lot of people it was like that would be the starting point but mm -hmm. then there was sort of this well covid isn't actually that big a deal argument mm -hmm. would then get baked into whether it's true or not, would get baked into the anti-lockdown idea. And so if so once that idea gets baked into it, why would you take a, a vaccine, let alone a experimental vaccine, if you already think it's not a big deal? Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Psychologists have known for decades that force is actually not a very effective motivator. It produces a vicious kickback. So you know, one of the things this is going to happen for sure, you know, is that the net deaths from people stopping using valid vaccines as a consequence of general skepticism about vaccination is going to cause, in my estimation, over any reasonable amount of time, far more deaths than COVID itself caused. You, you violate people's trust in the public health system at your great peril, and you do that by using force, and we did that. And so you can see already that there's hordes of people who are vaccine skeptic, very this generalized skepticism that to some degree you were rightly decrying. It spreads like wildfire and no wonder, because if you make me do something, I'm going to be a little skeptical of you for a long time. You know, this conversation, we're here voluntarily, uh -huh. like we're trying to hash things out and in good faith, you know, but neither of us compelled the other to come here and neither of us are compelled to continue. And so that makes it a fair game. And a fair game is something that everyone can be invited to. And I suppose that's something that's neither right nor left, you know, hopefully, right? Something we could conceivably agree on. And I also think that I don't have any illusions about the fact that there are people on the right who would use power to impose what they believe to be their core, their core, what, their core, the core, what would you say? Their core idol. Of course, the, the temptation to use force is rightly pointed to by the leftists who insist that power is the basis for everything. It, it isn't the basis for everything. That's wrong. It's really wrong. But it's a severe enough impediment to progress forward that we have to be very careful about it. So, look, we have to, we have to stop. Sure, sure, yeah. I want to know if there's anything else you'd like to say before we stop, because unfortunately we have to stop rather abruptly. And so... Uh, I think, I, I, yeah, I feel like we got... I feel like we got pretty far into this. Um, what are you yeah. trying to accomplish? Let's start. We'll stop with that. We we found a little bit about we found out a little bit about who you are. I mean, you formulated your your proclivity in terms of to some degree in terms of delight in argumentation or facility at it, mm -hmm. which you certainly have. Um, the danger in that, of course, is that you you can be oriented to win arguments rather than to pursue the truth, and that's the danger of having that facility for argumentation. Sure. Nailed it. That's <laughs> the one part where Jordan Peterson just completely nailed it. Mm -hmm. But what are you hoping to accomplish by engaging in conversations like this in the public sphere? Elevation of status, you know? Absolutely. That's one possibility. Uh, no, I, I feel like... Um... I think debate or argumentation is good because it forces two sides to make their ideas somewhat commensurate to the other. Uh, if two people are having a conversation, they have to be able to communicate said ideas to the other person, otherwise it's just a screaming match. And I think there is a good, for the sake of like just being bipartisan or having a collection of people in a certain area and having different people together, just that in and of itself without anything else happening, I think produces a good, at least for a democratic society. Uh, for instance, like I would agree that uh, school, 
uh, maybe not faculty, but administrators are very, 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 very far left today. D to dangerously so. I don't have to talk to you about this, obviously. Um, but I think part of the responsibility to that, I think, rests at the feet of conservatives who, instead of uh, maintaining participation in the system, decide that they're going to throw their hands up and disengage. Uh, when I go and or I see... Or be forced out. Or be forced out, sure. In my case, That's for fine. Example. Yeah, sometimes it can happen. But I think that Often. rather than... Rather than accepting being forced out, or rather than uh, encouraging other people to disengage, the engagement has to happen. Mm -hmm. It can't be a, yeah. I'm losing faith in the system, so all of That's us are going right. to do our own thing. Well, it has to be like, no, we're going to be here in these conversations, whether you like it or not, because in a democracy, sometimes the guy you don't like wins. Sometimes the policy that you don't like is enforced. Sometimes a guy you don't like is somebody you have to share an office or a classroom with, and we need to be okay with that. And I'm worried that like the internet is driving people into these like very homogenous, but very so polar the, groups, the yeah. data on that, by the way, aren't clear. Like whatever's driving polarization uh -huh. doesn't seem to be as tightly related to the creation of those internal bubbles as you might think. Like I, I've looked at a number of studies that have investigated to see whether people are being driven into homogenized information bubbles. And it isn't obvious that that's the case directly, although it, the polarization that you're pointing to that you're concerned about, that seems to be clearly happening. So, and why that is, well, that's a matter of, you know, intense speculation. I feel like the homogeneity, I, I feel like it's not so much, the, this is not research-based at all, just a total feeling, yeah. that's all I admit that, but the feelings that I have is, it's not necessarily that homogeneity has increased, it's that homogeneity has increased as a byproduct of the bubbles becoming larger. So, for instance, it might be that I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, it's a, a town in, or a city, really, in Nebraska, right? It might have been that 50 years ago, uh, there are bubbles in living in Omaha, and there are different bubbles for living in Lincoln, and there might be bubbles in Toronto or neighborhoods in Toronto, or there might be bubbles in Vancouver, but now as the internet exists and things become more uh, internationalized, these bubbles are, it's not just a bubble that exists in these cities, now the bubbles have come together, yeah, and well, as a result of them coming together- that's another problem. Sure, yeah, mm. or a globalization problem or a communication yeah, problem, yeah. but you run well, into this issue where somebody might yeah. be in a particular city or state and have a really strong opinion about what uh, AOC says, but they don't know anything about their local political scene. And I think that that's an issue because the bubbles have gotten so large and they're encompassing so many people now, and you're expected to have like a similar set of beliefs between all of these different people now that might live in totally different places. That's, I think, a, a big issue mm -hmm. we're running into. Yeah, well, that could be, we'll close with this, I mm -hmm. think. That might be one of the unintended consequences of hyperconnectivity. Sure. Right? Is that we're driving levels of connectivity that we that get rigid and that we also can't tolerate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with that because I don't see these bubbles as any different than like the Christianity bubble or the Islam bubble or the Judaism bubble, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's just whether or not these new sort of belief systems are useful for people, whether or not they create a culture that is thrives and will thrive over time. I do think like new cultures emerge, just like new religions emerge, and they either stand the test of time or they don't. And I just, I think a lot of these new, like kind of leaning on your political system as your identity slash belief system, I think that's a relatively new phenomenon. Um, hmm. I mean, I don't know if it's new or if it's like the part of it that's new is that it's more widespread than it's ever been. Because I think there's right. always been the very politically active people, then that was how they define themselves. But the normie probably didn't define themselves via their political identity. And maybe the fact that other identities have fallen to the wayside, like religious identities or familial identities, maybe that's why political identities have subsumed it. I, I don't know the answer to that exactly. Because then also there's all these like, you know, the left is basically trying on a million identities like a hat every day. So, Yeah. Maybe, maybe the political identities were used, but they weren't like there were more over, there were more primal identities lower down. Like, you know, a lot of people could be Christian. Right. And then, your pol politics would be on top of that, but you would have the Christianity identity in common. So, you know, 
liberals and conservatives maybe disagreed politically, but they agreed religiously. So it took the edge off of the, the outside political identity where now yeah, it's yeah, more right. like those political identities are more like Christianity versus Islam where there's just right. no overlap. I agree. I, I do think that that what you're saying is true, completely mm -hmm. true. And then also that there was more of a unified external threat via other countries that Americans agreed was a problem, you know, whether it was, you know, the countries in world war two, whether it was the USSR, and those that external threat is kind of gone now, right? Or it's not exactly agreed upon what the external threat is. It's not so clear what it is, and so now when the external threat is gone, people kind of focus more on the internal tribalism and the internal threats, which is bad. Don't do that. Sure. Well, thank you very so, much for coming in today. That's much obviously the solution to our current problem with uh, tribalism and pol and the way the politics is right now is we need a giant Ozymandias squid. To just blow up, you know, a city. Yeah, a city that I'm not in. Hopefully, how about a migrant crisis? How about a migrant crisis? No, it's got to be a giant space alien okay. squid, not an alien from Central America. We got an alien from like outer space. Is it, is it an illegal alien squid? I mean, it's technically illegal. There was a no parking zone in New York where it exploded and killed millions of people. So nice, nice. Appreciate it, and um. You're a sharp debater and, and <laughs> good on so. your feet. So that's that's fun to see. And I do think that your closing remarks were correct, is that the the alternative to talking is fighting. Uh -huh. Right. So when we stop talking, it's not like the dis disagreements are going to go away. Yeah. We will start fighting. Yeah. Right. Probably and, and for talking, marriages too, even. Talking, right, right, absolutely. And talking <laughs> can be very painful because a conversation can kill one of your cherished beliefs and you will suffer for that although maybe it'll also help you uh -huh. but the alternative to that death by offense is death right yeah right so better to substitute the abstract argumentation for the actual physical combat for sure right. sometimes right. like the worst relationships are the ones where uh where couples fight a lot it's yeah like that's really right. bad ones are where they don't fight well, ever and then all of a sudden there's the, a yeah the couples, who, the couples <laughs> yeah. who fight and reconcile are exactly the ones that, yeah, yeah. yes exactly all right all right well that was good thank yeah, you very thanks. much and for everyone gotta get that makeup sex in man that's what there it's all go. about it's all about the makeup sex. it's all about the makeup sex okay. and watching and listening on the Oh, I guess that's it. Look, you want to talk about the little, the the little bonus that we saw on the Daily Wire? Yeah, the I mean, I guess you know you DM me, which I think I agree was was the interesting part of it. So if you want to talk about it, sure. Well, I just um, we <laughs> Destiny seemed to acknowledge in the bonus episode that well jordan first asked him you know why do so many people on the left why are they afraid to engage with conservatives and destiny says well that's because the left basically controls the culture and there's nothing but downside when you're in control of the culture the mainstream media hollywood all those things to engage with conservatives you can just drown them out by not engaging with them Right. Which I thought was, was interesting because I, uh, I believe that to be the case, that the left does control the culture, but I've heard Destiny before say that that's not the case. Well, it's weird because so, I've heard yeah. him say that that is the case. That's why right. I was kind of surprised when in our conversation he said it wasn't the case regarding media, and I was very confused. That's, that's why I seemed very debate-brained for him yeah. to say that because I've literally heard him say the opposite. And so, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was just funny because we had that interaction with him where he was saying that that wasn't the case. Right. And then obviously it is the case. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. The end. Okay. Okay. Let me read some supers. Also, I sent you Asif Artsy's comic that we oh, kept yes. neglecting to show. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, look, I think on Tuesday we're going to do Elon Musk versus Don Lemon. Right. If anyone is still interested, I'm super interested. So, yeah, I think Don Lemon made a giant fool of himself, and it's hard for me to imagine that Don Lemon will get any sort of 
traction with what he's trying to do. I mean, who wants to listen to Don Lemon's completely bubble brain perspective? <laughs> yeah, it was a really weird interview, and we'll talk about it on Tuesday. It was a really bad interview. I mean, I, I think there's ways to be like probing without being stupid. So yeah, which he failed to accomplish, obviously. So yeah, yes. Uh, Mary for twenty dollars. Thank you, Mary. Says I haven't watched Jordan since twenty nineteen. The debate sh- showed me his politics are truly unhinged. Love you, Sitch. Thank you, Mary. Love you too. Who's, uh, who's Spencer- unhinged? Uh, Jordan. Jordan. Okay, that's what, th- that's what they said. Uh, Spencer Harmon for twenty dollars says I'm like three hours behind. Peterson didn't just go through COVID like the rest of us. He nearly died because of benzos. It took him years to recover from what the experts prescribed. Yeah, what well, I don't know if that's because of COVID, but it was because of you know him what he was because he was taking benzos and all that stuff. So that's why I'm saying I, I would imagine that that is kind of why he's so emotional and uh, against a lot of the pharmaceutical stuff. And that's his position on it. So that does make perfect sense to me. Well, and, and I mean, I just, I acknowledge that COVID was not a giant deal for me, but I know that it was a giant deal for a lot of other people. So I, I don't feel qualified because I don't, I don't feel that pain in my bones from going through the COVID, mm-hmm. which I, I, since right, I don't know of if course. COVID was like a big deal for you. Yeah. Obviously there's a big difference. If you can work at home, it's yes. a huge difference than like, if you had to go in every day, wear a mask every day, it'd be fucking hell. You know, so those years of COVID would have been hell. Yeah. It'd be hell so, on yeah. earth. And I would never, I would never forget it. And I would never forgive. I'd be like yes. every day. hundred oh, percent. Yeah, sure. So I do sure. understand where people are coming from. Right. So, but they want me, a lot of times they want Sitch and I to pick up that mantle. And it's just, it's a lot harder to pick up that mantle when you're like, eh, I mean. Well, it's not my, I just feel like it's not my fight. I'm not going to. Yeah, exactly. It's not my fight. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Phil that remains. Hey, Phil, for $20. Phil says, I was right not to watch this. It was agonizing. Well, thank you for watching with us and sticking around. So, there you go. Agonizing? Really? I thought it was kind of fun, but. I mean, I, I wish, and you know, and this, and I do, you know, I think this is kind of Jordan's fault in terms of sort of the direction the conversation went. I wish that there wouldn't, I mean, I think getting bogged down in climate and COVID was just a huge mistake. Um, though I think Destiny brought up COVID, if I, if I remember correctly, and Jordan brought up the climate change stuff. But like, it would have been, I think, a lot more interesting to see them delve into kind of like the philosophical reasons of why the left and the right are sort of in the direction that they're in and where they think society is going as opposed to like arguing about climate change and COVID to me it's just such a waste of time yeah I totally agree I totally agree I would like to see the conversation steer more towards you know where we're at as a society I mean I did think the the force the force versus not force but we never got anything conclusive. we never got a resolution yeah exactly on what that but, even meant what was the resolution to that yeah, but i so. still think it was interesting just because i just i right. i've never i'm not sure i've ever seen jordan peterson get like debate brained but i just feel like that was debate brain yeah, yeah. i agree uh j mac our surrogate father for 50 dollars. thanks so much daddy j mac says i knew so many guys who didn't want to get the vax but were threatened that they would get a dishonorable discharge if they didn't. My wife was threatened and basically held in limbo until one day everyone just dropped it. Destiny greatly downplays this. Yeah, no, I that definitely seemed to be my uh, recollection of events at the time period. That even if there wasn't, you know, it wasn't like in uh, some other countries where the government said everyone has to do it, but they were doing it through these other mechanisms, you know, mil- whether it was military, whether it was through your job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is coercion. Yes. And I just, I think Destiny is greatly downplaying the fact that the mRNA va- vaccines just are categorically different. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so someone messaged me and explained the mRNA vaccines. Right. On Twitter. Let me see here. How the mRNA vaccines work is that the MR, in, mRNA is a copy of the DNA that makes a certain protein. We can create vaccines faster with this model. The cell in the body will take this mRNA vax and make the protein in order to train your body's adaptive immune system to recognize it. 
So, so it's a way to speed up. Otherwise they have to actually create the vac, create the protein that they're going to put in the vaccine, you know, synthetically and then create the vaccine that way. Interesting. Okay. So, so you don't introduce the whole pathogen, which can cause harm. We don't yet understand the long-term, uh, effect efficacy of these novel vax that's why i stayed away but in the covid vax the spike protein caused the immune system to overreact causing some lethal side effects so hmm. so just to just to act like oh yeah we've done vaccines for 50 years well yeah we have done vaccines for 50 years a completely different way right so this is kind of experimentation on a large population and look, if they came out and said that, if, if, you know, Fauci came out and said, oh, this is how they work. This is going to be so much better. <laughs> no one would have done it. Everyone would have said, yeah, fuck you. Yeah, right. Well, it was funny because I know that when like Trump was president and he was pushing Project Warp Speed, which was to, you know, to try to get these vaccines out quicker or as quickly as possible. I know so many people on the left that are like, I'm not taking that. Right? Yes, it was associated of course. with Trump. <laughs> and then when, when Biden's president, like all that just dissipated. And they're like, oh, I'm totally, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I thought you weren't going to take it because Trump was with Project Work Speed, you know? Well, you and so, I talked about this too. We were like, yeah. look, I mean, we're not going to be first in line. Right? No, yeah, right. <laughs> like, like, we're I'm not going to be first in line. I'm going to let it sit for a while before I, I take it. I figure, you know, maybe 15 million people vaccinated right, is a good right. number, right? Yeah. Maybe we'll wait a few you know, a week, a few weeks, a month, maybe make sure people aren't dropping dead like flies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, yeah, I think people did. The, some people, it's crazy because there's people that want to be those first in line to basically make sure it's safe. Right. Well, good for those people. Get out yeah. there and test it out for everyone. Yeah. I remember there's those weird people that are like sneaking in to, you know, take it like six times or whatever. There's that weird... Was it Barry Weiss? Didn't no Michelle not, Goldberg. Not I'm sorry, Michelle Goldberg. Yeah. yeah, didn't she like? She was part of like an experimental trial. Even she, she got in. She was so worried about COVID, yeah. right? That she got into a drug trial. Guess which drug trial she got into? The Johnson and Johnson. Oh, really? That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So she got she got early Johnson and Johnson vaccinated. And I don't know if you remember, but the I think the Johnson and Johnson may have been the traditional vaccine. It was. I thought. Yeah. 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 But it didn't work. It didn't work so, as well, supposedly. Yeah. Right. What See, that's why I say, like, I don't think, I, I think some, like, I mean, you look at her, you know, this is someone who's, I would, I would say that Michelle Goldberg is like a prime propagandist for the left. And I mean, she buys this stuff wholesale, right? Of course. That's why I don't b believe a lot of the conspiracy stuff. I think most people believe this stuff. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian for $50 for $50. Thank you, Brian says, I don't like, I don't like destiny's frame of the trust everyone has in a society. There's baseline trust. The argument is how much trust should we give to an establishment beyond the baseline, especially if they use force. That's Jordan Peterson's argument. Um, if that was Jordan Peterson's argument, I don't think he articulated it very well. Cause I don't, I didn't understand that to be his argument. I didn't understand that to be. So I, I still don't really clearly understand what Jordan Peterson's argument was, except for what I said. I think he was saying that you should basically be able to articulate things first and foremost without force, which I guess I agree with that, but I don't know. Society is better when it's structured completely voluntary cooperative, which I mean, I don't disagree, but it's never that crystal clear, right? I just, I, I'm not sure you can structure society that way, to be honest with you. Can you <laughs> talk no. about utopian? Sure. I mean, and this is like, we used to be the Jordan Peterson whisperers here. So I don't know. I just, I feel like he didn't really articulate what exactly. And maybe he's talked about this concept in other videos where he's kind of fleshed it out more to make sense. So, but at least in this conversation, I, I not clear to me what he meant. Yeah. And look, I, I would love a society like that. Forces, co force and coercion are terrible. I hate to be forced and coerced. Yeah. So I just, whether it's an open question whether or not society can function without any coercion so mm -hmm. yeah uh brian for for another 50 dollars. thank you brian doing a lot today thank you so much it says depends on how you frame taxes 
Is it forced to have to pay your electric bill? The same can be said for taxes to pay for the police, roads, and military. The problem is a lot of our taxes can't be tangibly shown in services rendered. Um, I guess yes, and well, I don't. Well, I mean, it's sort of because like, if you don't pay, I mean, you don't have to pay your electric bill, right? You just don't have electricity, but you have to pay your taxes, even though it gives you services. You still like have to do it, right? So I don't, yeah, I don't know if that's course. like I, I know I know what you're saying, Brian. It's not quite a one for one comparison, but I guess technically, if you live in poverty, you don't have to pay your taxes. So you could just like not make. You could tell your boss, "Look, I don't want to work longer than this because I don't want to make enough money to actually pay any taxes. I want to make like twelve thousand dollars a year." Right. You pay no taxes. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I guess you could do right. But no, I yeah. mean, I agree that the problem is that people can't perceive of, um, but we citizens can't really perceive of like the tangible service that our tax taxes go towards. That that is like the the main driver that affects us in terms of wanting to pay taxes and not wanting to pay taxes. So mm -hmm. you don't want to pay taxes, right, Sid? Of course I don't. Who wants okay. to pay taxes? Yeah, exactly. Look, right. I just checking to make sure you're not. One of those psychopaths. Nobody wants to pay taxes, but it's like one of those things you just go, okay. I mean, I guess you know you got to do it, right? Right. I understand, yeah. like the necessity of it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you want to avoid jail time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, no, I mean, I understand the necessity of like you need the government needs to be able to have you know to provide these levels of services, you know. Blah, blah, look, blah, blah, blah. Like again, right, look, it's it's difficult to say this because I know a lot of people believe in classical economics. So I know, I know, I know you're going to bring up MMT, right? I'm, I'm just without bringing to MMT. Okay. No, I'm not bringing up MMT. Oh, okay. I'm just saying, look, right now we have a lot of inflation, right? It's right. pretty obvious. We can all see the inflation. It's there. Yes. yes. I think a lot of the inflation is being driven by bad Fed policy mm -hmm. where. I think if the Fed just started lowering interest rates, I think inflation would go down. Mm -hmm. I think the fl inflation right now is being driven by high interest rates. So, right. But if we can get that inflation down, like let's say we get inflation down to two percent, maybe one percent, right? Okay. What is wrong with just starting to cut taxes until inflation, like, is a problem? Why not just you know cut taxes ten percent a year until, like, we might be able to cut taxes precipitously well are you with, saying before we get you, inflation are you saying okay like theoretically say we get inflation down to one percent because we mm -hmm. fix fed policy right right okay and then we say okay now that we've got inflation down to one percent let's cut taxes by ten percent every 10 year ten percent across the board right every across year. the board yeah what we're not going to change spending right that's what you're saying we're going to we're gonna not going to yeah why are we so, focused so much on spending? Let's just right. keep spending the same, cut taxes right. until we start seeing inflation. Right. So you're saying basically we're going to increase, we're going to, it's going to be like a test to see like what exactly is the level of debt we can incur <laughs> before we start increasing inflation, right? That's what you're suggesting. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I'm going to be an interesting study. But don't do. you think people be much, like, look, I agree. Everyone wants to complain about spending, but I, mm -hmm. I'm, I want to complain about taxes. Why can't we just start lowering taxes? That would People be a are very... too fixated on government spending, man. It's the taxes that got to go down. It would be a very interesting experiment to do that. But... We should do it. Look, imagine we go. So we, but, you know, you would be basically doubly increasing the rate of whatever that, like, whatever it takes to get that inflationary point. You'd be reaching it twice as fast. You think so? Essentially, yeah, because you're by by cutting taxes, you're lowering the reduction of the money supply and then of you're also course. right so then you, but then you're also spending and printing more money so you're increasing the money supply so well, not if, you get not to it spending twice stays the same though like the they keep elevating spending right as long as spending stays the same oh, well i yeah. mean okay but i'm saying by cutting taxes and, and, and increasing the money supply every year you're gonna double the rates that you're going to get to that. I mean, you're going to find whatever it is and maybe it's worthwhile finding it is, but I'm saying you can get there twice as fast. Well, it'd be, uh, if we're there f faster, that's better because then we can just keep the tax rates there. But look, right, I think we, we can, could, yeah, 
Sure. I think we could cut our taxes in half before we get any sort of substantial inflation. Hmm. I, I, I have no idea what the number is, but it'd be interesting to find it out. I think we're that overtaxed. I really okay, do. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. It's kind of crazy. Uh, J Mac, our surrogate father. Thank you so much. Daddy J Mac for the $100 says, God bless the human race. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Jim. much. That was when you were giving your, your touching speech. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Jay. Jay's listen. Jay understands. Okay. Yeah. We get it. Uh, Brian, sh thank you so much for the 20, 30, $40. Thank you. You know, those are three different, but I'll read them all together. I agree that the basis of civilization is an invitation. That's what makes society stand the test of time. It doesn't mean there's no force, but that's what makes society work is the invisibilization to create. That's mm -hmm. interesting. The invisibilization to create. Um, hmm. hmm. What does that mean? I don't know. Is What's the basis it? of civilization an invitation? I don't know. Well, I, I wouldn't say it like, well, here's the way I would think about it. The basis of liberal civilization is, is freedom. I would say it's freedom, but I don't think that's it. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's the same as invitation as an invitation because an invitation to me, the way that like that word kind of plays in my mind, it kind of creates the idea that like you exist outside of something outside of a system, outside of a location, and then you're invited to participate in it, which obviously that's not the way civilization works because you're born into the system. Right. And you kind of have to either participate, you have to participate in that, in that system or you have to leave and find another system because there's very few places you can just exist completely off the grid and not participate in any system. I mean, I guess you could theoretically, but it's you know, much more difficult to do that. So you have to participate somewhere. So I, I don't know if I would consider it an invitation, but I would still say it's free. It's a freedom because you still, we live in a system where you still have control over how the system is managed through our you know, uh, democracy, essentially. And our yeah. focus on individual freedom and rights as much as humanly possible. Look, I, I do think in the West we have minimized coercion far more than a lot of other societies. And in, in right, I mean they've done studies where they look at these authoritarian regimes, and they may not have explicit tax policy, but they often have various permits and things. They have ways of taxing their po populace. And if sure. you just do the straight numbers, I mean, Western style democracies do have high taxes, but these authoritarian regimes, the taxes are like 80 to 90%. So that's a way more coercion. I'm um, Brian for another $10. Thank you, Brian. It says, do you guys really think the American society is base and force? Do you, do you think the motto of government of the people by the people for the people is a myth? So, I, I mean, that wasn't really my, what was I was trying to say? I, I think I'm saying that the idea we're all going to exist in a society, a cooperative society, to me, is, in t is so entangled in the idea of force, I don't know if you can extricate them. When I say force, I just mean that, yes, we're, so when you have like the motto, government of the people, by the people, for the people, not, to me, that has nothing to do, that's not the counter to the idea of force. Yeah, force is wrapped up in that. Forces wrapped up in that because it's saying, okay, so like if the people vote for some law change and you don't like it and you don't follow it, well, then the force is going to come down upon you for violating the law. That's right. so that's why I'm saying I'm not, to me, it's not really clear what Jordan meant in the context of force whatsoever because any system, any rule system is going to have force be involved to maintain the rules. Otherwise, it's not going to exist as a system, it's going to fall apart. Uh, Brian from yeah. $10 says, do you guys think the idea of justice is biologically ingrained fair play? And if so, would it make sense to define the differences between force and justice? Well, I do think, I do agree that there's an innate sense of uh, fair play. There is an innate sense of reciprocal altruism. There is an innate sense of what is fair. Now, what 
and we've talked about this before. There's an innate people have an innate sense of fairness. Um, and that's why you got really upset, Adam, when you were criticizing Scott Adams for saying fairness didn't exist. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so triggering. In the past because we talked yeah. about this. Um, so like, yeah, there is an innate sense of fair, though what constitutes fair can be culturally determined. Um, but ag again, and, and I think this is like the problem, and this is why I didn't understand what Jordan meant by force. Maybe I don't understand what you mean by force. To me, f the word force is a neutral term it's just it's a neutral term it means something is forcing you to do something it could be a positive force it could be a negative force right like it's like the force you know the light side and, yeah. the, and the dark side coercion so, is the not is the negative term for force yes yeah. exactly exactly and so like that's why i was saying like you know the, the parent forcing a child to eat their vegetables like okay that's like a good thing right yeah of course um so you know the so to me for like and then so just justice is the idea of now while there is a while different cultures have different ideas of justice i'd say justice is generally the idea that like when a person transgresses society or some norm in some way some sort of punishment is enacted against them that is, you know, within the bounds of that society, essentially. Right. It's the it's it's saying like you've transgressed some law, some norm, some something, and here is like the the societally approved reaction Boot. to that. Okay. Yeah. So here's a societal approved reaction to that. Look, this, said, that okay. is reciprocal altruism right there. Sometimes it's pain. <laughs> Sure, sure. And I'd say that, okay, but the societal approved reaction to your transgression of the law is forced upon the person who transcribed it generally. Not always, but generally. Most people are not going to say, oh, I broke the law. Let me just walk into the, you know, the jail with my own free will, right? Turn They're myself gonna, in. Right. They, you need force to go bring that person in. That's why I guess I just, I don't really bring understand them what to justice. this definition of force is that we're kind of that Jordan was kind of fixated on the conversation. I'll be right back. Okay. Grendel Vat, thank you so much for the 50 gifted memberships. Thank you so much. Uh, Kachongo for $20 says, you might have had your life ruined, lost your job, and have been exercised from society, but the government didn't hold a little gun to your head, so was it really force? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair... Uh, Complaint <laughs> completely. I think this is a very complaint completely. Yeah, it definitely was uh, forced. Very various mechanisms. So, okay. Uh, let me start from the beginning here. Runes for 21 months. Thanks so much. Has stopped the show. I'm not ready. That's right. We started early today, boys. We started early. Uh, Christian Ball for five dollars says, "Did you guys see the actual Justice War and Vanguard boys beefing? You should get them back on and grill them." I didn't. S well, I saw. So, I saw that you know Anna had her very base take that we watched. That was about how uh, messed up it was that. Um, that the people that like basically had all the body parts and their bot and their home got I'm back by the way. So just... yeah, I heard you. Yeah, cool. Uh, that that all the the people that had like the body parts and got you know, um, basically off essentially. Yeah. Um, no bail. <laughs> with no, yeah, on like, bail, which was like crazy. Kill a fifty-year-old couple. Like, where's the mm -hmm. justice in that? They don't even. They're not even. They don't even stay in jail. Right. Right. Um. And then, and I and Sean clipped that, and you know, was kind of pushing it around, and then Anna retweeted it, and then I saw that the Vanguard boys who we talked to, um, they did a like couple a couple times. They've been on yeah, the we show talked twice. to them a couple times, yeah. uh, and I like talking to them, but they did like a video that was response to this. That I don't know if they did a second one, but the first one they did, like I thought, I thought it was in response to that. It was like um, talking about their copaganda or something. And I was like, I watched the video and it didn't even address 
the point about the bail reform or, or the specific point that Anna was making. So I just, I just seemed like a really like lame video because they were just kind of like making general statements without actually addressing the specific claim that Anna was even talking about. So, yeah. Yeah. It seems just like a nothing video. I didn't see if they then started beefing with Sean about it on Twitter, but I mean, yeah, maybe if, if you want, we could reach out to them and talk to them again about it. Cause I, I don't understand their complaint about, wanting people that have a bunch of body parts in their in their plumbing to be not out on bail right can't we all agree on that <laughs> like doesn't it weaken doesn't it weaken their movement if they're going to call anna complaining about that as copaganda doesn't that make them seem more unhinged like that seems to be playing into the exact thing that like that the left doesn't that w- that the left would want these people on the streets that's why i don't i don't understand what their position is it seems nonsensical to me yeah i think they are friends with ole and Olay is a huge like anti-cop, anti-establishment propagandist. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I do think Olay is an idiot. I think she's a she very is. stupid person. Yeah, and, yeah. Like it amazes me that, I mean, it just proves anyone can get a law degree. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. I just, I don't see how someone this dumb has a mm-hmm. law degree, so. But um, I think they're friends with Olay, and they just, since they're friends with Olay, they watch this Olay video, and Olay does a bunch of stuff. Uh, Sean actually responds to Olay. He, Sean made a response video to them, and it's more to Olay because Olay made this video and got basically everything wrong. So right. Sean did a great response to that. But, you right. know, it's this whole, they just have this intuition, right? Our friend is Olay. We trust right. her. You know, she has a law degree. So it's obvious, just obvious that everyone else around is wrong. So they're just playing into that intuition and just talking a bunch of mad shit. But they're kids, right? I don't know, look, the, I think those guys are like in their 20s, if not I in their early I don't 20s. <laughs> oh, really? I don't know. I don't remember how old they are. But... I feel like they are pretty young. The, okay. I responded because I, I responded to. Oh no, what's, uh, what is his name? It's like Zach and Gavin. I responded to Gavin on Twitter and said, you know, this is easy for you. Like you live in the Midwest, (laughs) like they, your police force is like four guys and a meter maid. (laughs) So (laughs) what the fuck? Why are you, why are you, why are you saying shit like this? Like, you know, we want to lock the criminals up and throw away the key and he responded by saying well no i actually live in like the big city kansas city or something like that and crime is outrageous i was like what the fuck how is that a response <laughs> <laughs> like explain that response to me Sid. right right That's no, not a good i live in, yeah. i live in the city and the crime is terrible mm-hmm. so then why the fuck are you advocating for people getting off that i mean if mm-hmm. you're literally in an area where people where crime is a problem then why are you why aren't you on our side i was right. like we should lock them up and throw away the key and he, i mean he responded something i can't remember what it was some cop again <laughs> but it was pretty funny but isn't that i mean that's just i was literally baffled by that response because <laughs> i, I mean, saw it's, yeah because it's you know it's one thing if you live in a small town you know nobody locks their doors you don't feel the effects of this policy but i mean if you do actually feel the effects of the policy and you're still like fuck it Mm -hmm. what's going on there sitch what's i don't know that's a good question we'll ask him we'll have to ask him what's going on there yeah this was pretty funny uh, sketch for twenty dollars for twenty months. Thank you so much. As my face when still no gold pyramid. You're you're getting close. Sketch. Okay. Oh yeah. Getting yeah, close. Yeah. You only need four more months. Sketch. Four more months. You're getting close. You can do it. I wonder how close I am. I don't know. Uh, Kid Truck ninety one for ten dollars. Thank you so much. Says, did you guys see the Vanguard boys shitting on Anna for her take against the N- the New York City laying the corpse choppers art? Choppers out. They seemed reasonably way back when on here, but they seem psycho on their own show. Yep. Yeah, we just talked about that. So, yeah, we should have them on because I'm curious to get the bottom of what's going on there. Look, we love talking to those guys. It'll be fun to have them on. So, right. Sure, I can message Gavin. Spencer Harmon for 23 months says one more month. There you go, Spencer. One month away. That's it. Bring out the gold. 
And there it is. CT for 24 months. Oh, at, my oh. God. Wow. Look at that. Happy anniversary. What did you get for me? Look at that. The golden here. Right. We got you the gold standard. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Just what you always wanted. What you always wanted. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Coco Beans for seven months says, can we talk about what on earth Jordan Pearson is wearing? What is this wacky jacket? Yeah, is it One Piece? Uh, I don't know. I, it kind of reminds me more of Dr. Fr what was his name? Dr. Fraser? Fr mm -hmm. the, the bad guy from The Princess and the Frog. Remember that guy? Yeah. He's got friends on no, the other side. That's remember. what Jordan Pearson's outfit reminds me of. But yeah, I don't know what he's wearing. It's I kept wondering if Destiny was wearing sweats. I was like, is he wearing sweatpants? Uh, I don't know. Was he? Destiny has this. Is it like a members only jacket that he wears all the time? I feel like it, lo it looks like a members only jacket. Like a black t-shirt and a members only jacket. Was it a jacket? I thought he was wearing. Oh, you're right. He was wearing. He is wearing a jacket. Yeah. 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 He's wearing a lot of black. Black on black on black. Look, if you were going to do a sit down with Jordan Peterson, what would you wear? Sit? What would your attire be? Um, I think I would wear a full lobster outfit. Oh, would you? Uh -huh. Yeah. I would like the claws and the headgear and everything. I think I would go with like one of those stove, stove pipe hats. Like oh, big, like full the on big the Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. I think that would be cool. Try, tall enough that it goes out of the shot. <laughs> like I want people to, <laughs> I want people to wonder how how tall is that hat? Mm -hmm. That's see, that's a that's that's well, that only be good if you were in a debate and you're trying to distract. If you were visible on camera while your opponent was debating to distract away from their point, because I would be too focused on where your hat ends. Right. Right. Yeah. You could do that. Yeah. Halfway through the debate, I want to take the hat off and pull it down and pet a little rabbit on top of it. Right, right. Or go full Hunter Hunter uh, Gone, where your hair is so long and it goes straight up that no one oh, sees yes. where exactly it, it ends. Perfect. Oh, yeah. I take the hat off and my have, I have a hairdo. There you go. Under the hat. That would be excellent. I don't know what the jacket... The jacket is weird that he's wearing. I, like To me, I look at it and it looks... Makes me think he's wearing like some kind of mythology jacket or something, but I can't tell what's going on. It's very weird. Uh, Mason Jordan for five months says, "Love the content we get. Love all the content we get. These uh, can't read. Love all the content we get in these days from you boys. Thank you, Mason. Have you all considered setting aside one stream for just entertainment that you're all consuming? We have, um, and we'll do. We're going to." Probably do something like that in the future, but yes, have we've had some time constraints at the moment. Those will Just get worked out. Entertainment, like, yeah. like yeah. Uh, movies and stuff. Yeah. Yes, I mean we do want to go see the Civil War movies coming out next month, right? I mean we're gonna, that's gonna be some fun. Oh God, <laughs> what do you mean? You know it's uh. gonna be uh. I mean, we're going to watch it. It's going to be cringe to sure cringe. Super cringe, yeah. And there was a new Beetlejuice trailer, which looked really not good, which is oh, sad. No. I, want, I, I want it to be good. No! But the trailer, I mean, it was kind of like enough. It was like a teaser trailer, so it's not like a like, nothing to really grab onto, but the... Uh-oh. So, but, I mean, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Okay. April 11th, it looks like. Yeah. Is a Civil War movie. Okay. I, thought, I saw some, there was review, nine, look, 31 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. 91%. The audience score is not out yet. Hmm. 91 per, that means it's, that's fresh. Yeah, we'll see. That's uh, John. <laughs> John Bender, thank you so much. It's a banner year at the Bender House. Thanks so much for joining the Free Wolf Seekers. There you go. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. Oh, bring up the, the comic so I can read it. Welcome. Comic? Okay. Yeah. Here it comes. It's up. Okay. 
What's going so, on in this comic? So Asif Artsy drew this comic. This was when we had What If All Hissed on. Mm-hmm. And there you see there's me and you, Adam, and there's What If All Hissed in the background. And mm-hmm. and I'm saying, have you heard of the wonders of psychedelics? Mm-hmm. The guy mm-hmm. shoves, the, slams the door in our face. Okay, oh, doesn't want ouch. anything to do with our psychedelics. Right. And then What If All Hissed says, allow me. And mm-hmm. then the door opens. He says, do you want to see the voice of God? And then suddenly the guy wants it. Right. He's like, give me them mushrooms. There you go. There you go. That's true. That's how it works. That's exactly how it works. I know. It worked okay. for me. Uh, Daniel Patrick for $5 says, any response to the latest Red Bar report about Adam? I hope the allegations aren't true, but the leaks look bad. Hope Adam will address this on stream. What is this? I don't even know if this is in relation. Is this me? Did I get in trouble? I don't know. What is the red I bar report? Works. Do you know what that <laughs> even is? No. What is oh, it? Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm assuming this is a like a meme or a joke, but I, I'm not familiar with what's not being uh, referenced yeah, here. Sorry. Uh, Eric for ten dollars says, "All I know is that we are effed." You guys making a Rumble channel, please. What happened? What? Uh, how are we effed? I don't know. Just like generally. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe one day. Do you want to do Rumble? I mean, we could experiment. Since, I guess if we want. Since you want to but... do Rumble with me, can we do both? Are you... Can you sim- can't you simulcast at the same time? Are you ready to rumble? On Rumble and YouTube? I mean, maybe, maybe. we could try that. See what happens. Maybe. Angry Bell Sprout for ten dollars says, see how Tim Pool made a bunch of videos this week about squatters. Funny, he flipped after calling a conspiracy theory two weeks earlier. Wonder which guest or crew member conv- convinced him that this was real. I yeah, it's interesting. I, I did see that there was a lot of there's been a lot of squatter content, including and I got I'm glad to see it. This is kind of sad that this is the way things go, but it is sort of the way it works. Because like once all these squatter stories hit the news, suddenly you start to see like there's a big push for people to actually pass legislation to change the squatter laws. And I did see that actually there was a law uh, that was being uh, proposed in New York, at least, that would explicitly make it so that squatters would not be included in that kind of law slash legal loophole that it gave them that 30 day window to be considered tenants. So that's oh, a really? good thing. Yeah. So if that passes, that should definitely help some people. They should just make it legal to, to shoot squatters on site. That would make <laughs> things a lot easier. I think. What do you think? Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> nice. Sid, finally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Daniel Sink for 10 months. Thanks so much. Says, so proud A team, but Adam progressive movement was found. Fa- but Adam, the progressive movement was founded by the Republican Party and only co opted by leftists. Teddy Roosevelt is the ideal man, in my own opinion. There you go. Well, it was founded, the progressive movement was founded by the Republican Party. Was the Republican Party always conservative? I don't know. Um, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> I mean, some Lincoln of the, was some the of first the, Republican, right? And he yes. freed the slaves. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Things were a little bit more shaky back in those days. Right. Or I maybe mean, I should say more mixed. Uh, Salt for five hours says there's some nutritionists that think Jordan Peterson's meat and water diet is causing him to have emotional dysregulation. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't think that the pure meat diet he's on is long term healthy for him oh, okay. i think I, I think it can help with detox um when you have some severe problems but i don't think it's going to i think in the long term it's going to cause problems so maybe i don't know uh black hat 0061 for 24 months says i dedicate this miles oh thank you so much for 24 months the golden pyramid there you go black hat says, I dedicate this milestone to all the lurkers and chat, those who listen to VODs at work and everything in between. You are the champions of the universe. There nice. Look, I like there. the lurkers too. Uh, let's see. I'm, I was looking for a Sammy G comment about the meat diet. Oh, yeah. I could, That's a good I could idea. feel the, the energy. 
You could feel Sammy G leering at you through the chat there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How dare you? Uh, Less yeah, Incel I... for, for five dollars says, May I ask if it is okay? Would you guys have Destiny on your channel? Yeah, I mean, we've had him on our channel in the past. Sure. Uh, Slate King for ten dollars says, Conservatives are willing to use power to protect the innocent. Progressives are willing to use power to help the disenfranchised. Libertarians are not willing to use power for any group. Um, I don't, I mean, hmm. I, I think libertarians are willing to use power to protect individual liberties, right? Sure. So. Yeah. Deregulation power, right? It is interesting to, to kind of conceptualize it like like, and I have to think about it. Conservatives protecting quote innocent, or how they define innocent. Progressives protecting, you know, the disenfranchised. It'd be kind of an interesting way. I don't know. I think about that. It's an interesting conceptualization. Eric for five dollars says populism gets hijacked by the elite, and it turns and turns it on the populist. I mean, that's probably true. Rowan Phillips, thank you so much for joining the Free Will Seekers. Slate King for $2 says populism has no principles. That is the problem. Yeah, populism as a movement doesn't really have a principle and get except that the elites are out to get us, essentially. So that is true. Now that can and that going to what the other person says, that can what allow it to be hijacked. So non Veda Vita Rex, thanks so much for the ten dollars. Says initial caution regarding a disease you know little about makes sense. It also makes sense that you become less cautious when you know more about it and it's less dangerous than initially believed. That is true. Christian Bob for five hours says, now that his newest book is out, when are we getting height on the show, Adam? Well, I, I could talk to him about coming on. He said he said he would come on. So Right. I always just, I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to just sit here and be like starry-eyed. Exactly. Well, we, ha we have to make it like a hard-hitting interview. True. We have to say, listen, John, about your TDS, okay? <laughs> No, I don't want to talk about Trump. <laughs> right? Why not? No. Did you watch his interview with with um what's his Joe name? Rogan? Joe Rogan, yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, I didn't finish it. No. Okay. <laughs> so in I don't know if you saw this part, but they start talking about the mainstream media going crazy over the bloodbath thing, mm -hmm. which we looked into. We did it on one of our daily streams we talked right. about the bloodbath comments and i mean we determined that the media was being unfair the bloodbath right. comments were out of context he was talking about an economic issue with trade he wasn't talking about violence so joe rogan tried to make this argument to jonathan height and jonathan height was like oh well maybe I, okay let's see a clip and jamie brings up a clip and the clip is edited and the way it's edited, it totally makes it sound like Donald Trump is talking about violence after the election. That's hilarious, really. Yeah. So, but now, <laughs> jo what did I, Joe say after that? He said, "Oh, I guess it does." No, the ed, you if you're just listening to it, and I was just listening to it, and I was thinking, "Oh my God, this sounds horrible." But <laughs> then I actually looked at the clip, and there's a giant edit right in the middle of it. You, but you can't hear the edit. You just right, see right, it right. with the. They do like the little, uh, flare thing, the little white flare thing, so you can tell it's an edit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Joe, the uh, Jonathan Hyde is sitting there the whole time, going, "Well, I mean, this sounds pretty bad." <laughs> <laughs> right. And Joe Rogan is trying to convince him. Well, I mean. <laughs> Like he's trying to fight against the bad edit. He doesn't call out the bad edit to the point where I don't I don't even know if he noticed the bad edit. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So but I didn't get the edit thing until later on. But the whole time I was kind of on Jonathan Height's side. I was like, Well, that sounds terrible though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the edit. Yeah. Interesting. So that's why people were talking about Jonathan Height's TDS on Right, right. On um well, yeah, but it's not his fault if he it's was not like, oh, his let me fault. see a clip, and then someone shows him an edited clip, you know? It's just an unfortunate situation. Right, right. But look, you can't talk about Trump without someone accusing there you of TBS anyway, so. Uh, Dwight Baldwin for $5 says, many European countries realizing that in order to build up defense against Russia, they need to cut back on welfare state. Mm -hmm. That's very possible. Yeah, I mean, they've basically, you know, not re like relied on having no military and then 
might not be the case anymore. So. Who who had no military? A lot of some of these European countries. Oh, that's why they had a strong welfare state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now they're going to have to conscript everyone. Like, so. uh oh, yeah. Uh, Fondue for five dollars says, "I think the person that gets the Nobel Prize should be the one that makes the prompt into the AI." There you go. That's true. Oh I yeah. Like it. Brian for five dollars. Thank you. Says J. Jordan Peterson doesn't believe that the climate projections are good enough to demand the poor become poorer and then make energy more expensive. And I, well, yeah, I, I do agree. agree with that. Yeah. I do agree with that. I totally agree. Uh, Andrew well, it's Haskins all settled science. <laughs> Andrew Haskins for 14 months says, Sitch misreads chats that prove him wrong. That's why A team is best class. Use your membership chats to express your free will points or lose them. I mean, I think I misread chats regardless of what they say. So I'm an equal opportunity misreading of chat. I mean, we've been streaming for seven hours straight. So obviously, right. Wears you out a little bit, but true. Yeah. Uh, Bloomer Media, thanks so much for the five dollars. Says insurance companies are not assessing this risk because they rely on the government to mid mitigate that risk for them, like how Florida houses are built. Maybe. Yeah, sometimes they do that. CT for two Canadians says we watched "What Is a Woman in Discord" twice. <laughs> there you what go. It's true. What is a woman? The Matt Walsh thing. Oh really? Oh, okay. Yeah. God, I can't stand Matt Walsh. Yeah, it wasn't great. Uh, Nathaniel Rosen for 15, I think that's the Shekels logo. Thank you. For fifth ever Super Chat says, Adam, carbon capture is a useless development. I don't, well, I don't know why you just made that assertion. So mm -hmm. what is the argument? I don't know. They, they don't think the technology is effective, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Well, there's a lot of different technologies. There's like, the mechanical trees. There's also, I think, some kind of algae mm -hmm. where they're basically capturing carbon from the air. Trees are actually carbon capture. It's completely counterintuitive because you think, you know, uh, an acorn is very small and a oak tree is very big. You know, where does all that mass come from? And people intuitively think, oh, it comes out of the ground, right? No, it comes out of the air. It's carbon pulled from the atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Oh, CT was saying that the point was you can watch the Daily Wire stuff in the Discord. Oh, was What a Woman on there? You guys watching the watch together? Oh, oh whatever. Listen. Listen. Oh, really? Kid Truck 91 for $10 says you guys should give a watch the video about the quote, the man who wants us blank. It basically covers the population dilemma and the potential of humans and tech to correct for such. Is it the man who wants us dead? Is that? I'll check it out. Uh, Batman's pet goldfish for five dollars says, "End the chicken tax." There you go. No tax for chicken. I agree. Yeah. Why is there a tax on chickens? That's ridiculous. That's a good question. Daz DM for five pounds says, "There's a scientific consensus on human-made climate change. The fact that Jordan B. Pearson tries to argue with no studies to back up his claim is insane." There you go. Uh, Nigel mm. TRC72 for 10 pounds says climate change is definitely real. However, it's clearly being used as an excuse to push for a load of far left socialist garbage. Anyone who says, quote, we're just following the science is full of shit. There you go. I agree. Um, yeah. Eagle Shit Ox for $10 says nuclear energy is a good compromise. Clean, abundant, powerful, can solve the whole problem, plus drive down energy prices. Now to convince the ignorant hand ringers that it's also very safe. Yeah, it's weird because I feel like um I feel like most people have been convinced recently over nuclear. So I don't know. We might start to see some change in the next five years towards more nuclear stuff. How did he spell nuclear? He spelled it correctly. Oh, okay. New clear. <laughs> right. Okay. JD for five dollars says explain the China one policy if it if not overpopulation fears. I I don't know, maybe you sent that before. I, I could have swore I said that that there was a fear in the seventies and sixties, and I think even the fifties, about overpopulation, which is when the child one policy was implemented. And I said nowadays in modern times, also in response to the current situation of the China One policy, that basically people have learned that the overpopulation fears were incorrect. I could have swore I said that. 
clearly. So I'm going to assume you sent that before I, I made that statement. But yeah, the, I looked up the population bomb, and that book was written in 1968. Right. That, I think, was a book that made the argument we we're all going to starve to death. Yeah. It w- yeah. It was like the 60s and 70s that that was like a thing. And that's, I believe, that's when the China One policy was even implemented. So. Yeah, they read that book and they're right. like, oh my God, we need to solve this now. No more kids. Woo. Right. <laughs> Mass grave for two months. Thank you so much. As I did research on black soldier fly larva Microsoft a few years back. You guys should believe Bill when he speaks. I don't. What is black soldier fly larva? I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, M8566 for five. Get the memberships. Thank you so much. RBGH fan for five dollars says, quote, you don't need a formal conspiracy when interests converge. Well, it's true. If people have various interests that are going in a specific direction, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Gaming Truck JS for ten dollars says California literally had one of the worst winters this year compared to what happened to New York last year. There you go. But then the people that say about climate change say that the, that there will be worse winters because of climate change so that's why i'm saying like i don't i have i don't know how to interpret any of that information yeah we've had crazy amounts of rain a hurricane all kinds of shit so people want adam to take the dancing elf down ha 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 is that what you were laughing about in chat of course look okay. i got the i got those penis ears just okay waving around jordan I, yeah no mouth. i see it's it. hilarious I see it, yeah I see. <laughs> okay, I'll take it down. Thank you. Guys. you. God, nobody knows how to have fun anymore. <laughs> All a bunch of buzzkills. Adam has the the Adam is on the same level of uh of uh, aesthetic appreciation no, don't as say as, it. Uh, as as creationist can. Don't say it. Oh really? <laughs> oh, that's evil. How why would you say such a thing? <laughs> Oh, you're so mean. <laughs> Wormy inside voice. <laughs> Mitch for five Aussie bucks says you guys have been quick in uploading episodes of podcasts lately, and thanks, and that makes me very happy. Really appreciate it. Please keep it up. Well, thanks, CT. C- CT yeah, is in go. charge of that. So, so yeah, yeah. Thanks, CT, Mitch, and thank you, CT. Osher I think C if you tw- click on her Twitter, you can even send her a coffee or something if you're really happy. So there you go. That's true. Yeah. Ostracy for 24 months. Thanks so much. Ostracy got the golden pyramid for discipline equals freedom. Look at it. Wow. So based. The more I hear about moral foundations, the more I think it's a very nice way to always universalize the evil of the left while excluding the evils of the right. The right uses all the foundations. Yes. Um, I don't think that's, I mean, I wouldn't characterize it that way. Some people do that, though. I've heard people. Some people do do that, yeah. Yeah. I've seen, so. uh, but those people, I think, are kind of misappropriating it. Mm-hmm. I do think, I do think, obviously, tribal people will try to characterize their moral intuitions as correct, and the other side's moral intuitions as evil and wrong and immoral. Yeah, I mean, because the, the right is sensitive to things that the left is not sensitive to. The very moral, various moral foundations that the left isn't sensitive to. But those moral foundations can lead to evil, obviously. Mm-hmm. Any moral foundation can lead you to evil. Well, yeah, but you said it. Either side's moral foundations can lead you to evil. Right, no, but I'm saying like any, if, if you were to take the five or six moral foundations, any one of those, in if it's, when centered off balance in any direction can lead you to evil. Mm -hmm. So like if someone is saying, Oh, well only the left's evil because they ignore three of the, you know, five or six moral foundations that therefore they're evil, but they're they're as you said, they're misappropriate, not understanding how any of the moral foundations operate. Yep. And to be clear, it's not like the, when you look at like the actual data, it's not like the left sees only two moral foundations and then they're like completely blind to the other ones. They're just not as they see them and they're affected by them. They're just not affected by them to the same amount. They're affected to them a much lesser amount than they are the care harm um, foundation. Well, no, I would say they literally see them as evil. They're against hierarchy. So authority subversion, they see as evil and oppressive. 
I don't. Yeah. I wouldn't agree with that. But that, that's a, that's a longer conversation. But that, that oh, I want to get into okay. the moment. But let's get into it. No. Fight. Let them fight. We'll ask. We'll ask Kite about it. Doctor Diddler for five dollars says, "Vote Diddler this November. I promise to make Sitch start lifting and make leaving your Christmas lights up all year long turbo illegal." There you go. Yeah, it should be. It's not just illegal. It's turbo illegal. Should be. Yeah. Should be like twenty years in prison. Uh, Majin for five dollars says, "Should the government push edging to better spread the resistance to instant gratification?" <laughs> sure, I guess. Who's who's doing edging now? Majin what? says the government should should push edging. Okay, so there you go. Go for it. Uh, Addy pupils wheat okay. waffles for two dollars says, "Steve's limitless pills molestiny Weinstein Mason." Jeez, quite the name. There you go. Uh, Equishadox for two dollars says hood up Adam looks like a cholo. <laughs> it was getting cold in here. I had to put okay. my sweatshirt on. So right. who's this random person you just brought up on the frame? You don't know who that is? No, who is that? That's Grace Rand Randolph. I can't believe you don't know who that is. Who's Grace Randolph? She is a YouTuber that talks about movies. Okay. And she talks really funny. Oh, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> oh, you got the voice? Yeah, yeah, I got it from the voice. This yeah. movie is really interesting. Yeah, I, yeah that's I got. I know who you're talking about. Good for her, Potato. Thank you so much, Potato, for being 20 months outside the simulation. Even though I already read this, I read it again. Zero taxes after three kids. There you go. That's right. Uh, Nicholas Van Neal for five Aussie bucks. Thank you so much. Says uh, Frick off destiny. Never trust anyone who utters the term. The science is settled. Science is never settled by nature. Yeah, that's a weird thing to say, right? The one guy toad for 12 months says, I love the content. Thank you, one guy toad. Thank you for the support. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Chuckle Dust for five dollars says, I'm a bit behind, but what do you think will be a bigger issue in the overpop will be overpopulation or underpopulation? Underpopulation. I yeah, I don't think overpopulation is going to be an issue. Yeah. So, because people yes. seem to naturally just stop having kids. So, so. Right. Um, yeah. English at Ox for $2 says, it was like this. And he's got hands open, emoji, and then an angry face with hands spread wide. Mm-hmm. Oh, because you know, because like I, I got you. Because George Pearson was like, it was like this, and he was making like the short, like small hands, and then no, I'm sorry, Destiny was like, it was like this. It was a small difference, and George Pearson was like, it was this. Yeah, that seemed like a, a very difference. memeable moment. They were doing like the the fish so big hand motions. Oh yeah, it was great. Overall, I like this. De I like this conversation slash debate. I thought it was interesting. So, Paul Johnson for two months says Destiny is just debate growing. Uh, yeah, I felt like there was some debate brewing on both sides of that conversation. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, Sell for Five Hours says, what are movies you have a love-hate relationship with? Except, example, for me, are Gladiator and Star Trek Nine. Love-hate? Okay. Like, what is that? I don't know. Um, love-hate? Um, hmm. I guess I could say a recent one is Tr the movie Troy. Oh, really? I really well, liked hey. the movie Troy and I remember really liking it when I was younger. And when I saw it recently, I was like, this movie has a lot of stupid shit in it that I <laughs> didn't pick up on when I was younger. I mean, I still really like it. But I'm like, there's some stupid shit going on in this movie. Some silly shit going on in this movie. It's got Brad Pitt in it, right? It's got Brad Pitt in it, yeah. Yeah. I think I saw that movie recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was sick and I was watching a bunch of war slash history movies but i thought it was pretty good i mean i thought it was actually better than i remembered it brad pitt plays hercules right no what's hercules who does brad pitt play? he's achilles right? motherfucker achilles that's it yeah hercules yes. achilles you know it's all the same right. yeah you know what i'm talking about i do uh, Dr. Fire for Five Canadian says, uh, I suppose we will see, but I do have to wonder. I mean, something like Fallon Domide, I was on, I think was on the market for about 10 years before it was taken off. 
thalidomide. Oh, thalidomide. I, I'm a fucking retard. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> was it on really on the market for 10 years? Well, I think thalidomide yeah. is still on the market. It's just not used not for... Not used for whatever it was used for before, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it was for morning sickness, but it ended up causing a bunch of birth defects. The birth defects, yeah. Yeah. Caleb Sinek for 10 months says, technically true or metaphorically true, call Brett to weigh in on the truth of this. S-Class is a best class. Brett That's actually it. did a really funny tweet where he was saying, who the fuck is this Destiny guy? and Why are people paying any attention to him? <laughs> that was pretty funny. And he said he was mad because Destiny had misrepresented Brett probably on the COVID stuff, which, I mean, I feel bad for Brett because he does constantly get misrepresented on all this stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, inverted general. Go ahead. Inverted gentleman for 16 months says, regarding excess deaths, we don't know what is causing it, but we could know if scientists were properly researching it. See the Dr. Drew show. Yes, yeah. Dr. Drew, I think. I do remember him talking about the excess death stuff. Uh, 99 IQ, near perfect score for $2. Thank you. Says, praise be the Duck Song 4 has released. What the fuck? Wow. Oh my God. That's insane. Was the person who kept chatting me the Duck Song thing, were, were they secretly the person who created the Duck Song and that's why they were super chatting that because they knew that it was going to be a fourth one was going to come out soon? Wow. Or did we just like intention it into existence? What is the Duck Song? Duck song is the duck song. You'll have to look it up on YouTube. Okay. I'll check it out. Okay. I'm going to look it up now just in you, case it's cool. Yeah, you should look it up afterwards. No. Okay. Too bad. Searching the duck song. Fondue for five dollars says, this is what I dislike about destiny. He will make an assumption about you. Then when you say no, now need to prove to him that he is wrong about you. I agree with that. And that, I mean, that's, it's a lot. It's a lot of the way that like very, uh, that a lot of people debate, and it's very annoying and frustrating to deal with. Yeah, we're giant Vivek fans, according to Destiny. So there you that's go. part of that's our true. constellation yeah. of beliefs. That's true. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? That's true. I for yeah, Destiny thinks we're Vivek fans, which is hilarious to our audience. Yeah. Stereotypes uh, so are bad. They are. Sala for five dollars says the founding fathers often wrote about virtue being necessary for freedom. That's true. Mm. Okay. Equal should ox for twenty-two months of discipline equals freedom. Thank you so much. Says nonsense. Force is essential. Where would we be without the strong nuclear force literally holding together all of existence? That's a good point. Yeah, true. That's a good point. Yeah. Gravity, bitch. Uh, Eat John that. Benor there you go. John Benor for 16 months says, Woohoo, I love corny. A team reigns supreme. Do you? Nice. Glad you like it. Rich Jammer for 24 months. Thanks so much, Rich, for getting the golden pyramid. Oh my God, look at that. Says, It's funny that the Jedi are supposed to be peaceful and stuff, but they believe in the Force. There it is. A team wears sunscreen and S class talks with sass. There you go. Look, I often get in trouble for not wearing sunscreen, so you right. got that one wrong. Fondue for five dollars. Yeah, who's M for is the Doberman right. says, "Why is Grace on screen? She is retarded." <laughs> Why like would you say that, Lucifer? Why do you not like Grace? Listen. Why do you think Grace is retarded? <laughs> I like Grace. Don't be mean. Oh, now you like her? You went from, I don't even know who this is. Yeah, so now exactly. you're like a huge super fan. Exactly. It's been nice. Actually, I don't know why you brought her up on screen, though. I have no fucking clue. I didn't bring her up. Dr. Diddler did. Okay. Dr. Diddler for $2. Adam is the male Grace Randolph of graphic design. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what it means, but I guess Grace Randolph is based at graphic design or something. Mm -hmm. Do I, I need to investigate it. this? You do. You should investigate it's it. Yeah. Grace Randolph, very good at. What's her show look like? Let's see. Very good is is one way to put it. Grace Randolph. All right. I like her. I like the way she talks. It's interesting. It's engaging. 
Is her channel beyond the trailer? Yes. Hello and welcome <laughs> to the We made the grave. Hello. <laughs> I'm Grace Randolph. Hello, everyone. They're just jealous. Look at this. Fondue for five dollars says honor. You get you killed my family, you get the chair. Dignity. We're too dangerous to keep around, but we have no place to hold you. You get the chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's fair. You can definitely see some honor culture playing out in the way that the Russians are the Russian police were torturing the people that committed or supposedly committed the terrorist attack. So that's a that's an excellent example of an honor culture versus a dignity culture right there. Oh yeah. Uh, the Whoop Man for 12 months, thanks so much, says here's the 12 months of JMAC gifted memberships. J Team is the cream dream. There you go. Yeah, thanks, JMAC. Making a lot e of our fans very, very happy. That's right. Uh, Iguish at Ox for $10. Thank you so much, says the COVID lockdown affected me psychologically. To the extent that I went through rapid life changes and personal growth, I generally credit your show as one of the few things that kept me going. Well, there you go. We're happy to help, Iguish at Ox. Yeah. Definitely. CT for two Canadians says, yeah, COVID is nothing. I only ended up in the ER. Yeah, it's not. Some people had very bad reactions to it. So. I, you know, COVID kicked my ass when I actually right. got it. Yeah. It's just the two years of were not especially bad to me, so. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Major um, status. Keep yeah, talking. That's my place. Oh no. Don't you hate it when that happens? It did the thing where it like zoomed forward and like added a bunch of my browser's tabs. like so slow. I keep trying I had to, to re I had to refresh it because it was so laggy. Yeah. Hello and welcome to this week's movie Stop. map. Well from back. <laughs> Hold Jesus on. Christ. What are you talking yeah. about? This I want to get through these. Okay. No, let's investigate no. this. Stop. We're not doing it. I want to see what good graphic Stop. design Stop. looks like here. No, we're not doing it. Look at this face. Oh my god, Bitch. stop it. This is great. Stop. Look at this emoting she's doing. You should learn a thing or two. I don't. I gotta zoom in on this. I gotta really Dr. Fire for 10 Canadian says uh, irritated me when people were being labeled anti-vax for being wary of COVID vax. People who otherwise trust vaccines be being conflated with mid 2000 soccer moms who thought polio caused autism. True. Yeah, it's, it's completely unfair. Completely uh, unfair. Yeah. Red473 for one month says, Sitch, did you see that someone did their own version of Freight Kid stuff? Send a copyright strike. Just kidding. It's actually pretty funny. I didn't. Well, check it out. That does sound pretty funny. How dare they? How dare they? Uh, enthusiastic Pastry for $5 says, Hi, guys. Thank you for the advice when I asked the felony question a while back. Finally getting my life together and just finished parole. Well, good for you. Yeah. That's great to hear. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Glad you're Liz, working through it. That's right. We Lives all do dumb Devs shit when we we're kids. Happy like, that we could have assisted yeah. in any way. Thankfully, I didn't get caught doing any of the dumb shit. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> sure. Like, I think we sat down. One time my friend had was taking a criminal justice class and, like, brought one of those books home. And we went through on how many years in jail that I had coming if I actually got caught for all the things I did. And it was, I mean, it was fun, but it was not pretty. So. That's right. Scary. Right. Well, no, I think that happens to a lot of people, obviously. Look, uh, young boys race hell, right? Yep. Yeah. Lives and does Hello, well for five and welcome to this week's movie map, where I'm back. Lives and does <laughs> Oh, my God. You did the perfect freeze frame. Look at this. You're welcome. Look at this game. My game is on point, okay? <laughs> I'm terrified. Guys, don't look at the screen right now. It's scary. Lives and You'll does have well nightmares. Don't do it. Lives and does well specifically for five dollars. Says I disagree with Adam on the on the shoot squatters on site thing. There you right. go. Yeah, he told me he's like you should let him run first and get him in the back. Uh, J Mac, our circuit five for twenty dollars. Thanks so much. Says hey, did you guys see how many views of the Oni plays hardcore? Wow, let's play. Got I'm smelling big bucks, boys. We tweak the format, take suggestions from Super Chats, and we'll be rolling in the dough. It's foolproof. There you go, Adam. Look at we that. We should do it. We should, we should do, do it. it. How, long, how long will it take? I mean, is it just like a one-day thing? I don't know. Yeah, it could be just a one-day thing. Okay. Uh, no math for $5 says, I agree with Adam on the pew-pew squatters on site thing. 
There you nice. Go. Yeah. No matter for two dollars says this channel is literally the Jonathan Height fan club. There it is. It is. Yeah. I'm not sure if John knows that, but. Sulla for $20. Thank you so much. Sulla says in 2008, the Vatican newspaper had an article called the seven deadly sins of the modern world. It included basic stuff like corporate greed and pollution. But the media interpreted it as the Vatican is pulling new sins out of its ass. Scummy, but the church betrayed the public's trust with the sex abuse crisis, which made them open to that. Maybe it's the same with Trump. I would agree completely. Trump is engaged in sexual abuse. That's not what the point was. Is that they basically oh. lost faith? Okay. Completely. I got to get back to the. If I refresh, are you telling me I'm going to be able to scan through the super chats easily? I mean, that's what I was able to do. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try it. Just right clicking took an hour for the yeah, thing to no, pop I know. up. Um, Dr. Sodos for $5. Thank you so much. Says, was Jordan Peterson more accurate? Eh, was he more charismatic? Definitely. Doesn't he seem less debate, bro? Also, I request you play the video I tagged you in. Oh my God, Sitch, it cured everything. I can go. Oh, this is amazing. Okay, I can actually follow there along now. Where are we at? Uh, you can bring up the video that Soldo tagged you in on Twitter. Okay. You're going to allow it? I mean, I have a video up and you won't even let me play it baby after a week off and stop okay i'm back baby after a week off while i was away and while i was away i love this channel uh-huh me too, me too. <laughs> okay okay i'll bring the other thing up okay uh, Nomad for $10 says, did you guys ever watch the Michael Knowles and Pearl debate? No, I totally forgot. If not, then good for you because I sure as hell watched <laughs> it. It made me want to jump out of my ground floor apartment window. That's hilarious. Really? Interesting. Let me add to the watch list here. Michael Ooh. Knowles Pearl. Is this a fat TikTok cat daily? What? Who, what am I looking for? What video? So he said, no, what? No. Oh, what? Okay. Soto sent you a video. I'll send it to you. Okay. He sent me a video? Yeah. We tagged you here. Okay. I just sent it to you. Good. Let's okay. see this. Uh, where was I on the thing? Dr. Dealer for two hours says Adam is the male Grace Randolph of graphic design. Okay, there you go. Yeah, look. Let's see what's wrong with that. <laughs> uh, fondue for five hours says, by the way, speaking of L's watch for Frieren, it just ended airing and apparently unseated Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood for top anime from my anime list. Really? Free Aaron. Interesting. Nice. That's pretty shocking if that's the case. Loser Doberman for five Canadians says, Adam, check out Chrissy May's impression of Grace Randolph on FNT. You will laugh your ass off. Chrissy Maris? Yeah, she's Chrissy real Maris, good. Yeah. She's good at the impressions. I've uh, seen Dr. her do a bunch of impressions on FNT and she's like fucking amazing. Yeah. Dr. Fire for 10 Canadians says overpopulation concerns also saw creation of all those films slash pop culture with those kinds of themes from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Solvent Green, Escape from New York, Judge Dredd, Blade Runner, Logan's Run, etc. That is true. Right. Do you know what Soylent Green is made of? Uh, I think, if I recall correctly, it's made of a loy, of, of a free range soy cotton blend <laughs> uh, espresso. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, M eight five six six for two dollars says more crazy. There you go. More oh, so what? he brought up here's the the little thing that Solidoge sent. All right, what's going on in this Solidoge? So we have uh, Adam is the dog, and it's like okay. there's a guest coming on the show, and he's throwing it at it, but then it's Solidoge, and the dog <laughs> immediately spits it out. <laughs> it's eleven. That's exactly right. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Look, Solidoge. Yeah, look, Solidos triggers me, man. He's like Lemon. 
He's Sonic like lemon. lemon on the tongue. Uh, lives in Dev Wall specifically for two hours. Says, is she the daughter of the Princess Bride clergyman? How dare you? Who's that? Okay. That he's talking about Grace. Grace. Yeah. Grace is amazing. Don't talk. Grace is amazing. Don't talk smack about Grace. Uh, let's see. Orca for two dollars says joining late. I think y'all forgot to read my Streamlab super chats from the last stream. Keep up the good work. Looking forward to the comic. Hi, Warming. Thank you. Did we? Um. Hmm. Orca Somebody... for five dollars from last time says if you ask Google AI quote why do socialist countries commit genocide it says there's a difference between genocide and crimes against humanity for fascism it is cited as inevitable by by objective standards high worm bus that's lame I'll check that out that's pretty pathetic yeah, maybe that's we did case. read that one I don't remember reading that one yeah Kiwi Farmer, thank you so much for the $20. Says, hello, gentlemen. I found another BreadTuber named Cold Crash Pictures. He's similar to Renegade Cut. Also, I wish you guys could rip into actual Jake more often. He's even more insufferable lately. <laughs> S-Class is best custom. You know, we should rip into actual Jake more because that guy is a total tool. We and should. He was, not, he was not remotely fair with us. So he has it coming. He punched us first. He's a good target. Uh, yeah. I will check out. And he's a big fat slob, so we can make fun of that too. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Am I looking at Cold Crest Pictures? I'm looking at it. it. Doesn't look like he's doing any political content. Cold Crest Pictures. That's yeah. a cool. I mean, that's hmm. an interesting name. I'll check it out. Um. We should, yeah, the actual date's kind of falling off the radar, but I guess we should look into him again. Dr. Diller for $2 says, my thing with climate change is multifaceted. If climate change was continually getting worse as you expected, you'd see stronger and stronger storms, but most storm records are from the early 1900s and before. Really? That's what I'm saying. It's it's hard to tell, like, what is reporting and what is actually, like, the storms getting worse. So, because it definitely seems like in the last, like, uh, five years, the storms are getting getting worse, but maybe it's just how the news covers them or my perception of things. It's not trustworthy. Dr. Dealer for another $2 says, and he linked list of most intense tropical cyclones. There doesn't seem to be any kind of trend here without skewing data. Additionally, climate change chatters dominated entirely by the insane. That is true. That is true. And for another $2, Dr. Dealer says, no reasonable explanation ever gets offered. It's extinction or exaggeration. The most powerful volcanic eruption in terms of astronomic distribution, disruption, since Krakatoa occurred in 2000, in the year 202, but who offered that as an explanation? Interesting. I guess that's why I'm just kind of throwing my hands up and I just don't fucking know. Yeah, why are front? these events relative, uh, right. relevant over like millions of years? Mm hmm. Dr. Dealer for Notre Dame says, Destiny's admitted strawman of conservative constellation beliefs is funny to me because I'm pretty sure he endorsed some of them as true during his anti-conservative rant on this show. I mean, you wouldn't be incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Arithmus for $2 says, the quote, can't afford more kids survey is cope. In the United States, higher income is directly correlated to lower birth rates. It's a con consistent decline as you go up the income scale. The under 10K income demographic has the highest birth rate. That seems to be the case. Yeah, total agreement. It's okay for two dollars. says, hey, Sitch, I sent you a DM on Twitter about two months ago about the topic of the border as I live close to the border. Not sure if you're still interested. Still working on a YouTube video to say I made more <laughs> YouTube videos than you. Wow. Uh, I don't, oh, this yeah, year, yeah. obviously. Right. Right. One video. Well, you should it's probably. Tons of videos. If you want to talk on the stream, you should probably message Adam instead of me because mm -hmm. I'll forget. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, Knight of the Diamond Spoon for $10 says, instead of might makes right, I'm for might for right. Ooh, I like that. That's interesting. Might for right. I mean, I'm not in favor of might makes right either. But. So. Uh, J Mac, our surrogate father. Thank you so much, Daddy. What's J -Mac, up? For the fifty dollars, thank you so much. Says, oh, by the way, if you guys want to see some cute pupper pictures, we just brought home our new dog today, and I posted some to Twitter. Her name is Alicia. Our male is named Alfan, Alfin, Alfanad. 
I don't know what the reference is. If you guys know the reference, then you will be awarded 20 JMAC points. Oh, no. I, I lost the 20 JMAC points. I don't know what the reference is. I don't either. So maybe if I saw it, I could tell, but you did a horrible job of pronouncing no, whatever it's it was. Final Fantasy oh, yeah, 14 you're reference, right. which I okay. never played Final Fantasy 14. So I'll probably fail. I did on see that your one. I did see your dog pictures, Jay, and they were very adorable. Look, I'm on it. I'm gonna find these dog pictures. Although I was trying to find the the clip of Destiny doing his impression of Phil. It was a pretty funny clip. Because that clip, oh my. You can find it easily. Phil, I'm pretty sure it's Phil's pin tweet. Oh, it is? Yeah. No way. Uh, Grendel Vat for $10 says the storm. Right. Thank you. you. (laughs) The the storms are, quote, worse in terms of property damage because people are building closer and closer to the water. The death tolls have dropped dramatically with the ability to track and predict hurricane pass. I mean, that makes sense. Sure. But I guess I was talking about more more in terms of like the. The strength of said storms has it changed? Has it got worse? Is it the same? You know, so. Oh God, this. Yeah, here I'll send. Do you want to play link. with sound? I do, and we'll do like I'll send you a link, and we can do like a three, two, one. Okay. It's pretty. It's pretty I mean, I have it. I don't use tell me when you. Oh, okay. Yeah. You already got it up. Look yeah. at you. Yep eager beaver here listen i always have it up and prepared for you adam okay <laughs> that's what i like to hear there you go. always ready <laughs> yes always ready for a laugh where's <laughs> now i can't find my window there you go oh here turn some rewind turn some volume on ready go hey i'm still in the mud i don't want to do you want to talk? Do you want to talk to me? Hey, I'm still in the mud. I don't want to talk. Hey, do you want to talk? Do you want to talk to me? Hey, oh, oh my god, <laughs> this is Destiny's best performance ever. <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. Yes, <laughs> I don't know why Phil actually just posted. He had a loop version of it now. I know that's what made yeah. me want to find the original tweet. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's why I started looking for it. God, I right. must have watched this thing like a thousand times. <laughs> it's so hilarious. There you go. Why is it go. so good? It's Jeez. very funny. <laughs> In many ways. Yeah. All right. Puppy pictures. Uh. PC for $5 says this conversation was interesting, but I didn't hear Blunty Fly's opinion on the use of force. Is waving a fly oh, yeah. is waving a fly swatter coercive? Oh, of course it is. Yeah, of course. I think waving a fly swatter is every is the moral ethical duty of every citizen Look, in America. To swat hun- every fly. Honey, okay. yes. Vinegar, get the fuck out of here. What there the fuck? That's what Blunty Fly says. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, fondue for five dollars thank you says i also remember destiny had a whole diagram on how he wanted to talk about certain ideas rather than constellations when defending nick fuentes yeah that all went oh. away oh yeah uh j mac for twenty dollars thanks so much our surrogate father daddy j mac says to all the final fantasy 14 haters you know who you are i bite my thumb at d there it is oh yeah good oh look hey phil's there's phil for another ten dollars <laughs> thank you phil says it's so good <laughs> Well, thank you, Phil, for that, it that gift. It's a very good gift. It is. Thank yeah. You. I'm glad you have that clip up there. Oh, on your I... It's me. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's so good. It's very good. Look at this. What's the name of this puppy? Elysia? Elaza? Mm. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh... Joshua Cal- Caler- Calajero. Cal- yeah, I can't say your name. Sorry. I'm tired. I'm hungry. Thank you so much for the nine months, Josh. Josh says, um, I'm happy to report I passed my PhD dissertation defense. Soon wow. I'll be doctor. Wow. There you go. That's great. That thank is so you for awesome. All the streams over the years, Gent. Well, thank you and congratulations. That's wonderful to hear. 
doctor. You're, you better yeah. put a doctor in your name now. You're contributing to the body of human knowledge. That's right, That's baby. That's so respectable. That's right. Look, all we do is make fun of people. That's true. Listen, that's a, that's a big contribution. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, one. I mean, it's a contribution, but no, that's the most important contribution in our society. Anyways. Oh, that's it already. That's it. I brought up the cute puppy. Oh, look at that adorable little pupper. Yeah. He's got a little bit of a raccoon thing going, huh? There you go. Some raccoon eyes. Love it. Anyways. Anyways, what? Jeez. Thank you all for coming. What? I mean, we're not. I thought we'd watch another video. It's so early. Th I'm hungry. Thank <laughs> you all for coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm, keep going. What are you going to be some kind of harmonica playing at some point? What do you want? What's the harmonica? Do your job. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your incredibly generous donation. You who have made it to the end of the stream. You, the true super fans, who would play the harmonica when requested. It would not be difficult. Okay. That is the true mark of a man or a woman who has free will. Someone who plays the harmonica and is not difficult. And now is intentionally playing it awfully and horribly. It's like a train is passing by instead of the melodious harmonica we've all grown accustomed to throughout the years. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all <laughs> tomorrow. Okay.